Okay, guys, we're gonna we're gonna roll. Um, thank you all, Michael. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thanks. Good, good. I don't know what the trick was. Did did she call you? No, I. Uh, you just down. I just re-downloaded Zoom. Uh -huh. And uh, okay. you know. Anyways, all right. Got on. Okay. So uh, let me introduce uh, the reviewers. Uh, on the top left of my screen, Max Mahaffey, um, an architect who uh, came back to school here at UT, um, did a, some really wonderful work and uh, continues to, he's now in LA. Uh, Michael, you and Max should meet someday. I think yeah. you'd enjoy, enjoy each other a lot. I look forward to um, it, Max. Yeah, likewise. Uh, Mike, Michael Rotondi, you all, you guys know, uh, probably as the founder of SciArc, where he still teaches, and he also uh, teaches um, at Arizona State. Um, and uh, with a long, a wonderful career in amazing architecture. Michael, thank you for doing this. Yeah. Uh, and Judy, Judy Birdsong, one of the stalwart members of our faculty. Uh, an artist in her own right, um, a great fan of uh, things Judd, <laughs> and um, a much uh, prized uh, teacher. So Judy, thank you for joining us. All right, so um, what I'm gonna do uh, just to start um, is run through some pictures and uh, a vid let me ask the reviewers, I know Max saw it, but Judy and Michael did you see the site video I sent? Yeah. You did? Yeah, I'm very yeah. familiar with that site. We taught it and designed for okay. a couple of years ago. <laughs> you did? Yeah. What did you put, what did you put on it? Oh my God, you got to ask me that. Uh, yeah. Housing, it was housing, artist housing. housing. Artist housing, okay. Well, there is going to be housing there someday, pretty, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. All right, so um, I'm just going to run quickly through that. Let me just say that the um, the pictures I'm going to show have have basically sort of an aesthetic purpose because there was a sort of an aesthetic that we were after this semester, um, which had to do thematically with craft, with building, uh, and with sort of industrial buildings, uh, or or the kinds of uh, things you'd associate with uh, workshops and that's and handwork. Um, and we try to sort of keep to that sort of aesthetic. And we had quite a lot of discussion about what's beautiful and what's ugly in that sort of genre. Um, our early exercises were about geometry. We did exercises um, about the stratification of rooms into layers indexed to the human body. We did an exercise about structure, how to structure a roof that spanned roughly 30 feet. Um, and then we just launched into this. So I'm going to just screen share my screen here. Okay, is that working, the screen share? Yeah. Okay. So um, the site, oops, someone else has joined. Do I need to let them in? I can't see who it is. Adam, is that you? It's Mark. That's Mark. Hey, bud. Okay. So um, here's our site. Um, it's this sort of strange uh, uh, triangle plus half circle site. Um, here it is a little bit closer. Uh, Westbrook Metals, you can see on the, oh, north is straight up. So, but when you look at, most of us drew our site somewhat rotated to the left. So when we, most of our drawings you'll look at, you'll have to think of north as being about 20 degrees uh, to the left counterclockwise. These are the two videos, uh, which I think you've seen. So I'm gonna go straight on to uh, just a quick set of photographs. Um, this is taken on the railway line uh, I don't know that this was ever a freight line, but it's certain now it's a it's a um, 
commuter line. Uh, it does not have stops uh, too close to our site. So there was no, no real uh, attempt to sort of link to it. Uh, here we are looking at uh, Westbrook metals um, on the left. This is the kind of architecture that it turns me on anyway. Nice. Yeah. yeah, really, really handsome. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> um, old school. Yeah, it's tear very old school. It's sort of got compositional moments in it, like perfect symmetry with the three doors and this vent. Uh, yeah. But it's off. But that's off center with the with the peaked roof. Um, you know, looks like the top the, the the top right gable is sticking out a little further. You can see from the shadow. Yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's got small moments. Obviously, the rather stunted trees, but there's a kind of a dialogue for me between the trees and the carport. Um, oh, these pictures are kind of random. I have to say. Um, Maybe I should just hit play mode. Yeah, there you go. This is a building that's on the site uh, called the Reinhardt building. Sometimes we call it the, uh, the uh, hangar building because there's some legend that it was once used for the airport, um, but it turns out that's not true. Um, but it has some really great um, compositional qualities that wonderful combination of sort of symmetry and exception, um, those vents on the roof. So yeah, th this thing if, as in cartoon form would be very, very uninteresting. But in, in closer look, of course, it turns out to be like very interesting. Uh, there are interesting sort of contrapuntal relationships between these rooms, uh, between these buildings, I should say. So some students kept the Reinhardt building. Uh, we thought that it it's refurbishable. Uh, we're back at Westbrook Metals. Um, the aesthetic of this kind of non-aesthetic has always been uh, a challenge to me. And it's sort of graced by this uh, beautiful neon sign. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wanted to just quickly say uh, something that we did not do very well in the studio, and I, I think I blame myself really, is when I conceived of it, I thought we would do much more uh, reading and philosophizing about craft, because after all, the premise of the project was what is the role of craft in a basically digital, digital age or a mass produced age. Uh, it's not that we didn't talk about these things, but it uh, the studio never became the half seminar I sort of dreamed it could be. Um, so many students did read from here uh, and the subject did come up, but we were not systematic about it. Similarly, I had the thought that we would try to learn from the manual arts movement, uh, which was the turn of the century, uh, a, a big thing about training people uh, to do uh, you know, the trades, and there were whole schools devoted to it. Um, another subject that I wanted to get into more than we did, not that we didn't, I mean, we did talk about it, was treat, how to treat sunlight as a solid. That is how to think of uh, shade and sunlight as, a, as having form, um, and to try to make a dialogue between shade, sun and shade. I think many of the projects you'll see actually did achieve that beautifully, but it wasn't because we like studied it for two or three weeks uh, as I have done in the past. Uh, by way of precedent, uh, it was hard to find, you know, photography of shops uh, of sort of light industry factory with the uh, handwork, uh, but we did find enough and the students found their own uh, afterwards as well. Uh, we noted the kind of lighting, the kind of roofing, uh, the dust extraction, the, uh, and we also did a visit with uh, Mark Machek to his uh, shop called the Splinter Group. Um, and he did a wonderful uh, like hour and a half video taking us around to all the bits and pieces. Um, most of them tend to be steel. Um, having the same sort of character. 
course, the uh, famous Sawtooth, and you'll see a project today that took inspiration from this one. More domesticated. So overall, we were sort of intrigued by this aesthetic, and I, we quickly realized that it's hard to design and hard to render age in a building. And a lot of the beauty of these things is their, is their aging and their, their wrongness in a way. Uh, most of us thought of wood as the uh, challenge to uh, span with. So I'm showing you these just to give you a kind of a flavor of what we were looking at um, aesthetically. And I think that's my last slide. Mm. Nice. All right. Oh, hi, Adam. Hey, Michael. Sorry, my I had a horrible technical meltdown <laughs> that I just solved. So okay. glad I could join. Welcome. Adam Miller is a visiting scholar here at UT. He has uh, a background not just in theory, but in uh, maker culture is what I'd have to say in a certain way. Um, so we can we can uh, maybe hear his view on that. So we're going to do four projects. We're running maybe 10 minutes late. Uh, we're going to go half an hour each. And we're going to start with Crystal. And here hey. she is. Crystal, yeah. go, go, go. <laughs> Welcome and thank you for being number one. <laughs> okay, you just to break the ice. Okay, so could you see my screen? Uh, I can, can we all? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, so hi, my name is uh, Crystal. And I wanted to start, I guess, uh, with the impression that I had on the site um, after kind of looking through what Michael showed. I actually feel like the main characteristic that I noticed from being there was that despite all the small shops and the businesses that were in proximity to each other, uh, generally speaking, I felt like there was a lack of feeling of a tighter community and that uh, most of these uh, shops and businesses were uh, pretty self-involved. So my intervention kind of a uh, attempts to make an, to address that issue by creating a condition that allows for the visitors and the public to engage a bit more with the local campus and the workers and the students that are going to be inhabiting the shop. Um, so the way the building was situated on the side and the way that the program was dispersed um, attempts to, or at least tries to um, address or attest to this approach. So uh, all of the, uh, the spaces, such as the workshops, the classrooms, and the offices that are going to be occupied by the students and the workers all tend to be facing this um, pedestrian walkway, and they have a very clear view and access to it. Um, and even the offices themselves, they act as like sort of modules that extrude from the building and reach into the walkway as in like an attempt to engage in that conversation. Meanwhile, the storage tends to be backed away towards this street view, which um, works as the more functional side of the building, because this is um, allowing for truck access to kind of um, drop off um, their loads and, and their deliveries. And then, of course, you know, lunchrooms and the galleries, which was also part of the program. This is the part that most directly kind of um, relates to public um, engagement and infiltration. Um, it tends, it was um, laid out closer. Um, along the axis of the pedestrian walkway. Um, and these are just um, certain views that attempt to capture what that experience would be like. And uh, these are the sections that cut through the workshop. And these sections are, um, they're looking towards the, the facade that's facing the walkway. And in them, um, you can see how most of the glazing and the storefront conditions happen along that facade. Um, and most of the um, artificial, uh, natural lighting that's going to be coming into the building um, comes through the way of these um, um, glazing, system, glazing systems I'm sorry, that uh, face the walkway. Um, but another prominent design feature for these buildings was um, the roof system. And this was a previous exploration and project that we did in the in 
in the studio where um, upon um, looking at different roof systems, the way that the lighting kind of captures or the way that the, it interplays with this sort of louvered system, um, I found to be very alluring and it was something that I really did want to integrate into the project. So I, I did make an attempt to um, engage this system and in this experiential quality to get these skylights that could puncture through the roof and play off of this um, beaming uh, arrangement and hope that it would capture um, a nice experiential quality for the workers who would be engaging in these workshops. And this is a, another moment within the building that happens more towards, a, it's like a little studio space for the workers. And that's the last of this slide, but one more thing I wanted to share um, was right here. Thank you very much, Crystal. Maybe you could uh, uh, have the screen go back to the presentation. Uh, yeah, maybe the site plan. I think we okay. can start from then, and you'll respond to requests to look at other things. This question I have is is about the music. Oh. <laughs> okay. Yes. Is the music just incidental, or is it is it a, a deliberate choice uh, as part of your project? It wasn't entirely uh, intentional in a way, but it, it, I just kind of liked it. But and I thought the the mood was kind of fitting. But yeah, it is something that it kind of just been, it's a new release, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm pretty interested. Yeah, I just uh, with this, it's um, Nightwish, I guess. Yes, it is. Oh my god, yeah. you noticed. Well, oh, my son is in the music. So yeah. years ago, he said, "If I have to listen to yours, you got to listen to mine." So <laughs> he's constantly giving me stuff. Well, the reason I bring it up is uh, I think one of the, um, I think the intentions of a project like this is um, how do you get from, how do you connect the hand to the mind as opposed to uh, computer stuff is primarily a, a sky or a mind technology. And the manual arts is, which is the way, the way, the way infants learn primarily uh, is they engage the world of course, but the, the, the primary thing that they're always doing is looking at the relationship between the eyes and the hand of their parents and whoever else. So it, it, with, with um, I'm just thinking about how you can develop a total aesthetic so that, that, um, uh, that there's, there's a certain, maybe there's a, a, a certain um, a, a geometric structure, a certain, a certain cadence, a certain rhythm, and then that plays itself out uh, throughout the project and then ultimately the music. So I think that's one of the opportunities because um, uh, you're starting with uh, uh, um, the, 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 your, your initial reading of the site is that uh, people aren't hanging out together. 
uh, in ways that uh, they would basically interact and there'd be a lot of exchange. Um, uh, having said that, the next uh, question is, how do you see uh, you overcoming your initial read of the site and how it is keeping people in their own zone? Uh, what, what are you doing that uh, overcomes that? I can see that you got a public space, but I'm wondering if there's anything that's less obvious that you're considering. Um, you mean in terms, I'm, I'm kind of like um, breaking apart the question in terms of whether you're thinking in terms of uh, public engagement with the workers or how I'm engaging the workers. Or... Public space is often thought about as long as you got the right dimensions, it's going to work. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't, it doesn't happen uh, a lot because it's just the right dimension. So I'm wondering, what do you, uh, how do you see your buildings and the activity inside your buildings? the life inside coming to the outside and then the life of one one group is intermingling with the life of another group outside other than just sitting out there and having coffee and drinking and eating sandwiches mm -hmm. well i was hoping i mean sometimes even for the workers themselves like maybe you don't necessarily always want people coming in and out having this availability but i think even the exposure of just being able to see the process at play or process being worked sometimes I think that's a way of a certain engagement just by watching just kind of like how an audience watches a show for like a band they're not necessarily playing the instruments they're not you know engaging with the act of putting on the show itself but there's a certain interaction I think there's a certain connection sometimes just by watching an artist do his thing so like the idea of having this open exposure and putting in the glass and having this like pretty clear um just view um from what's going on in that walkway to what's going on inside the workshops, I was hoping would engage or create that kind of conversation at the very least. Whereas even if you don't necessarily have to be a part of it, just mm -hmm. by watching and appreciating them do their work as opposed to just, you know, sheltering them and pushing them to the side and like this little bunker like thing kind of at least create some sort of conversation. That was my hope <laughs> anyway. No, no, that, that's it. Where, where, where would that conversation take place? And mostly within that access as it's going through because um all the storefront like i mentioned in the sections are happening it's all even in the classrooms like there's mm -hmm. uh open storefront happening along here so at least the public kind of as they walk through they have some sort of peek into all of these you know in the classroom setting whether them it's in the workshop setting or even within like the offices like there's a storefront door that kind of allows them to have a, a little more personal approach with the instructors or assistants if they wanted to come out and stuff so at least I thought that having that kind of um, uh, openness or, or, or at least invitation was mm -hmm. going to be some sort of a gesture to show that they are also like a part of it, even if they're just spectating, that's also a part of this social engagement. Good, good. Uh, very, very good answer, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I was also curious about the public space here. Um, I think it's like an interesting uh, idea, especially considering the site, which is basically an island surrounded by um, roads. Um, when you're choosing like a, an access to create a, a, a public space around, I, I guess I just find it int like curious that you would kind of follow the axes of like the road rather than like a pedestrian path or like somehow thinking about, if you're thinking about bringing pedestrian foot traffic onto this this site, maybe it would be helpful to just understand where those pedestrians would be coming from, how they would get to your, it's basically an island. Um, and because it's reading as an island to me, it's kind of reminding me of maybe a similarly minded uh, manual arts kind of focused school, um, that was designed by Michael Maltzen. Um, it's in LA. Uh, what is it called? It's called Inner City Arts. I don't know if you all looked at that, but it's I a. Did, it's, so. Yeah, it's it's an interesting project, um, and and for them, they're they're it's also basically an island, um, but it's it's essentially a courtyard building where all of the buildings are sort of inwardly focused, um, and there's essentially like a. a a strong perimeter wall all around it because it's, I guess it, you know, is in a, um, 
a, a certain site that they 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 value um, controlling access onto the site um, for the safety of the children, I guess. Um, but here it's very open, and you're, it seems like you're encouraging the public to come onto this site. So it would just be be nice to see in some way how the public does get there. Crystal, how would you how would you respond to the security issue? Would you feel like there is one? Um, uh, to be honest, uh, that hasn't been an issue that I've thought of yet. Because I just imagine that it would be, you know, um, security at least for the shops would be work in a pretty traditional sense, where you know you lock up shop and then everything is locked up. But um, as far as the public and open spaces are concerned, um, I didn't necessarily like. It's more about uh, the engagement with the public is, you know, during um, hours of operation mainly, um, because other than that, when it's not operating, I kind of imagined it being as, you know, as any other site. What would any other? What would a park be like? You know, when nobody's there, kind of a thing. So uh, I don't know necessarily. First of all, I think Adam's uh, question is one that, um, uh, if if uh, you really think about it uh, beyond right now uh, or right now. It, 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 it is a way of extending your idea of, of, uh, of communal life going from within a building to the site and then beyond that into the community where you start to look at the, 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 uh, the perimeter outside the buildings and start to think about eventually if housing does come into that area and manual arts would be one of perhaps other uh, sort of central zones of activity. So how, do, how would you... Uh, begin to think about p uh, people uh, wandering from the outside of uh, the complex. Uh, how do you break down the territory of the site, basically? That's always a problem. You can see that in, in schools. You know, if you're in one studio, you rarely go into another studio except uh, when you're on a mission to speak to a friend. So mm -hmm. how do you break down territory so that there is a complete mix and then you're really starting to uh, figure out ways to eliminate the boundaries that keep us in a territorial state of mind and, and don't have a free exchange of ideas and information. Because one of the best ways to learn, one of the, I think one of the, one of the ways that most uh, students learn in particular is peer to peer. Uh, teachers of course uh, help, but it's more of a mentoring uh, unless they're telling you exactly what to do. Um, so I think you're always looking for ways especially nowadays, how do you have secure, secu a secure uh, a situation as well as accessible? Uh, not just in terms of ADA terms, but how do you, how do you, uh, how do you just keep everything moving? How do, you keep, how, do you get, how do you get people to move the same way information moves? Mm -hmm. We still organize things as, as if it's a branching system. That's, that's the way governance occurs. But it's not the way information moves, which is a rather curious thing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so I think I think there's there's uh, your, your 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 premise is really a good one. Uh, Adam brings up a really good point. How does this now connect out to the greater community? Uh, would allow you to start looking not only at the center, uh, in between, but at the edges on the outside. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, we can talk about the architecture now. Yeah, I too am a little curious about your relationship to the site, which I think has come up in the earlier comments. Um, it looks like you took the um, particulars of the site as givens, right? Your buildings conform to the geometry of the site, right? And um, your buildings, I think, are they, they, they result from the particulars of the site, right? So they hold the edges, you kind of swath through, and what was left over generated the form, the footprint of your of your building, right? And so I'd like to hear you talk about that a little bit more, maybe. I'd like to hear, you know, um, why perhaps you didn't question um, the positioning of your buildings on the site, right. leftover space, um, take more maybe of a heavy-handed or intentioned um, position toward how you wanted these things arrayed. I too am incredibly interested by the swath through the middle 
Um, I see it almost more as a zipper space, probably because you've, you've kind of put these fingers in on either side. It's almost as though the two sides are, uh, you know, really want to reach out and engage one another. I think it could have been really um, interesting to have maybe more of an interface between the public and the private. So rather, or the public and the craftsman. So rather than having the craftsman be, you know, the, the animal in the zoo in a way, that maybe there was more of a way of having those two things kind of interlock and engage. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think the um, probably the thing that was also in my mind, there, there was always like, you know, the question of where, I guess, where is the threshold or where is the boundary between like how much, how much engagement do you want from the public into a workspace and how much, at what point is it okay for them to be a part of it? And at what point is it an intrusion? Um, you know, and in a way like you don't want it to be too inviting because then it, it becomes um, something that it's probably unworkable. Um, so it was kind of also me trying to establish some sort of um, like invitation, but some sort of definitive boundaries. Whereas I am, this is in the end something that's catered to workers and you do create a condition that allows them to do what they need to do without too much interference, but at the same time um, kind of expose uh, I suppose the art of what they do and a lot of the art of what they do is involved in the process of what they're making. So that's something. I think there was also the opportunity there for maybe the various crafts to engage one another mm -hmm. because there is a lot of overlap in the crafts, right? Like Mark shares a space with a machinist and other woodworkers and things like that. So, um, you know, I don't know if you've been to the Thornbrook studios out off South Lamar. They used to hope, host an open house every year and it's an old industrial complex, you know, buildings on either side. And there was what used to be, I think it still is, a parking lot that sort of runs down between the middle of them. But the, the, the artisans have taken over those various industrial buildings and they use that center space as a space for collaboration and conversation. So there are picnic tables out there and there's, you know, equipment and stuff. And there's a constant interaction between the various artisans. There it is, yeah. Horton Road off Old Turf. And um, when they host the open house every year, which is, you know, the public, um, inviting the public into their spaces, and the space is incredibly active and they set up tables and stuff like that. So I think there's a bit of a, um, almost an I-thou relationship between you know, the, the various, the, well, certainly the structures, but maybe between the various craftspeople and also between the public and the craftspeople that maybe you could have questioned and made that a little bit more, um, less of a, of a, a gap and more of a scene. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you bring up a fair point. I, I think in my midterm, I think I had a proposition or a site plan that may have been more along the lines of that. I actually did suggest that certain shops be shared into like this one overall space with that idea in mind. And I remember um, one of the main uh, things that kind of came up with that was the functionality of having that kind of go on because then there was this whole question of, you know, how do you know like the noise that goes into this craft versus that craft with their machinery versus their machinery and how and much of that- The you... sawdust and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. so it became more, uh, that's when I think my focus kind of became to address a little bit more of the individuality of like catering to their individual needs instead of assuming that they all like yeah that is a fair point that like you do want some sort of shared ideas but at the same time um, you don't want to necessarily say like you know all craft is the same so one warehouse is just as good as the next for you know this particular craft mm -hmm. so at that point it became a little bit more of okay let's make sure that you know the stone masons have, you know, what they need, and then the work, the woodworkers have what they need, and the glass, you know, people who deal with the glass have what they need, and then maybe we can deal with catering to what they need individually for what their craft is doing. And at that point, you kind of address the fact that you kind of that you respect that they have a certain like their their craft is not just as much or just as well as any other. You know, that, that there is certain individuality and there is individual needs that need to be attended. Well, guys, we have about seven minutes left, and I'm wondering if we can't look at um, uh, one of your uh, really nice interiors. Yes. Um, just so we can talk about the building, per se. There was a perspective of... The uh, roof, maybe? Well, let's see. It was the bigger room. That one's nice. Uh, that that one. Actually, I'm see, now I'm remembering the videos because <laughs> they were so strong. Yeah. I love the way they ended up at this view. Like you walked around and then 
you know, this is where you stopped. Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe we um, can just go ahead. Yeah, I'm tra- oh, sorry, Max, go ahead. Yeah, I'm trying to remember. I think at midterm you had a, an almost symmetrical site layout, and we really pushed yeah. you on that on that point. Yeah, and it was and a seeing, yeah. <laughs> seeing this evolve, uh, I think you've taken it in a really interesting direction. And, and to, to Judy's point, seeing it respond to the site. Um, I think in, in this case, uh, did you a lot of favors compared to the, uh, the previous version. I am very interested in, in the sort of the fingers that, that project into this public space. Um, mm-hmm. if, if I understood from your program diagram, those are the offices. Is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's a really curious choice. Um, and uh, in Crystal, part maybe because- you Take us there visually. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Max, sorry. And that tends yeah. to happen in the- Right here. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Back. So okay. I think they're doing a lot of favors for that space in terms of breaking down the scale uh, of those double height uh, workshop spaces. Um, and, and the angles that they project into the, the public space creates obviously a very interesting um, experience. Why their offices, though, seems like a, a lost opportunity to me. And, and the adjacency to the workshops, it, it almost for me, it begs the question of why aren't those sort of breakout individual work zones or a layout table for the, the wood shop where you actually can, can sort of step up to and engage with these. I mean, your building gesture is that these fingers are coming into the site to sort of engage with whoever's in this, in this pass-through space. But the fact that it's sort of administrative and closed door office, uh, it, it seems very counterintuitive to me. Um, not to say that that's, that's not baked into your conception of the program, but I, I just want to give you a chance to respond to that maybe. I actually think that's a fair point. Um, and, and maybe that would have been an improvement, but again, um, I suppose my thoughts on having those be offices, again, thinking about what it's like being cooped up and like tucked away in the corner for the office where I feel like that's just, it was again, thinking more in terms of the experience of the people who are gonna be there every day. So- Crystal, the question, the question is, is um, um, there's there's uh, there's ideas in a project that uh, are let's say bigger scale than others, and the communal space which you start out with is more important, I think, um, uh, uh, or a more dominant uh, idea to try to reinforce than somebody being cooped up in an office, because I think there's lots of ways to solve that, you know, especially when you looked at the interior. Uh, which is really uh, uh, a lot of lightness, even even the roof detaching from the walls, uh, the way the walls. Uh, I could, I would, I would love to have an office that was up high, uh, looking a glass box that's suspended in that space that has all of the light, all of the view, and people could see you. But in this case here, I think Max is 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 uh, pretty spot on. I can imagine that um, either as an activity, uh, as he's stating, but it's it's a kind of front porch. You know, it's, it's a place that it, it's, it's an intermediate space between the inside and the outside. And that's that's what my first thought was when I saw those. I said, oh, yeah, you're breaking down the scale. And then those fingers, like like our fingers on our hand, are reaching out uh, into that space. And then the activities that are out there are going to be the first place, uh, the first thing that engages uh, that space. Um, I, th- I think as an architectural move, it's, it's really good. I think it's, it's not just to rethink the, the programmatic aspect mm-hmm. of it, which isn't. That, that big a deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing I was when you're looking at the at, at the site plan and moving uh, through it with your animation, um, and I think this is in in, in the problem itself is um, uh, proportion and scale versus dimension and size. And I'm wondering how, how are you? How are you? Uh, Say more about that. Say more yeah. about that. <laughs> Crystal or uh, me? I mean, uh, Michael. Sorry, proportion and scale. Oh, we, there's there's there's. Um, um, proportion is basically, you know, it's, it's um, in, my, in my case, it's the, it's the relationship of the body uh, to the volume. You've got uh, spaces that are compressive, you know, that make you feel like you're in a, a shorter space. And there are some spaces that are really, 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 really tall. And then there's some spaces where you're, it's an in-between feeling, where you're not sure whether you're going to go up or you're going to go down. My first image uh, that came to mind um, with that years back was the lunar landing module. 
that was just about to touch the moon, but I wasn't sure whether it was coming down or going up. That's, that's a space uh, where your body could float. And that floating uh, notion is, is, is one for me that where, where the mind um, uh, basically begins to, 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 to move uh, a little bit more actively. So your spaces, I think, had really nice uh, uh, proportion. But I'm wondering, did you did you think about the difference between, let's say, the the proportion of a site, a proportion of the spaces, and the building versus just the size, and dimension of them? Um, mainly it was um, intuitive. I suppose it was indirectly a result of. I mean, I think that is something that you have intuitively in the back, where you're like, okay, certain things don't necessarily need to be so tall, or certain things you want to feel, you know, more um, intimate in certain. Hi, but I think in this case it was really more of a more of a resultant in terms of thinking of what needs to be ventilated more. So in terms of the workshop space, the idea of having something be so you know tall was also thinking about you know how much you you don't necessarily want to be hot and have all these things going on in such a tight space. There needs to be something that's a bit more breathable um, versus something where maybe if it's more intimate, like a classroom, do you really need it to be so high? Do you really want it to be more intimate? It's something. It was something I think that it became more of a resultant in terms of what uh, exactly was going to be going on within the, the building and, and the program. You know, size of a fish is in proportion to the size of the tank. You know, I, I see the same thing with uh, with uh, uh, creative imagination. Uh, if you're in a compressed space, you got compressed ideas, which isn't bad because there's sometimes you may want to you you, you may want may want to be uh, working with compressed ideas. I don't think it's any coincidence that artists tend to look for spaces that make them feel like they're going to fly as opposed to nest. Sometimes you need to nest, sometimes you need to fly, you know? Uh, so, I think nice huh? so I think intuitively, no, right, you're right. right. Yeah. Intuitively, your, 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 your body was speaking to you, uh, perhaps visiting a, a number of, of, of industrial spaces and your body remembered uh, the dimension of those spaces and then they came out in a way that makes the spaces, especially that last perspective, feels really quite light. I can imagine working in a space like that. I would definitely want a door. I'd want that whole glass wall or the bottom part of the glass wall to open up uh, to the mm -hmm. outside. Uh, there's times when I'd probably pull a curtain so that nobody would bother me, but there's other times when I discovered something. Ooh, Discovering curtain. something is like falling in love. You want to tell everybody, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and so there's moments where you want private privacy and other other moments you really want to be uh, out in the open singing and dancing beautiful let me ask uh, let me ask the reviewers we have about a minute left would anyone like to just say one thing to close Max Judy Adam um, probably okay Adam oh Mark you have you want to go ahead <laughs> well so the and I I, I appreciate what you've done here, Crystal, uh, the the evolution from the last review is really clear. And um, I, um, I guess the weakness that I see is um, sort of where, where, where are the deliveries happening? Where is the material coming in? Where is the trash going out? It's like this, these buildings feel like they have fronts kind of everywhere is the front. And what I'm not seeing is where is the uh, where's the dirt? Because you know there's going to be mm -hmm. piles and piles uh, of dirt. Uh, so for me, it's it's the the access for the materials and the uh, uh, and the waste, if you will, that feels like. Can uh, I'm sure you've thought of that though. Mm -hmm. I mean that that is what's kind of what I was mentioning that this uh, street view was. I, considered it the more functional side of the building was because thinking that trucks could be able to use those streets to somehow come in here. Obviously this would be rounded off, but this is would be the general area and here would be the garage doors and then this is storage. It happens at the usually at the opposite corners of where all this conversation is taking place. So all that I imagine down in dirty, you know, functional stuff that happens would kind of be happening more towards the back of the buildings where that are facing this part of the street and they get tucked away from this. And yeah, out can I build on that really quickly, Mark? Because I, yeah. I agree. It's almost like every every side is a front, but also every side is a back. And the 
the way you've divided up the program kind of speaks to my earlier point is that it, it sort of feels like your site gesture is very clear. It's responding to the um, perimeter of the lot as well. I mean, the focus is this, you know, this West Mall equivalent uh, through your uh, through your building, but then that's all back of house function, right? Office and uh, classroom space. And so it, it's this weird conflicting idea that uh, I feel like your idea of the program and the idea of the site are sort of confused in a way. Um, that's not to say architecturally, like I said, I think the spaces are very successful. And so I think there's a lot to build upon. I think it's just a matter of, of honing how you're resolving the programmatic issues. Um, All right, uh, I'm gonna, oh, I, I would also to... just one other thing, but I remember, so the uh, the light study models and mid review, uh, that's changed quite a bit. And the way that you brought the skylights in over the, um, the ceiling joists and yeah, exactly. So how do you make it look like uh, the study model where the sunlight was beaming in through uh, the beams Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you've managed to pull that off, I mean, pretty well by aligning the, the skylights with the beams. And then also at the ends of the beams, um, you illuminated the, above the wall. Yeah. Um, so I think you managed, you did manage to create that, uh, that atmosphere of that study model with the light just streaming in between the beams. Uh, you managed to you managed to achieve that, I think, a whole lot better than I expected. So kudos to you for that. I agree. Thank it's you. a very handsome part of the design. Yeah. Thank you. Guys, we have to close. We have to close. Um, thank, you. thank you very much, Crystal. Yay. Thank you, Thanks, Crystal. Chris. Nice work. All right. And um, who do we have next? We have Haley. Thank Hi. you, Haley. Hi, Haley. Hi. Um, can you see the full screen? Yes, we were good. Okay. Should I introduce myself at all or just yeah. well, get yeah. into it? <laughs> um, I'm in my second semester here at UT um, and I have a background in art history. So that's where I'm coming from. From where? Um, from UC Berkeley. Yeah, and I'm in, at home in California right now. Um, so I'll just go ahead and get started. Um, I wanted to start by talking about how I approached the project and sort of situated myself within it by gathering information and observations. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at industrial and agricultural buildings and workshops um, around my own town here in California. And I drove around different parts of town and just tried to observe the feeling of each place and how the buildings acted within that. Um, I really enjoyed this part of the process because these places are really ingrained in who I am and shape the memories that I have of my own home, but I was able to look at them differently. And instead of them just being the backdrop to my own memories, um, and experiences, I was able to really look right at them and see what made them special um, and similar and different and useful and practical, um, what works and how people alter them and adapt them into spaces for work and life to happen. Um, it was very rewarding for me because I already felt that these places were very special, but I got to explore them in an architectural sense um, instead of just a personal sense. So in that same vein, um, the area around our site, as Michael said, is sort of nondescript, very industrial. Um, Westbrook Meadows is really sort of the lifeblood of the area and has a lot of energy around um, their workspace. Uh, he also mentioned the Reinhardt Building, which I decided to keep on the site. Um, I was very attracted to the history of the building. It was a testing equipment manufacturer for a few decades um, before it changed owners. Um, in addition to the site and observations, uh, the readings that 
Michael also mentioned, were really helpful in helping me find the language um, to describe the observations that I made and frame my thinking. And these two quotes in particular are ones that I kept coming back to. Um, I'll just let you guys read those on the screen. Um, I think that the whole idea of this studio is the acknowledgement and recognition of the link between the hand and the brain and craft for manual work. And I was particularly drawn to this duality of hand to brain and the idea that there is a sort of softness to manual work that's just as important as the hard um, and the brute force that's often needed to just get the work done. And there's a delicateness among the rough and something that's often dismissed as simple on the outside um, has a world of knowledge and richness within. And while a world of intellect and depth exists, most craftsmen never really feel the need to make this assertion or prove this point. Um, another quote from the reading from Matthew Crawford says it better than I could, so I thought I would read another quote. And he says that the satisfactions of manifesting oneself concretely in the world through manual competence have been known to make a man quiet and easy. They seem to relieve him of the felt need to offer chattering interpretations of himself to vindicate his worth. He can simply point, the building stands, the car now runs, the lights are on. And this idea um, really stayed with me throughout the project and I wanted my buildings to act in a similar way. So um, starting with the layout of the site, the buildings are arranged in a sort of interlocking manner with each shop facing the opposing outdoor workspace. Um, the gallery is on the left, um, closest to Lamar. And there's also parking there for guests and students. Um, and as I said before, each shop is flanked by an outdoor workspace that connects it to the next shop. Um, while they each have their own distinct space, they open to one another and they're all easily accessible to encourage communication and collaboration. Um, the existing Reinhardt building is at the back of the site and sits next to an outdoor um, space, sort of a green space. And there's also additional parts near this part of the site. So each shop is approximately 5,000 square feet and they all have the same basic layout. They're mostly an open floor plan. There's a restroom, um, office and sort of lockers or first aid at the front. And the Reinhardt is adapted to have, to be like a dining hall with additional classrooms or offices, workspaces, that sort of thing, bathrooms. Um, each shop also has a mezzanine level um, that can be used as a classroom or a meeting space, um, as well as an area to just do work that's sort of out of the way of the rest of the shop, um, if the work requires sort of a different environment. Um, but it's also still connected to what's happening below and also what's happening um, outside, as you can see the um, outdoor workspace and other nearby shops. So the buildings all open on all sides. Um, the front doors and side doors open to the outdoor workspaces and the back to like loading zones or additional workspace. And I tried to think about who would be using the shops um, and how to accommodate for that work and their comfort. So I'll show a couple um, perspectives now from within the shops. So this is a view near the gallery at the front, looking down the main walkway um, with the Reinhardt building in the back. And the buildings are there to really just make space for this manual work to be done in an efficient and collaborative way. Um, I wanted to make a space that allowed people to do their work and the building in a sense takes a back seat and provides a setting for craft. Um, what's happening inside of any of the shops is more interesting than the exterior. And that has to do with the type of work that's being done, but also says something about where the values lie. Um, importance is placed on learning as something intrinsic and personally rewarding, um, not outwardly flashy or self-promoting. 
I didn't want to depart too much from um, traditional industrial workspaces and really honor what works um, about having these open layouts with space on the exterior to allow people to sort of adapt and make their own. So if that's um, adding additional covered storage, parking trailers, storing machinery, extra supplies, sort of making it their own. And one of the key features of the shops is the scissor truss system with large windows that run along the top of the building. Um, the wooden supports are exposed on the exterior and the roof extends beyond the windows to create more shade. Um, while the rest of the shops remain simple, the interest is happening above the head and out of the way of the work done below. I also felt that having this more complex and striking feature above the head in a way connects to that idea of craft being a connection to brain and hand and um, the connection to the work done below in the shops is a reminder um, above you of something more going on. So this view is taken from the Reinhardt building looking through the shops. Um, they're connected visually through windows and doors but also um, by the outdoor workspaces between them. Here are a couple elevations and sections. This one's looking towards the gallery on the left with two shops behind and then the two shops on the right with the Reinhardt building. Um, looking from the south, so there's the gallery on the left and then the back of one of the shops, the front, the back, and the front. Um, a section through two of the shops and then a section through the middle walkway, the gallery on the left. And that's all I've got. That's all. That's all I've got. <laughs> all right, Haley, why don't you take us back to uh, that, that sort of uh, site plan with the shadows. Um, are those pavilions you're depicting there? Are, are those are those your design or oh they they're showing up here so they they are. Yeah, the only uh, building that's existing is the Reinhardt building, which is the the one with the bow bow truss. Uh. I, I guess I'm kind of referring to the those trellis like pavilions that. Those are all her design. Okay, so those are. Because I remember you you were talking about how you allowed space in between um, for um, uh, the, the, the crafts people to kind of build their own uh, sort of ad hoc solutions to whatever they need. Um, and so I was I think it's, um, I was reading those as as sort of part of your narrative of being an example of okay this is here's a depiction of an ad hoc solution to a need for outdoor storage that has some uh, coverage or something. Um, mm -hmm. I was just reading it that way because it um, it's it's a very rudimentary kind of construction there, um, which kind of is like a departure from, I guess, just like this simple complexity of the the warehouses you've designed um and i really like the the very kind of like um, I, li I like that the 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 new buildings are, are referencing the existing building and the fact that you've decided to keep the existing building i'm glad that they have some kind of conversation with it um so uh I guess the in-between spaces for me, like, I'm, I'm glad that you have them. Um, I guess, uh, like, I, I, I wish you didn't, like, show us those, like, rudimentary um, pavilions that are in between. The little almost, pergola. Yeah. Those pergolas. Um, what, what's the thinking behind those pergolas? Um, I think I wanted to have something there that sort of broke up that space a little bit and sort of connected the passageway between them through the doorways. Um, 
I think well, Adam's also, wondering like why, I said, Adam's wondering why they're so I guess small or just not as not as glorified maybe as the I don't know Adam I don't want to put words in your mouth sure you just I, seem disappointed in those little those little pergola guys um, um little, I, yeah. yeah yeah so I okay so when working outside which I do a lot of the time when I'm building things because I just don't even have space so I'm just working outside I always wish that there was some way that I could have like a covering at certain times, um, just a, a roof, an outdoor roof, essentially. So um, I think it's uh, totally the right idea to have outdoor workspace and spaces that face each other that, where people can kind of move between um, the hard distinction of these, these workshops. You have this blurred boundary, these in-between spaces, which I think is a great idea. I guess it would be interesting because it feels like most of your architecture is like in the roof design of the scissor truss. And um, it's kind of deployed like the same way in each instance of these workshops. And then um, it might be nice to see like some variation in how that scissor truss like extends beyond the perimeter of the floor plan, yeah. such that maybe in certain instances that scissor truss actually has a very large eave that like provides cover for like a fully um, shaded and protected from some elements like outdoor workspace. So like, and maybe that's modulated for the program um, specifically, like maybe certain workshops would need more outdoor space. Like maybe the wood shop would need more outdoor space than the, uh, I don't know, the ceramics shop because they're just working in the kilns. So I think it'd be interesting to like start to think about, okay, the architecture doesn't need to be bombastic and, and uh, in your face, but like you're kind of taking this like ut utilitarian approach. And so I'm gonna question the utilitarian aspects of the design. So like if we're gonna have outdoor workspaces um, that speak to the design of these like more uh, to the to the roof designs, I would expect the roof at some point in some places to accommodate some functional um, outdoor work. I think that's a that's a what Adam um, is talking about. Um, would if if you had thought of of doing that. Um, it solves a practical problem where the height of the outdoor um, the structure, even if it extends from the inside, when, when, it, when I'm looking at the elevations and I see the cadence of the vertical windows, and then all of a sudden there's a big door that sees through everything, I was imagining that there was going to be a possibility of having a small sort of gantry from inside that you could move bigger, heavier objects from the inside to the outside. And then as Adam uh, describes, that that now uh, could lead you to figuring out uh, how to extend the, the scissor truss, um, adding an extra scissor to it, let's say, uh, to the outside in some way, or the members from the scissor truss extend to the outside. Um, and now you have uh, just the, the wonderful interior space um, somehow coming, not somehow, but coming to the outside and, be, and becoming uh, quite evident because it's really elegant. Uh, the, the, I think the, actually the whole project uh, is very elegant. When i staring at the site plan, um, for me, elegance is when my, the first thing for me is when my body takes, it comes to rest and I look at something and, and it's, my mind isn't jumping all over the place and, and it's, it's very calming. Uh, and then, and then the, the spaces in between are, you're, you're almost seeing the entire um, a, a sort of assembly of workspaces as one floor plan instead of they are separate buildings but I think when you start to see boom 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 and then the way they open up to each other uh, with the spaces in between that are shared it's basically one big space subdivided into five separate spaces into five with five separate buildings so I think that's really uh, really uh, quite uh, wonderful um, uh, but anyways, I think uh, Adam's point is a really good one. 
because it would allow you to really uh, study structure and how to, inv how to basically do a permutation of a scissor truss as it moves to the outside. Um, a question that I have going back to the quotation, uh, I think um, your observations and, and your analytics uh, seem that your, your experience, uh, or not your experience, your, your prior degree in, in, in art history served you well uh, in both of those ways. I'm, I'm wondering if you could take that quotation, which was uh, really a, a good quotation, and paraphrase it in your own words, and then show us what the architectural equivalent is of what that quotation is. Um, the link of hand to brain quote. Yeah. However, you said you yeah, you said I that it, you said that it was present throughout the project. So I'm mm -hmm. sure that there were times when it popped out. You know, and you said, "Ah, yeah, that's it. Boom." And there's other times that it's just sort of infusing. Uh, your entire process. So where are those pop out? Yeah. I think for me, um, sort of, I mentioned earlier that I think that having the roof system be something that's above you and sort of, I guess, metaphorically like more of the brain and then the hand being the work that's done in the shop felt like the most powerful example of that. Um, and I just really wanted to like think about this project i guess based on the other quote of like beauty and utility is like i wanted to elevate it in the sense that it's a school and kind of like give it um something extra but also like want my dad or like my uncles or like my friend who's an electrician to like be there and feel like themselves and like it was made for them yeah. and that it was something special um, yeah, that space feels and I very hope special. That I did. Yeah, no, it feels. Okay, let, let me um, uh, hold this image for a second. Um, it, it's nice the, the the lattice work up at the top. It's like a Kentucky tobacco barn, uh, letting the light in, which is pretty nice. Um, I don't I, I I don't remember the section through there, but I'm imagining with that loft space, if that were to pop out, if that was on the side of where the other other. Uh, of that of the walkway in between all the buildings if that popped out you could have um mm -hmm. a, a, a balcony as a porch on the second level where people could be chatting it up uh for one thing and and the space that's also really nice is where the scissor truss comes down on the diagonal to the wall um i would ex i would have explored how to expand the uh, the pu pu be able to walk through that space so that that right right at the uh at the rake line, mm -hmm. you basically widen it uh, to a meter uh, so that you can actually, and then bridge, maybe even bridge across. Um, now nah, that wouldn't be because you couldn't have trucks move around. But in any case, I think the, even, even if it, it, they don't have any practical, uh, there's no practical reason for doing certain things, walking in that space uh, would, boy, that would clear my mind. Uh, I, I really <laughs> love that. So. Anyway, it's yeah, nice really to have like, a look at something. It's nice when I'm when you're able to look at something and then your mind starts seeing, oh, what am I going to do next? Oh, what am I going to yeah, do yeah, next? Yeah. So it's it's yeah, nice. This is a very very evocative. Uh, your yeah. perspectives are just delightful. Um, I have to tell you, my favorite is the one with the workers at the benches there. And I think that's where, at the time that you put that slide up, uh, you were saying something quite eloquent, which made sense to me. I don't, but I don't think you know what you were saying right at this moment, do you? I do. I have no. <laughs> <See. laughs> so one of the things we talked about in the studio a lot, and when we talked about making these perspectives, was to emphasize the relationality. That is, to be in one space, to see through to another and another and another. Yeah. So I get great pleasure out of seeing that we're in a room, we're looking under that uh, pergola. We see the outside of the next one. We see inside the next one through its windows to the third one, you know? And that's, that sense of placidness is not, not entirely accidental. Haley worked on it. We all talked about that effect. So the, the, the fenestration and the penetration of spaces into each other, 
the creation of all these boundaries is something I think Haley has done very, very well. But that isn't what you were talking about as you, as you talked about this. It was more about the nature of work, as I recall, that you wanted to sort of dignify the work, but without... Um... Yeah. Haley, how did you, what were you saying here? Look at your notes. Um, yeah, I, I guess I was saying that um, to me, this type of work is very intrinsically motivated and satisfying and rewarding and just letting the buildings mm -hmm. let that happen and not distract from that and sort of reference that same character and value of learning and work. So the overall feeling of a cross between a barn and a church is, not, is something you think is appropriate here, right? Yeah, I guess. It wasn't conscious, but I realized later that like my dad um, had a workshop growing up and it was in a barn on our property. So I think like subconsciously, I just knew like mm -hmm. that that's where real work is done. And that's what I wanted to do. Well, that's explore. wonderful that you have, it's wonderful that you're able to tap into a deep part of your soul or, you know, I think all, all architects should be able to do that. They should feel like they can do that. I think that's it's sorry, really I'm stepping on the toes of other reviewers guys I'm sorry no I think yeah. that was a, that, 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 that when I first saw the, the that interior image uh, with, it reminded me it, it basically it felt like I was in a, in a chapel and it was almost like you're repurposing uh, a chapel into a workspace and um, it's not it, it's there's no way you can really uh, put together a memory and anticipation in a conscious way and I, I think I think your this project uh, does that. Uh, it feels very familiar on the one hand, but then your ideas about making, uh, and 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 even the cooperation between the, each of the maker spaces, I think that that that, and that anticipates a better world, uh, and and the making itself uh, is is an anticipation of 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 a, of a creative act uh, looking forward. So I think I think there's a okay. there's a number of things in play here that. Pretty, pretty wonderful. In the Tom Sachs uh, 10 Bullets video, he says, walk into the workshop as though you're walking into a sacred space and close oh, the wow. door quietly behind you. And- uh, <laughs> That's nice. It's, this space isn't quite as precious as a church, although which, uh, what artisan wouldn't want to work in a church um, for the quality of, of the space inside. Yeah. But um, Haley, the, the the, the resolution, especially on uh, uh, the second floor, the mezzanine and uh, the, the way you brought the glazing onto the bottom cord of those trusses, um, I think is really uh, gorgeous. Um, it's, you've, you really worked out some of the darker, sort of some of the murkier areas uh, are really nice and clear and uh, uh, well-treated. I, I also, I appreciate you talking about the, the hand and the link of the hand to the brain. And I completely am sold by the idea that you said that above you, there is something more going on. That um, while you're here working on the small scale, there is something uh, literally inspirational over your head, um, as well as the whole sort of community of these things working together. I think that the whole site plan has a, 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 a looseness and a humanity about it that is is really quite uh, comfortable and hard hard to pull off with new buildings. Um, uh, aside from the lack of uh, outdoor shade, which you live in, you've been in Texas, you know what it's like here. Um, I like that the renderings also show pallets and forklifts and recycling bins, and none of that stuff feels totally out of place uh, in these buildings. Guys, we have five more minutes. Thank you, Mark. It was beautifully put. Judy? I think it's interesting that we've all kind of returned to the roof. We're all looking at the roof and that the roof for you was important metaphorically, you know, as a representation of, of the relationship between the hand and the brain. I think it's often interesting for students when they're at the end of a project to almost look, go back and look at their projects objectively. Um, try and remove yourself from what you're looking at and see where you've invested your energy. 
because I mean, clearly your energy is invested in this roof. You know, it, um, it, it, it is the architecture for your project. But I kind of want to loop back around to this whole idea of the hand and the brain for a minute, because I think um, everything we're looking at right now, because of what we're going through right now is digital, right? And I think it's important for us to remember that as designers, as craftspeople, you know, there is the relationship of the hand and the brain that is being compromised right now, right? We're being asked to produce everything on a screen. And um, I would encourage all of you guys not to forget that you have a hand and a brain <laughs> and that um, the way those two things interact, your brain and your hand, um, is completely different than the way your hand and your, your computer interact, right? Um, there's this wonderful, I think I've referenced it before on a, on a review not too long ago. There's a wonderful TED talk that they did where they wanted to investigate how creativity manifests itself in the brain, right? So they wanted to, you know, like put all the electrodes on this guy's head and have him do something creative and see where the brain lights up. They're looking at where creativity lives and, and you know, what other parts of the brain it engages. And um, what they found out was they couldn't sit somebody down and tell them to be creative. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it does the opposite. It shuts them down, right? But if they put a bunch of jazz musicians together in a room and said, okay, improvise, you know, the guys went nuts. So they brought a bunch of jazz musicians in, they hooked up a bunch of electrodes to their brains and they said, play. And what they realized, what they saw was not that there was a particular part of the brain that lights up when you're being creative, but that the rational part of your brain actually shuts down. So the heat in that part of the brain goes down, right? Which means that, that you know, other intuitive, irrational things are, are able to make connections, right? And um, I think that's what happens when you sketch, you know, that there is an immediate uh, cause and effect that is not processed. Your brain is talking directly to your hand. And that doesn't happen on a computer because a computer is always right. asking you to stop and think about what you're clicking to, what you're connecting. So the, the rational is interrupting that thread even before that thread has a chance to be completed. Judy, so, be um, beautifully, beautifully said. And in fact, in the studio, we, did, we only drew when we designed. We, uh, I did not uh, let people go to the computer until they had something. Yeah. that they wanted to do, yeah. yeah. Um, Max, would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think I agree with everybody that, you know, this rendering in particular and the way that you've developed these, um, I'll call them sheds, uh, but you could just as easily call them barns or churches. Um, it, it's obviously very evocative, very elegant, um, and, and brings up all sorts of associations. Uh, I do go back to uh, Adam's point about the pergola and these in-between spaces is that the architecture that you develop is, is very um, compelling and convincing. It's, it's the other stuff around, uh, around the architecture that feels a little bit less resolved. Those pergolas feel a little bit like entourage. And, and I think that there were some opportunities to either extend the gable extrusion so that open, you know, covered spaces are uh, sort of interlocked, creating a a sawtooth uh, walkway down the middle or even extending the eaves as, as Adam suggested for covered spaces. Um, but, but really, I think my, my main point that I would wanna, <laughs> thanks Mark, uh, I would wanna convey is, uh, you know, this association that you have with, uh, you know, rural agric agricultural buildings and, and your dad's workshop is, is obviously a very personal one, but it, uh, I would challenge you, I think, a little bit to sort of reckon with, with the subtleties and the, the nuances of rural agricultural buildings versus um, the sort of more industrial workshop uh, vernacular that is already on the site. And it seems like maybe I'm talking about the same thing, but um, I think there's a reason when we're inside the your workshops that we're talking about these wood members, that they feel like a corn cribs or a Faye Jones church uh, and not necessarily like these corrugated metal um, Kind of vernacular moments and, and, I, and I think the risk of your project as it stands is that it is such a simple party 
and and the buildings themselves are very elegant but i think the ultimate risk is that there may be it, it feels maybe too resolved in a way and for me i think the charm of a lot of these workshops and and i think that you see this in, in those um, source photographs that you took at the beginning and it's evident by the way michael was describing that westbrook metals building is in these really idiosyncratic moments uh, that that don't make sense from an architectural perspective but give these buildings a sort of charm and life of their own that um, you can't necessarily be intentional about right it, they were sort of driven by the function of, of tradespeople just making what they knew how to make and solving a problem on the site you know if you take a design build studio you, there's all these what we call design build moments right where uh, you thought you had in your head what it was going to be and then you're on site and then you have to just come up with a different solution and, and make it work and and I think that that would be a challenge for you to just figure out if, if there's any moments in here that you can break the rhythm and break the um, the consistency of it all and, and add a little bit of uh, idiosyncrasy. Hey Max, you know how I think that may be possible. Uh, maybe the only way is that now that the project is to say quote unquote finished, you then remodel it. You know, uh, you add things to it as if new tenants are moving in. Yeah, and, they, uh, and they don't <laughs> good idea yeah it's a lovely idea the trick you're both talking about is something that you know zen zen uh, brush painting tried to do and calligraphy which is yeah it's got to look spontaneous and accidental but it takes uh, 50 years to make it look like that yeah um it's it's a very very delicate line uh what? between rationality and spontaneity and to have the two somehow come out right. Um, listen, we do have to move on. Haley, what a great job. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Yeah, it's a nice project. Um, I think Donesh is lurking somewhere. Donesh, are you there? Hey, yeah, I'm lurking. I'm all early. All right. I would love to, to hear you speak, <laughs> but we have to move on a little bit. That's OK. All right, Donesh, thanks for being with us. Yeah. Um, who is going next, guys? I'm next, I think. All right, Stella. Break. Um, Welcome, Stella. Okay. So, question: Do you can you guys see my cursor? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um. So I'm sorry. I'll get back. I'm Stella. Um. I'm in my second semester at UT and I did a bachelor's of environmental design at the University of Colorado in Boulder um, and um, I'll get into it. So from the beginning I really approached this project um, thinking about these four entities or these four shops as being um, four people coming together or the carpenter, the woods worker, um, the woodworker, the ceramicist and the stonemason all coming together. And so um, I also was thinking about the idea of um, typologies of like a Western town and a formal campus. Um, and so then when I got into the site and looking at um, the surrounding context, I really became inspired by the bow truss of the Reinhardt building. And um, around town, I started looking at these kind of false facade um, historic structures and also um, the Quonset huts around town. Um, and just on North Lamar, really close within a mile of our site, there's a lot of examples of other similar buildings. Um, this Alamo glass building being the actual airplane uh, hangar from the airport, um, this red velvet event center, um, and then Quonset's nearby. Um, and then also further context in Austin, um, other kind of curved uh, buildings. So um, I saw my campus as being a combination of these things, this uh, kind of more formal campus idea and also the informal um, Quonset kind of gathering space. Um, and so here's a little bit of the idea. The four shops would be these four um, entities and then the gallery facing North Lamar and then this dining and um, artist residence center on this in the current Reinhardt building. And then lastly, uh, a park space on the kind of triangular end. Um, so here's a little bit more of that site plan. Um, I had thought you would approach from North Lamar. Um, if you're visiting the gallery, you would park on this side. If you're coming um, as a normal student, you'd probably park over here, a teacher. 
Um, and then this other corner being um, a loading dock, more utility parking area. Um, so here's just the space is a little bit more labeled. Um, and in the plan, you can see these are the four shops and then each have their own like auxiliary space that includes like the classrooms, offices, um, and kitchenette, and then um, like a kiln room or a storage area. Um, so yeah, I think that's that. Um, and here we're looking from North Lamar, um, thinking about access, kind of trying to uh, both shelter from the street, but also create like a more intimate um, interior and also this access between the existing Reinhardt building and um, the gallery. And then um, this is just a quick axon of kind of what I thought the spirit of the inside um, would be between these shops, looking at the ceramic studio um, and then into the glass studio or into the stone studio. And then their own, each studio has its own like outdoor covered work area. Um, and here's some elevation. So this is looking um, from the west side or no, east side of the site, east-ish, um, west-ish site, um, north and south. And then here's our section cutting um, long ways across the site through the gallery, um, across the middle of the courtyard, and then um, this parking utility area and the park. Um, it's a little bit closer of a view. And then here's cutting um, across north south, um, looking from the wood shop and or yeah, the wood shop into the stone shop. Um, and here's across two shops, the metal and the wood shop, looking towards the um, metal mm -hmm. building, looking north. Um, and it's a little bit of an odd section just because the building's strange shape. So it's honestly cutting through these offices a little bit on each end. Um, and here's my perspectives of this is coming from um, the south side. Um, there's a bit of an alley of trees and then into the center courtyard. Um, this is looking from the Reinhardt building into um, towards North Lamar. And then this is in the ceramic studio, how I would envision the space um, looking into the stone shop. Um, and then lastly, um, from the gallery kind of porch looking into towards the Reinhardt. Um, and then I just want to say I looked at some precedents of how um, Quonsets have been both um, historically used and then also like some newer projects that are um, kind of combining um, a more normal like concrete wall um, into a Quonset hot roof. So yeah, this, that's it. <laughs> I guess I could go back to the site plan if that's. The best. It's, okay, just stop right there is good, I think. Hmm. I really like when you have a building section that you have a site plan that shows the building section at the same time. It really, it seems like such an obvious thing, but we know so much about what you're showing when we can also see that that line going through the site. Anyway, it's very informative. Um, I, uh, I, your, your project hasn't changed a whole lot since the mid review and I don't see why it should. Um, you've just really gone into it and fleshed out and developed what was happening in there. But, um, I still, uh, I still do think of, uh, this as a, uh, kind of a society of rooms, uh, to use one of Michael's phrases and the rooms are or some of them are buildings and some of them are rooms within buildings, but that they are a, uh, a group or a family uh, is, is a really strong metaphor. And I, I mean, I, I feel this is just a, a, a very successful use of the overall site. I feel it's a, uh, it addresses the street as well as it addresses the courtyard, as well as it, um, separates off the more public area, which is the cafeteria uh, and parking to be um, the, the one zone that's, that's actually different from where all the, the intricate handwork is taking place. Um, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of this project. 
Um, in the spirit of looking at, if you were to give me this project, what I would look at next uh, is where, where the units, uh, where the buildings, there's a couple things um, that, that I think are, are connected, where the buildings bump into each other uh, and you chamfer the corners. Uh, mm -hmm. I was beginning to think what would be uh, the sort of bridging uh, program and the bridging space uh, between the two. Uh, um, one plus one equals one is uh, what comes to mind. So that'd be one of the opportunities. And um, I'm sure you must have had conversations uh, uh, with Michael about um, how Lucon would handle uh, colliding uh, geometries uh, with a th usually a third space. So you're looking at a dominant subordinate between one and the other. And since both of these spaces are dominant spaces, then there would be a subordinate third space as a bridging element, which would be really uh, pretty great. Because if these, if these workspaces are bridging each other, then from the outside, it looks like you have many buildings, but it's actually conceived of as one program, so to speak. So that's, that's, that's one thought. The other thought is because of the geometries that you're starting to set up on the inside, what's a bit curious is that uh, you basically have the two end buildings off the geometry that's set up by the four center buildings, which is okay if that's intentional. But what comes to mind is there's a, a project, maybe Michael had mentioned as well, is in Rome um, to, un to, to unite uh, a bunch of buildings for the, uh, the capital overlooking um, uh, the Roman Forum is a project called Compadolio. And it has a, a shape on the inside similar to this, but then it makes a plaza into an oval. Uh, any kind of a circular shape in my mind is, it unites people. Uh, even though you don't know, uh, well, a circular shape, there's always an implied center. In the case of an oval, there's, there's two implied centers. So you, you basically feel uh, a sense of unity within that. But anyways, I think that's an opportunity here. So the, placements of, the placement of the trees would be, would be critical in, the, in that regard. Uh, if trees at all, for that matter, um, or one gigantic uh, tree of life in the middle or something. But anyways, I think there's, there's a lot of really uh, great things here that uh, automatically just sort of are evocative. I'll just I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, it's interesting you should talk about the trees because, uh, yeah, we talked we talked a lot about the, getting the trees right. But the idea of an oval in the center there is uh, quite intriguing. Yeah, I had thought because we kind of had the idea of a western piazza early on, and at one point we were like maybe the whole thing is gravel and you can drive your truck in. Um, and then also balancing that with like, oh, it's gonna be really hot and I want people to be able to go out there and sit in the shade um, was something that I kind of fluctuated between. Maybe there's a big um, eat, uh, 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 PTFE covering over it uh, in the summer. In the winter, you roll it back. Yeah. Anyway, there's a number of opportunities. How do you, how do you, how do you uh, handle the space? Cause, because that becomes uh, the seventh building, so to speak, inside there. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with Michael on uh, thinking about different ways to unify these buildings. Um, and I, I think, you know, we have also just coming to mind thinking about circular ways to unify like disparate buildings. Sana, um, uh, designed in the past 10 years of, of the 21st Century Museum of Fine Arts, um, which you may have already seen, but essentially it's a, it's a sort of like almost, you know, each building is like separate from, it's like essentially like a collection of separate buildings, but they share one roof and the roof just kind of like splits through okay. and, the, and the, each building kind of actually punctures through that roof at different heights. I'm not sure if you can actually actually go on top of the roof, but returning to like where you started with that diagram of, of the characters gathering around a table, it might be interesting to like bring that more like maybe Stella, think about maybe that. Show that 
Yeah. Like, if the plaza was maybe elevated in some way, or um, mm. like if the plaza wasn't just at the ground level, but was elevated and kind of thought of as a table a little bit more, mm. where it is actually um, connecting those buildings and, and has a form and, and also like has its own presence as a thing that changes how you move through space. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, that would be really cool. Because I, I really like how you started with like that metaphor. So Stella, what would you say the Quonset hut roof brings to the project? I mean, besides referencing this kind of gritty, you know, industrial, you know, almost vernacular profile. Yeah, um, I had thought of it mostly as like a cool or an interesting way to bring the informality to informality elements um, of both like a campus that's organized in this kind of formal courtyard, but then also like kind of these informal hats on each um, building. Um, Are they all, is the section consistent? I mean, it looked like they were all different heights, maybe different widths. Is that correct? Um, they're actually very similar. So like uh, the north and the south ones are the same, but they're slightly varied just based on the sites, um, squishing them a tiny bit. But um, the shop spaces are both, they're all four taller than the auxiliary spaces. Um, so I wanted to have the feeling of going through a bit of a more closed space and then opening into the shop, um, a bigger, taller space. Okay. I mean, because one thing they do is they certainly give you an uninterrupted expanse of space, right? Right. That, I guess that's, that's one of the main houses, <laughs> all of that. But the other thing they, they do, um, I mean, the military used them, the military may have even invented them, right? Because they were easy to build. They were easy to deploy and um, they were almost always the same size, right? So there was an idea of a module or a unit. And I wonder, um, so I wonder about the variability of them. You know, how would your project have been different if you were limited maybe to a, a, a single profile or a single, you know, dimension, if you had to array these things in such a way that they maintain their, um, you know, their, their singularity, you know, but um, came together to create a unique whole in a way, okay? I mean, it's hard to look at this and not think about Khan because Khan was inspired by the same thing at the Kimball, but he kind of embraced the roof and then found what was remarkable about it, ways of bringing in light and everything and letting us appreciate that roof so that the roof itself became the architecture. And I feel like kind of where you started, it became, um, something that you can manipulate to the point where it loses what makes it remarkable, magical, and actually utilitarian in a way. It just becomes another element, right? Instead of, um, you know. If you listen to what, I really think about what Judith is saying, um, I'm liking this exploded view. I would have columns that go up and hold the roof, and not touch the buildings. Maybe yeah. not this far, you know. <laughs> uh, but what she's no, saying no. about what she's saying about Khan, I mean, I might do it this tall. Uh, what she's <laughs> what she's mentioning about Khan is basically that you come to the site and you don't notice the the overall form initially. You're basically noticing the roofs, and then the the, the walls fill in. Uh, but anyway, that would be another that would be another way to explore this. Uh, I, I think the the different size of of these diff, of the of the, of the roofs is is perhaps um, it, you're trying to make this a little bit more circumstantial, uh, which I can yeah. understand, and then banging into each other, the same thing. Uh, so it, it, usually when uh, the first building that Sayark had, uh, it was very circumstantial. The guy built during the Second World War and he used whatever materials he could find. And throughout this 20,000 square foot building, there is probably 10 different structural systems and all of the places where wood came to steel, steel tubes came to steel trusses, it was never resolved. And that was really fantastic because every time you're walking around the building, you would pause and look at some unresolved situation. And in your mind, you were starting to resolve it. 
and then you start sketching. Um, and that's that's the qualities I think that you're you're starting to uh, um, basically display here, which is which is really uh, really quite nice. Are these hand drawings, or are you hitting uh, uh, the button that says "Make this digital drawing look like hands"? <laughs> um, a little bit of both. They're on an iPad, so half half and half. No, no, no. They're hand. The iPad. Well, they're hand, but hand. yeah. Okay, I'm I'm starting. I draw fact, a lot on the iPad now. If you put that film on the iPad, the reason I couldn't draw on the iPad is because I don't like ice skating. You know? Yeah. Uh, as yeah, soon I as don't I put have that, the film. As soon as I put the film on, the thing that the the the, the joy for me of drawing, and this is uh, what a number of people have mentioned about the, the intuitive and improvisational, is that there's a transaction which comes from the resistance the paper puts up to whatever you're drawing with. It could be a six B or it could be a fountain pen. Each one has a different uh, uh, a, a vibration between uh, the paper through the hand and then ultimately to the mind. And so drawing is, is, is comfort food, uh, you know. Uh, Ted I, talked I, about the he talked about how, you know, the humidity in Texas would change the way he drew because it affected the surface of the paper. Ah. <laughs> so still, I wonder, you yeah. know, um, I didn't see anything underneath the roofs. Did you investigate the structure? How do you hold up these quants of roofs? Because I think that could maybe have started to affect how you think about these buildings joining. You know, what happens when you do chamfer that corner, you know, where these things are butting heads, what does that do to the structure? What opportunities does that open up maybe for, you know, an inventive, um, you know, some kind of inter inventive um, intervention that allows you to interrupt structure and maintain that the structural integrity in a different way. Yeah, from all of my investigations, the um, steel master new ones all are self-supporting. So there wasn't really- um, so they, But those go all the way to the ground, right? Well, they can, they can even span between- In other places, you've got a truss up there. Right, there'll be a truss like everywhere that they're intersecting, um, for sure. <laughs> it may, uh, yeah, they are self- <clears throat> They are self-supporting, but um, let me let me uh, notice that uh, Peter Waldman has joined us uh, from University of Virginia, the one and only Peter Waldman. Thank you for joining, Peter. Uh, oh, feel free to. Uh, I hope and then if you looked at the program, yes. But, um, feel free to throw yourself in anytime you like. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stella, I had a question. This uh, perspective with the roofs. Uh, floating in the air, the courtyard elevation, the wall goes all the way up to the bottom of the arched roof, but- Tell us, Stella, we should but, always track the comments with okay. the drawing. Where but do you go, here? Oh, okay. So yeah, the, the on the courtyard side, the wall, the top of the wall is curved to match the bottom of the arch, right? Correct. But on, on the street side, oh, yeah. the, the wall is straight, is that an actual yeah. difference? Okay. Yeah, so on the back side facing the street, um, I wanted mm -hmm. to have front back character of kind of this um, false facade or facade Western towns. So the back is metal on the side. Um, I was kind of inspired by the Chinati Foundation um, roof where it's like metal roof and then sitting on an inside of um, a brick wall. Talking about the artillery sheds. Yeah. Okay, so there is a definitely a different articulation on the street side. Um, and then on the courtyard side, the shape of that wall, okay, it actually goes beyond the height of the roof and uh, creates one of those one of those western facades. But that mm -hmm. facade is actually the same curve as the roof. Okay, okay. Mm. Are you suggesting she could have like squared them off and just not necessarily? I, I'm really just trying to take it in. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm thinking about what each of those decisions does for the scale of the spaces on either side, and in a way, the taller, the taller mm. wall on this side actually kind of aggrandizes the elevation on the courtyard side. Um, yeah, one of the one of the decisions she made was to enter those big spaces from the side. So the last, ar the last mm -hmm. arch is a porch, and that's really how you enter. 
But mm -hmm. I guess the downside is it leaves the walls facing the courtyard a little yeah. bit sort of um, dumb or, you know, with, without access. I mean, right, you, you enter from the around. It seems functionally correct, but gesturally a bit odd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because they're neither facade nor elevation. Yeah. Um, if it, by, by lifting them up above the roof uh, plane, mm -hmm. uh, they, they would uh, start to um, uh, sort of lean towards wanting to be facades, which means that you're composing them as opposed to just letting windows happen wherever they are. But since the, you're interested in the Quonset, uh, in, I don't know if it was the Reinhardt building, the one that had the, the metal roof mm -hmm. extending out over, over the wall, creating a, a, a bit of a shadow, uh, you could have done that to show, uh, for Quonset material to span that distance, it would have very deep um, uh, corrugations. corrugations. And uh, that, uh, could have extended out. Anyway, there's a number of things you could have done, mm -hmm. uh, but that's when you're when you're looking at, at different iterations. That's uh, one of the things you study. Does it extend out? Does it stay in? Or, or, or the, or, are the walls? Uh, it, it could be, like when you go to the hill, uh, first time I went to San Gimignano, I was uh, really taken by the symmetry of a thousand years ago, or the asymmetry of a thousand years ago, the symmetry overlay of of 500 years ago, and then the remodeling of sort of present day. And so you'd see a, a multiplicity of, of, of openings either patched or still there on a facade. So, mm -hmm. so the, the facade had, had the same kind of history that someone who works with their hands would have as well. Uh, so th that's another way to be thinking about where something is both a facade and, and an elevation simultaneously. And then it has a few generations of, 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 uh, of, of sort of of indexing. We have yeah, I mean, it's left. Uh, Max, would you like to? Uh... Sure. I mean, I don't really have much new to add. I think uh, basically everybody basically nailed down what I was going to say. <laughs> um, but I, I think to Mark's point, you know, you had a really successful project at, at midterm, and and there was not much reason to to deviate course there. Um, I think I'll just remark on, on your presentation a little bit. I, I think you missed a couple opportunities. One, it, uh, I agree with, with the Adam's earlier point about um, elevating that courtyard. And, and part of why I agree with that is the, the opportunity to develop this, um, this project more thoroughly through section. Uh, and, and I think that the sections that you drew here are, are useful um, in, in, a, in sort of painting the picture but I think there's also an opportunity to develop a, a pretty evocative drawings, dog leg sections that correspond to these, uh, you know, kink together workshops, um, and and trying to figure out a, a maybe a a more evocative way of of showing your sections because um, I think your hand drawings are, are for me they tell the story of this project, and I would just like to see a little bit more development in, in how these hard line drawings uh, reflect that same character. Second point, uh, I think, um, if you were to take this project further, I would, I would do elevation studies of those interior faces uh, and, and really push, yeah. push the sort of character element of, of these buildings that they're all sitting around a table uh, and see where that gets you. But uh, I think it's a, it's a very charming project of the, the unifying gesture of the Quonset roof uh, obviously makes this feel very much like a campus. Uh, as well as the simple things that you did, like just crisscrossing paths through that courtyard, it, it feels like a, a quad of a, of a college campus in, in a lot of ways, but also subdivides that space in, in a pretty uh, believable and meaningful way. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, Stella, uh, your interior perspectives uh, a week or so ago, I think I saw interior perspectives li like uh, better than this. I think um, as you kept generating new new ones and new ones, um, I I just know that the space inside here is not as as gloomy as we see here. Um, you had some really marvelous ones, and if you have time in the next few weeks, I want you to try to show this design better, because I think it has qualities that uh, the rendering part has gotten the better of you. It, it could be that you were adjusting the design or adding furniture. 
Um, <laughs> but um, I think the light in here is much better than what the renderings are showing. Just judging by the windows and the skylights and the kinds of things we would see. Yeah, I had wanted to do another interior render because this one is like a really late afternoon sun. Um, so it does look pretty uh -huh. nice there. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I, and I, and we, we had some renders of looking from one shop into the other through that, uh, through that sort of hybrid intersection. Mm -hmm. um, again, there, there are sort of moments here to pick that I think could be, could be uh, more, more persuasive. Because I think everyone can see the charms of the, of the project. I mean, just the fundamental uh, spatial moves. Um, yeah, and Stella, this is this is a throwaway comment, but uh, I can't help myself. Uh, in your plan drawings, I, I do appreciate that you started to lay those out in terms of desks, and um, you sort of fleshed out these open spaces a little bit. Uh, I do want to point out that your workshops just have desks; they don't have tools or equipment. <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, it, it's something to think about just as you go from studio to studio to make sure that your plans are telling the story that you want them to tell. But uh, yeah, it, I got about as far as like some um, pottery wheels and kiln room, and then I was like, I don't know what to do in the wood shop. Sure. In the middle, and shop. that's a lot to ask. You know, you don't. Yeah, you know, it takes a lot of years of experience to know how to lay out a, a wood shop, and maybe Mark can provide some insight. Yeah, and I didn't that. really ask people to be too plausible about that. Yeah. The, time, the clock was ticking. Um, hey, Stella, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you, guys. Thank Good you. job. All right, That's who's right. Uh, last? Who's next? I am. Who said I am? Mariam. Uh, Mariam. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Hi Welcome, everyone. Mariam. Yeah. I'm Mariam Adamji. Um, and so for um, my design of the Manual Arts um, Labor Center, I was really focusing on what um, early on I was thinking of what it means to be a craftsman. Um, and so I started investigating kind of Malevich suprematist works and paintings. Um, so this one, the eight red rectangles and his architect on A, um, and also um, his painting dynamic suprematism. And from those mainly, I was thinking about a craftsman as an inventor and an assembler of parts. And so I was looking for a source of inspiration to describe construction um, and relational elements between parts that would still be differentiated from one another. Um, so in my site plan, I try to, in my overall scheme, I try to incorporate that idea of intersecting um, elements because I believe that a craftsman also works with the assembling of parts. So I wanted to express that in um, the architecture itself. So on the grander scheme, I have these individual workshop um, modules, two modules make one workshop. And then intersecting is um, a mezzanine, which connects the workshops by way of an underpass and also um, a second floor that connects the workshops. But it also creates an access through the site um, to the main gallery space, which is in the hangar that um, is taken from the existing site. And also, um, to kind of be in the same vein of expressiveness of structure um, and construction, I wanted to understand how that would translate to the individual scale of the workshop. So I was looking at trusses um, and exposed structural elements, especially steel and concrete columns. So this is the Hamburg terminal roof structure, which I used as kind of a precedent study um, for how I would design my trusses. And then also um, I was looking a little bit at Ernsting's um, warehouse by Calatrava and the way that he has um, the garage doors fold out and kind of like the mechanical um, aspect of that. So in my individual module, I have um, five 
of these 3D prismatic trusses and um, covered with a curved corrugated roof structure. And um, also the trusses are resting on these exposed columns. So here is an interior view of how that would look. Um, the trusses are kind of placed at an angle um, which allow a clear story um, facing the south end to let light into the workshop. So um, my plan, as I was describing before, have two modules equal um, one joint workshop. The glass and pottery kind of work interconnectedly. Um, and then uh, adjacent to that would be the stone shop the metal and wood shop. I placed the metal shop here because um, actually Westbrook Metals mm -hmm. is right over there. So um, that's also kind of creating this idea of like a relationship of the buildings to each other and to um, the site itself um, that's surrounding it. And also the reasoning behind the wood shop being next to the metal shop is because they um, kind of share a lot of the same tools and machinery. So um, the intention was that maybe this courtyard could be some sort of shared space for both of them. And then I found stone, pottery, and glass as more similar crafts. So I placed them on the same side as well. Um, but also there are doors um, connecting the same workshop through its claimed courtyard space. So the pottery and glass shop have this area as their outdoor workspace. Primarily the stone workshop has this space and they can go in through um, both parts of the workshop. And then um, loading areas also on these ends. So trucks could pull in and a gantry would connect um, the two sides of the workshop to each other. Um, and then at the mezzanine level, there would be kind of like a further connection between um, other workshops because I think earlier, Michael Rotundi, you were saying um, something that I was thinking about during the project about exchanging information and how we learn um, craft best through that exchange. So while each workshop has its own courtyard space, um, when they enter through the mezzanine level, um, they're able, Oh, there should not be a line here, but they're able to uh, um, go across mm -hmm. and see across to the um, other workshop. So pottery can see into wood shop from its mezzanine level and um, glass can see into wood shop and etc. Um, so entering upon the site, um, there's this view of these stacked workshops. I, I kind of arrange them in a very linear and rational way um, to allow, in a way, like an exterior fair treatment for each workshop. They have the same general um, kind of space, but the interiors would look quite different with all the machinery inside them. Um, so on the other end of the site, adjacent to the hangar building that's already existing, would be the road that goes through the site and also a plaza. So upon um, kind of coming to the gallery, there is a plaza in front of it. And then on the other side begins um, the entry into the workshop space and the underpass of the mezzanine. So this is the underpass connecting the site um, longitudinally, longitudinally from North Lamar um, to the back end. And at both ends, there's um, trees. And at the front end, there's a smaller garden, which would allow like bigger sculptural pieces to be placed there. Um, whereas the smaller, more precious pieces that are to be displayed would be at the other end. Um, inside the hangar building. And so there's also this access, um, front access into the workshops. Um, here's kind of a section looking west. 
So um, this is what I was kind of describing as the front end of the site, which is facing North Lamar. And that could be a space where um, kind of sculptures could be displayed. So as you drive along North Lamar, you would see those in view um, and kind of wonder what is going on on this area and plot of land. And then walking through the mezzanine back to the hangar building, um, you're walking through the metal um, workshops and then pottery and stone workshops. So this again is um, the interior view that I showed before when I was describing the roof trusses, but it also um, shows kind of like the ascent into the mezzanine from each workshop. And then even from the bottom, you can see the trusses on the other end. Um, and there's also an office space um, here where um, administrative work could be done and um, a lounge area where students could go up, eat their food, and also just like still be within the space of their workshop. Um, this is kind of a panoramic view um, looking uh, from the center desk of one of the workshops um, and just kind of seeing how there would be windows on one side and also then connectivity um, through this large garage door that folds out. Um, and then towards the other end, there's the mezzanine. Um, this perspective um, is showing uh, your view from the Claire story as you ascend the stairs, um, you're kind of met with the Claire story. And um, there's this opportunity to look across the courtyard into another shop's workspace um, through the windows. And then again, um, it rendered as tempered glass. So it's a little bit blurry, but um, this is to give a sense that once you're in that mezzanine as well, looking the other way, so if you were in the pottery workshop, you could see um, the hangar building and the parking lot and the plaza area. And then this is um, a view of when you're in the mezzanine and in the lounge area. So there are two lounge areas and um, the intersecting hallway. So um, this could be like the kitchenette space and then across you would go to the across workshops lounge to eat. And in that sense, there would be a motivation to um, sit and be kind of transplanted into another workshop space and perhaps the opportunity to learn subconsciously through that. And this is um, a view of the mezzanine hallway and there would be windows allowing light to enter as you walk along and then also entrances into um, the workshop lounges. And then um, also these courtyards, this is like um, a major piece. So this courtyard is the one that does not belong to either workshop, it runs through the middle. And um, I was imagining it as the possible place of like um, lounging mostly, maybe not work, because um, on these facades, there are windows, but on the opposite courtyards, um, there are doors that connect both modules of the same workshop and a gantry as well. So this would be their primary workspace. And that's uh, the presentation. Thank you, Miriam. How wide are the building bays? And how wide are these courtyard bays in between the buildings? Um, so mm -hmm. so um, are you talking about width this way? Yes, yes, please. So this is 30 and these are 20. There's a little bit of an overhang of the roof. Mm -hmm. It's cutting into the courtyard a little bit here. And then how wide is uh, the hallway in between the buildings? So exactly, you've got the double doors facing each other. Mm -hmm. How wide That's, is that hallway right there? This hallway is seven feet. And then the roof extends on top as well. And above that, uh, that mezzanine hallway, 
is that seven feet also, or is it wider than on the on the second floor? It's seven feet also. Hmm. Is the mark of those questions loaded? Does yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, what, um, and I, I do appreciate um, what, what you've done here, um, turning, I think, turning the site plan of the four finger buildings to actually match uh, the cardinal directions uh, gives you a relationship to the sun that I think was is a great step. Um, I realize that I'm not talking about the building bays when I say that, but mm -hmm. I think that having the uh, having your clear stories face a, a, a definite direction um, is something that gives you more control over the light that comes in. Um, but the widths of the bays um, and the uh, they are reasonable. Every every one of those a 30 foot wide. Uh, workshop bay is totally reasonable, but you've got, in effect, you've got two 30 foot wide bays with a 20 foot space in between them. Mm -hmm. And you're, I mean, you're, you're subdividing each of these workshops into two shops and you're subdividing the whole space of the site into a lot of smaller chunks of space as well. And um, I mean, I feel in a way this does relate to your description of, uh, of suprematism and abstraction, but I, I feel like abstraction is something that we have to also be sort of cautious with uh, to some extent. Um, I just wonder if these, if subdividing the whole space of the lot into these 20 and 30 foot bays and these seven foot corridors is the most, uh, generous or expansive or um, sort of holistic way of, of dividing up the site. It feels like it is um, almost overly subdivided for, for uh, uh, and there might be practical ramifications of that. Two, two workshops for every shop um, and you either have to walk outside or you have to walk through the, the hallway to get in between them. I mean, You've, you, you're trying to create a human scale within this very large site. And I do appreciate that. But I wonder if you've actually just sort of subdivided some of these things into a little bit too small of a, of a partition. Hmm. Mark, thought... what, do you, what do you think of um, um, what, what, when uh, Mariam was uh, describing the project in the beginning mm -hmm. and said that two metal shops make up one metal shop, Mm -hmm. I immediately began to imagine that that was both um, going to set up a, a spatial proposition as well as a structural proposition, mm -hmm. where instead of each roof being separate and each truss being separate, the truss would basically span from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And then the wall in between uh, that makes that courtyard uh, would basically be completely openable. So now those two, those two separate spaces uh, could be at least... Uh, perceived uh, as one space and sometimes used as one space. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean one roof because it could be that that's where the structural invention uh, occurs. So mm -hmm. if, if he still wants to have, um, uh, let's say, south facing light, um, you could do that. There, there'd be a way of doing that actually um, by raising up uh, once. Anyways, Mm -hmm. uh, how to basically resolve the structure in the space uh, as, as one and two at the same time, I think is, uh, it might be a little bit more than, than Mariam could uh, uh, bite off at, at this particular moment, but I think the, the, you now have a 30 foot space, a 30, a 20 and a 30 being able to operate sometimes as an 80. Uh, 30, I think is a little bit narrow for, for a shop actually. Uh, you know, considering a lot of, I mean, you could actually, but you're not going to be making like really big stuff uh, in there, but you would work, know better than me. It's workable for sure. Yeah. But I also am wondering the same thing that you're making a very strong proposition mm -hmm. by saying that the metal shop is in effect two buildings um, with a, a space in between think, them. Um, you know, we didn't really get into it as much as possibly we could have, but 
you can see the two pairs of two pairs of doors, right? Let's say in the metal shop, just by yeah. taking out the wall between those doors, exactly. or making yeah. that middle panel rotate or something will go yeah. away. And the other thing to do is to pair the roofs so that they one faces north, one faces south, or have them face each other. That would that would have the uni, sort of a unifying effect gesturally, as to you know what I'm saying. Like so, they don't all face south, but it goes north, south, north, south, or something. And then if she still wants south light, she would put basically uh, something that's equivalent to big dormers on 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 the Perhaps. side that's. Yeah, down or just that we would gesturally sort of make it would make the pairing more more expressed, I guess. Mm -hmm. well, I have to say, what what prevented us doing things like that was more like, you know, this sort of delicate balancing act, which all the students did and I did too, which is make the buildings had to be stupid enough. The buildings couldn't be too clever, or they would lose that that vernacular quality. Now you could say that's long gone <laughs> um, and that we were too clever already, but I don't know, that was, it was hard to sort of make use of every idea one had because it would get you into kind of expression territory. You know what I mean? Well, I appreciate the combination maybe of the rigor meter of the structure. That's a very elegant elevation you have over there. Coming in with that would allow these four different materials, metal, wood, uh, stone, and pottery and glass, I guess, to, uh, to exist within it. But the Malevich vitality comes from the fact that where yours is inside and outside the same monotone material, perhaps stucco or plaster, he uses color. So I just wonder if in the metal shop, some of the walls are metal and some of them are glass and some in the pottery, there's um, hollow clay tile or something like that. In other words, could there not be color or materiality or the variety against the structure of the roof? Uh, and so I think your Malaybridge thing um, has a kind of vitality of meter, but also has a vitality of color, which I associate with any craft oriented thing that the materials of a place might affect it. I think it's very beautiful. One comment I'd say about your mezzanine is perhaps instead of looking like it's kind of folded in, into it is that it's actually hung from the structure itself over there and slides within the building and then pops out with skylights coming in from the top to make Marianne, it do you want to go back to that perspective? Bright, bright section in there. It looks like com um, yeah. coming yeah. through the, the materiality of, um, of this zone through here is the same as the walls and floors of your shops, et cetera. And I just wonder if it was really hung from the exposed steel structure in there, it would be shooting through like an arrow or something. Harry, I'm the one where you can see into the next shop, oh, the interior nice. perspective. This one? That's it. No, no. Well, uh, there was one from below. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where we see tables. Um, and we can see up to the mezzanine. That, yeah, That's that it. one. I wonder if all this coming through is actually hung <clears throat> from the yeah. structure rather than resting on the walls on the sides. That'd be mm -hmm. more spatially independent, perhaps. You seem to have little slots of space over here and over here that I go through. So it is a system within the larger system of the structure, but I'd even say the materialities of these walls can syncopate between metal and glass or translucencies and, yeah. and, uh, and terracotta or hollow cake tower or something like that. It would bring the vitality of your initial attraction to the materiality of the Malevich kind of stuff. Um, so um, I like the hum <laughs> humility and the meter of one structure going all the way until you let a contract out for that. And then you have various mm -hmm. trades in town actually sponsor the building of the metal works or the glass works, et cetera, in there. This could be an economic strategy of uh, uh, getting it built with just one very simple structure across the top. Yeah, you know? it's very beautiful. My favorite part is the is the view to view through to the next, uh, where you see the trusses of the next, that strange continuity and yet division. Um, yeah, makes, makes me think. But the walls don't have to go up to the top is what I'm saying. Yeah. It could be even more open as a place of communication if these side walls do not have to go up to the top. Yeah. 
I did. Judy, it looked like you wanted to jump in. <laughs> did I? <laughs> well, um, I don't know. Your picture, your picture came up suddenly. Oh, okay. Um, I think there's a tendency whenever you have a project that um, lays out sort of a repetitive module to um, perceive of those modules and conceive of those modules as being the same thing. When in fact, by their placement on the site um, and by the fact that the sun moves around those four bars, um, each bar actually is quite different, right? Because it's going to accept sunlight in a different way. The ones on the southern edge are going to bring in much more sunlight. The ones on the northern edge, you know, are going to have the indirect sunlight. The east and west are going to open up and, and you know, so the building can actually be um, have a completely different quality in the morning than it does in the afternoon. And I think it could be really interesting to look for the opportunity for the unique within that sort of, um, within the typical, let's say, and maybe consider how that could go back and inform how program comes in, what shops go where, you know, what shop wants indirect northern light, what shop wants artificial light, you know, maybe the bars in the middle where you're getting a lot of um, sun being blocked by the building to the south. Um, you know, what shop wants as much light as possible all day long, and then you can start to program the spaces by the qualities invested in each of them, rather than maybe looking at them as these anonymous, um, you know, again, repetitive units that are seemingly the same, but are in fact actually quite different. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Dinesh, we, did you wanted to say something? Yeah, I just had two uh, two observations. One is is related to what Judy was talking about. Could we go to the beginning where you showed that artwork? Uh, first of all, I thought it was interesting that you defined a craftsman as an inventor and assembler of parts, because your project is like I recognize all of these distinct invented and assembled parts, um, and and I I I thought that traced through in your own thinking, uh, and it was nice to see that. Um, okay, so a work like this, I don't know the artist, I don't know the movement, but just as a maker myself, when I look at this, what I imagine happened was, I don't know if that's a painting or if it's a collage, but it looks like a, a collage. Painting. It's a painting. It's a painting. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I were to make something like this, I would cut up different colored paper and I would move it around on a blank page. And as dumb of a process as that sounds, it's not unlike siting buildings on a site. And when I look at your plan, what it reminds me of is Egyptian sculpture. It's incredibly regulated, right? It's like, imagine a person just sitting like this at a right angle, perfectly straight. And in a way it almost loses the, the industrial rural quality by its rigidness and what i would love to see happen is for you to print this plan out and cut out all of your workshops and then print a fresh plan and put them down and wiggle them around and i think that would give you actually it wouldn't compromise the the um goal of being understated but it would give you outdoor spaces that would be surprising because currently, if I arrive and I go to one courtyard, absent furniture and stuff, I've seen all of them. But if the buildings had a different arrangement around the site, if they could relate to each other in a diverse variety of ways, then you would arrive at a diverse variety of exterior spaces and it would add richness. And uh, also in line with Judy's comment, that would go the same with the with the studios themselves. I think at this point you've you've uh, hatched the idea of a of a generic studio, and your next step would be to to dial in what each studio wants to be for its craft, both in size and shape and material and all of that. That would be a next step. But before that, even I think it would be loosening up the site plan, and. One other thing that I see that actually is a really fascinating part of your project is this double height or this double level hallway that connects everything. And I would think of like talk about it when you 
put this project in your portfolio, make a special, uh, make a big deal of that hallway. Because something that is true of a campus like this is that it's, it's not easy for commuter students to make friends because they don't live on campus. It's like they show up, they go to class, and then they go home. So a big question for each of these projects is where is the social space? Where is the space where you get a sense of the whole and not just the 10 students that are in your class? And the answer in your project, in my mind, is that hallway. And honestly, like my first impression was it seems tight, it seems small, but maybe that's exactly right because then you bump into each other. And it reminds me of a high school hallway actually, but without lockers. And I could see an entire story developing around this very special space where you walk from one end of the school to the other. In the process, you see every workshop and you also might see every student. And I think there's something, uh, something to that. Taking this, exactly uh, what you've done and interpreting. This hallway was much bigger, actually. I, I would take responsibility for shrinking it down. Wasn't it thirty okay. feet wide? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's for it's like it's fine to be in a cramped space. It's intimate. <laughs> no, no, seven feet's probably too small. Uh, <laughs> Mariam, I, I, I misled you. I, I think we should have shot for fifteen or something. <laughs> but you yeah, there's a, there's you a big gap between seven and, and 30. <laughs> you could yeah. talk about it in a way where it's like this, everything is about this hallway. This is the place. This is the idea, you know? And then the last thing, sorry, one more thing that I forgot is that panoramic shot. The minute I saw that, I was like, can that just be the building and not a panoramic? And I, I get that that gets way out of the, out of the ballpark of complexity. But I think for everybody, like, can we go to the panoramic, Marianne? This was by Michael's insistence, just so yeah. everybody knows. <laughs> so what just blew my, what blows my mind about this is you're seeing, I think, into two, two studios, or it looks like you're looking into no, two studios one. that surround a round courtyard. Like, I could imagine U-shaped or donut-shaped. I think it's bending, that's bending the long building. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they're not that much more complicated. Like I wouldn't imagine like honestly you could do all of this with straight structure that's radial and a roof that's also made out of flat pieces. Um you're not double warping anything and it could also be faceted. Like moments like this or when your intuition kicks in in a project and you have to ask uh do I just run away now? You know and and I I well, this happened about four days ago, so. <laughs> <laughs> so good choice not running away and good choice showing it. Yeah. Donna, you could, you, could, you, could, you could say say what you just said about, wow, let's see if we can make this into a project. If I were to say that, Michael would put me in jail based on yeah. what, the, what, the, <laughs> what, what the brief is intending to do. Uh, yeah. Because when I looked at this, sometimes uh, unexpectedly, uh, out of the process, a drawing emerges that throws you completely off center and you say, oh, I got to start over. And it doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to be what you end up with. It's just that this might then feed back into what you were working on in a way that gets you to think about things you didn't, you didn't think about. Uh, not necessarily bending the building, but uh, some other things. Guys, uh, I want us to take a five minute break because we are scheduled to start again at three. And I don't know about you, but I need to step away for a minute. Can I say thank you to uh, the first session reviewers? Everyone is invited to stay on. Judy, Max, anyone? If you've got the, if you've got the sit <laughs> desire, please sit in. But um, we're going to start again at three. Hello, David. Good to see you. Thanks, Michael. Michael. Good to see you too. I would say hi, Max, as well. Hey, hey Max. Okay. Yeah. How are you, bud? Right. Michael, I'll see you, we'll see you when you get we'll see you on the flip side. Okay, three o'clock, guys. Yeah. Thank you, Marion. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. And who's up first? I am Michael. Okay, Lisa, go. Hi all. My name's Lisa. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. 
Can everyone see my screen? Yes. And my cursor? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so like I said, my name's Lisa. And as Michael just started explaining, um, our site is sort of at the intersection of Lamar and Airport Boulevard. Um, and this part of town is really interesting in a way because um, many of the buildings are low-lying buildings and industrial buildings, or I, I would say leftover buildings um, of, in the city of Austin. And um, all semester long, we've really been talking about craftsmanship um, in various lights. But I think oftentimes when we think about craftsmanship, we think about the products that are produced or the process of making these products. And oftentimes we're not considering where these products are being made, where the craftsmanship um, is happening and like what the leftover space, the leftover junk of these processes are. Um, and so this site was really interesting in that respect because um, I know Michael chose it and my studio likes it for the um, uh, the aesthetic of the um, industrial look and also sort of the character that um, comes from that. And like like seeing in these um, pictures I, I have below the site here, um, the first two pictures are uh, with Westbrook Metals right across from our site. Um, and then the, the second two are actually um, uh, like workshop buildings that are currently on our site um, for storage storage buildings. And um, yeah, I think the premise is really interesting considering what, what a workshop actually looks like and how to design a workshop versus um, just putting one up for uti utilitarian purposes. Um, and so on our site, um, right here, this, this building right here, uh, is the Reinhardt, Reinhardt building, um, as we've been calling it. And at one point it was um, a workshop, but actually before that it was um, an airport painter for um, Austin Airport. Um, so it does have a bit of um, a historical context um, with this part of town. Um, and I think most of us really thought it was interesting, like an interesting artifact on the site because um, this building could easily have been uh, just a cube <laughs> like many of the other industrial buildings around it, but this has a unique character with the um, bowed roof. And so um, I decided to draw a lot of inspiration from this building um, and developed it um, into my scheme. And I looked at it um, from more of a preservation standpoint um, in terms of keeping it on the site. Um, and so this, this posed an interesting problem because not only is our site extremely uniquely shaped, um, but now there's an existing building on the site that has to be resolved in some way. And I think what I, I struggled with the most and some of my classmates I'm sure will agree is um, how to deal with leftover space and how to utilize as much, as, as much space as possible on a site that is so unique. Um, and so I decided to sort of um, create a series of Reinhardt buildings um, that are formed along uh, this promenade through the site, um, where one side of the promenade ends in this um, garden for the students and professors, a private garden um, facing Lamar, and then the other end of the promenade ends in um, the school's signage, but also the Reinhardt building, um, which I have made um, into the gallery for the school. Um, and so I, I felt that um, having a series of buildings along a promenade um, left a lot of sort of interstitial space um, that is good for both lighting for the interiors of the buildings, um, but also for allowing like really flexible workspace, which we talked a lot about what these workshops could be, but um, I think it's really important to, to understand the flexibility that these spaces will require um, and knowing that 
as this being a school, oftentimes class sizes change um, or studios get shifted. Um, so I, I definitely looked at uh, this problem with flexibility in mind. And so um, here I have what I determined would be the workspaces like backloaded to in the buildings and then um, the interst interstitial space between them being work flex space. Um, and then the promenade um, through, through the buildings becoming more of a social space for the students. Um, Lisa, within... could, you, could you call out some of the dimensions, major dimensions as you go? Yes, so um, the Reinhardt building, which um, is this building right here, um, is about 80 by, see, I have it written here, um, is about 80 feet by 40, I believe, or 80 by 60. And so that, um, that proportion is also in these um, duplicated buildings. And then here, um, like I was saying before, um, there's like lounge spaces within the the studios and also this garden space becoming um, social space for students as well um, because they will be commuting and I'm sure there will need to be some sort of flexibility for um, in between course times and things like that. Um, and there, we were also tasked to have um, classrooms in the workshops, which also presented a unique problem because um, obviously these workshops are very busy, there's machinery in them, and determining where um, classrooms should be is unique because unless you want a specific room carved out within um, the workshop, um, I don't know, I, I, I looked at it from a flexibility standpoint um, where I wanted the classrooms to be able to um, sit along the promenade, but also be a part of the workshop and um, the separators between them, these cabinets here, um, could be moved de um, depending on what the workshop is requiring. Um, and then also in the Reinhardt building, I have um, offices and flex storage, but the majority of the Reinhardt building is devoted to gallery space. Or as Michael suggested a couple of studios ago, maybe it could be rented out depending on um, what the school uh, needs it to be at any given point in time. Um, and here's a here's a zoomed in portion of the plan to um, express my ideas about uh, what the studios would look like more specifically, um, where the lounge space and the classroom are up to the front, separated by. Um, these like these movable like cabinets that are pinup boards on one side and storage on the other. Um, and obviously it, it takes quite a great deal to move them, but they're not permanent. Um, letting the workshops grow and expand or um, even shrink as classes get smaller, depending on the scenario. Um, and then also storage in the back with um, a bathroom tucked tucked away by the garage door. Um, here is a section through the two buildings closest to Lamar near the garden. Um, I definitely uh, wanted to keep, you can see here that the, the roof structure is very similar um, to what you might expect um, on the interior of the Reinhardt building, but actually we couldn't see what the interior of the Reinhardt building looked like. Um, so I got to, reimagine what the structure would be for such a building like this. Um, and so here um, there are glue lambs that are resting on um, concrete concrete walls um, on, on the edges. And then um, I also wanted to keep the separation between um, the spaces uh, lower than the lower than the wall height so that um, no matter where you are in the space, the, the roof is a clear shot from front to back. Um, this is another section showing the interstitial spaces. Um, this also um, sort of exaggerates the lowness of these buildings that I was talking about earlier. Um, all of these buildings are about 18 to 20 feet high. Um, so they are very low and um, 
I think that is expresses the nature of um, this part of Austin. Most of the buildings are much lower like this. Um, here is a rendering of the promenade through the school. And um, mainly what I thought would be like social flex space or um, the classrooms are behind these garage doors here and they can open out onto the space and um, have outdoor classes some days or and this is the um, interior shot of one of the studios looking from the promenade to the back of house where the garage door is for deliveries. Um, and then in the foreground is the classroom space where there's um, pinups. Um, and I think this shot really expresses how I viewed the space, um, sort of taking an empty shell of a building um, and creating separate spaces, but also being aware that there needs to be a certain amount of flexibility um, in such program. And then here are some elevations, some more technical elevations. And that's it. All right, Lisa, thank you. Yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe for a change, guys, uh, why don't we start with the character of the buildings and then maybe move back out to questions of layout and urban urban context. The whole, the previous session, we went the other way. And I think we spent a lot of time on site plan. Actually, Lisa, could you tell us just a little bit about your background? Um, I have a bachelor's of science in architecture from the Ohio State University. And is this your first or second semester? It's my second semester. Got it. Um, so you've got to love rendering programs for putting wood grain rendering running the short direction. That <laughs> is, uh, I, I realize it's it's difficult to make it run the long way. But um, so anyway. Great. Yeah. Especially when the when the set when the uh, the beam is curved. So what are what are the materials? The the roof is glue lamb beams with uh, wooden the, joists. The is, yes, the roof is um, wooden glue lamb beams that are um, resting on like a double thick concrete wall. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, yes, the texture of the concrete it's it's just um, like textured concrete with formwork is how I chose to represent it. Um, the, Rainheart, the Rainheart building is painted white brick for contrast. Oh, it's clad in metal. Is it? The Rainheart building? Yeah, I think, isn't it? No, it's... Um, okay. It's painted brick. See, uh, the Rainheart building is the rightmost picture here. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. The metal building is a oh, storage. The, sh the, the storage building, right? Mm -hmm. Because your board form concrete, which has wood, I guess, looks like it's rendered as if it's brick, actually. And I mm -hmm. wonder, since it looks like brick. masonry or pottery, at least, and glass and wood, etc., in this thing, whether you couldn't, I'm stuck on the materialities of what you do here. It looks okay. like it would be a, a brick or masonry kind of uh, wall. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, upon which these glue um, pieces work. Um, I suppose it could be board form concrete, and then you use the boards itself stain to make the partition cabinets between your general workspace, etc. So there's a whole materiality that could be used in constructing it, and then used again if it's uh, stained concrete wood, etc. Through there, or just making it appear to be brick. Mm -hmm. Lisa, why are those guys there? Mm. Why is what? Why are those little struts I just those guys right there? Why are they there? Um just supporting just supporting the overhang. It's about 13 feet long. One wonders if it wouldn't be farther out towards the end. If they needed support, they might need more support than that. So mm. I just okay. wondered why they I just wonder why they're there all because like elsewhere in the building, it, it, the the kind of specifics of that kind.
kind of efficiency aren't necessarily articulated. So I just, I mean, I'm trying to get a handle on. Okay. I'm trying to get a, I'm trying to get a handle on the on on. So Michael asked us to start with character, and I'm trying to get a grip on where the character arises from. And so, given that you began with the kind of in many ways a kind of a, a nostalgic idea, you know, that there was a this building that was really beautiful, it was this kind of hangar-like building, and and I I, I just it, what could be wrong with it? It's already perfect. And uh, and so I thought I, you'd go about just remaking it without ever having kind of talked about why that was a good place to have, you know, a good place to be for craft or a good place for, it, it was just really just, it was the kind of memory of this kind of building of a certain kind. And then in many ways, a lot of these kinds of gestures are memory gestures. There's the gesture of these, what would have been probably are over in the other building, kind of long leaf pine, probably bowstring trusses. I mean, they probably have a tension element because that would then make that really quite efficient, right? Right now, the blue lamb has to handle the stress of the moment that you build up in the section modulus through the sheer planes of it. So it's a fatter glue lamb than it could be. And, and then the, the brickwork, it's a concrete wall, but it's a double concrete wall. It's, so it's really about kind of establishing a kind of a, 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 an image of a certain thing that you have in mind. It's very, very nice, very nostalgic in my mind. And so then I, I have to tell you, I'm of two minds about that. Since Michael opened the question about, about, about that, uh, that thing. I mean, on the one hand, I mean, I think, on the one hand, I think it's, there are things about that are handsome. And on the other hand, it strikes me that it's, it's all these things about Austin I don't like. You know, I'd like, like, like if, since you began with sight, like for me, for me, it's all artisanal. You know what I'm saying? Or, or the, or the <laughs> image, the image, the image of artisanal. I, the, Michael, I'll just throw, throw, throw this in there just to yeah, see, where the discussion, yeah. see where the discussion goes. You know, that, 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 that's yeah. the part that I, I, so then that's why I was asking about the struts on the outside because the struts, you go, well, if you're a structure about efficiency, there's so many things here in this drawing where you could, where you could add elements that would do more or less the same thing. And so that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's where I was coming from. Like where, 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 where is this kind of coming from in your mind, Lisa? I don't mind if it's coming from nostalgia, but that, that's where it seems to be coming from powerfully for me. In, in terms of recreating the Reinhardt building or the in structure? Terms quality, in terms of the quality of the character of your architecture. Well, I think um, I, I, mean, the, I I intended on having sort of a, like a low line building that, or a series of buildings rather that were sort of inward, inward facing. Um, and I guess I drove, I guess that was driven from um, sort of the nature of the surrounding buildings. But in terms of what structure I chose to use, um, because the buildings are lower, I didn't, I wanted there to be, um, a heavy roof structure, but not necessarily something that um, overly clouded the form because it is a very simple form. Um, and the simplicity, I think, is what I was really drawn to about the Reinhardt building. Um, and just, I guess, sort of re envisioning what the inside of the Reinhardt building may be because we don't know what it, what it is. Um, I guess that's, I looked at different um, ways to create um, this like, rounded roof structure. Um, and I just felt that this, this way was um, the cleanest and clearest true to form, I guess. I think that's, uh, David brings up um, a, a really good uh, point. Um, for me, it has to do with the relationship of structure and freedom, tradition is structure, um, creativity is uh, freedom. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, to his point, how do you do something that's old and new simultaneously? Yeah. Um, uh, my question to you is, you've got the same gene pool as your grandparents. Do you dress like your grandparents? Do you listen to the same music? Do you dance like your grandparents? Probably not, right? So a part of you uh, is the memory of your, your family. Um, maybe your traditions might be to some extent the traditions that you've inherited, but you're probably reinventing those as well. How, what's the architectural equivalent of that in the architecture? Is there a way of making, which, which if, even if you're doing something from scratch, the concrete, 
uh, without thinking of it, whether it's old or new, it's a heavy material. Uh, what I can see in your roof, especially with the wood, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of lightness emerging. Mm -hmm. How those two meet, I think, is really critical. You can either do it as an insertion or you're articulating a seam as uh, uh, basically a transition between uh, the top and the bottom, um, let's say. Um, so I think it's a really interesting, uh, um, is it possible to make something that is familiar to your body and strange to your eyes? You know, that, that, that would be, I think- That's uh, a great thing to say. I don't often say things that Michael says is great, so I'm going to stay quiet for a moment. <laughs> You're just going to let that sink in. <laughs> I'm going to no, I'm going to relish that for a second. I'm going to relish that. <laughs> I, heard, I heard it. I think this is videotaped. I think you should have that embroidered on it. <laughs> I'm going to put it on a sweater. Uh, have, someone in the, have someone in the shop. I think, listen, I think, you, I, think both, I think both of you guys are tackling what's so intriguing to me anyway about this building is it's so very, very plain. Mm -hmm. It's so plain. Wait, the, the, the it's kind of like a high... Yeah, no, this one. It's kind of like a middle it's school a or a high school or something. Mm -hmm. um, it's so, like, direct and, like, from a catalog. And even the roof is, like, you, you couldn't make this roof out of dumber pieces. Like, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think we're all, like, hungry for something clever Michael, about you you, you could. Well, I mean, to, to, to be fair, I, I, I think, I think, I, you know, I think that at least you have to be harder on yourself because I mean, I, I really think that, that relative to back to Michael's question about your grandparents, this is the, the part about like, this is the Brooklyn part where it's like, this is the flannel and the corn cob part pipe part, the large wheeled bicycle part of Brooklyn that that's related to your grandparents, right? Like the, the part that there's a kind of image that, that you want to project about it. But in truth, with regard to that other building, this is a different building, right? This is a building which is acting like in many ways. I mean, on the one hand, the structure and the structural system can be made much more ruthless. It's, it's fraught with all kinds of inherent, redundant, inherent actually problems. So for example, in that the way that those particular roof systems work in the building that you're copying, you have to have a continuous membrane across the top. That's also usually made with diagonal mm -hmm. one by sixes or one by fours in order to get the whole thing, the whole diaphragm to, Resist, and that allows the building to have a very, very thin profile of roof. But here you've got this kind of massive, demented roof, which is, arises as the, the fact that you actually have to do that with joists. Whereas in those old buildings, they don't do it with joists. The, the decking is actually three quarters. Sometimes you find it seven eighths. Sometimes you find it one inch, and that's the roof. The roof is actually one inch thick, right? It's got. It doesn't have to have this thickness because it's already going down to an inherent absolute bare minimum right and so then the question of the the way that, you know to, to peter's question about where do you where do you take this strut and where do you catch this live load you know uh, in order to to minimize this span you know and, and then the same thing on the inside like you know do you tie across here to reduce the thickness of these blue lambs which would which would arguably you know like the the, the particular shape of all of this the, the 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 amount of steel that's required in that header you know whether or not that uh, could be a more efficiently be done in another way i mean i, I think that, that that there's there's one way that that building the original building achieves its its particular poetry which is by 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 absolute reduction and cheapness right like austin is a famously cheap town this is a cheap mm -hmm. construction cheap. but the other one is by ruthlessness and i want to say the other thing about your building i'm, I'm actually less convinced of are these little humanizing impulses to, you know the, the humanizing impulse to mark the entrance the humanizing like if you look at the elevations you'll see this window and the next window and the next window they jump right like this 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 is the kind of thing right here like this thing right here like this kind of like these decisions are ones that like you make lightly but in the original building are actually just they're made ruthlessly with absolute ruthless a humanistic you know tendencies and I, so for me the, the kind of the, the desire that you're after slips into not thinking about how that thing arose, but, but literally what it appears like when in fact the original thing didn't care what it appeared like. It just cared how it served, how it, how it, how it provided and how it served. So I think this is the kind of issue that we let slip in our school a little too easily. And I, I think it's a crucial issue for you to, 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 to tackle. Mm -hmm. Sorry. The original 
building that's referred to the Reinhardt is of two systems. It seems to be masonry and its roof, okay, which is opaque, mm -hmm. I believe. This one is translucent, so you don't have that kind of shearing that goes across. But my point being very simply that between what you call your concrete or your heaviness or your brick and you the wood thing, there needs to be the craftsperson that invents, invents the third thing to articulate between the two. And I would call that a steel beam that would run in this kind of session, uh, section through here. And when you come across here, you don't have that heavy material, but you have a steel beam and let's in light because that's a light and not necessarily an opaque wall over there. So I just wonder, the best craftsman is not the one that says, I'm just a uh, pottery person or a glass person or metal or what, but actually uses them all. I would think that that would be a kind of modern uh, condition, if I could say, of simultaneity of fragmentation rather than the necessary simplicity of just a yeah. roof idea and a yeah. wall idea. So something breaks through, the word ruthless is good, but I would call that a steel beam that runs through here, picks up that load of the wood, runs so we had some gigantic column, mm -hmm. if not a tree-like kind of uh, structure over here. It might actually find itself with the uh, uh, bowstring crushes, et cetera, that go across it. I love the project because it se seems so articulated, separate glass, wood, et cetera, but the magic would come from where you can combine them all together in a mm -hmm. certain way. Uh, a collage of them. Well, maybe we should talk about the the site planning with the overall idea of the buildings spatially. Can I add one more thing about the building itself real quick? Yeah, please. Um, okay. What I see happening is you've uh, separated and divorced all the elements from each other by giving them different materiality. One approach mm -hmm. to this could have been a white box with an arch all made out of the same thing. But you've said that the walls are heavy they're made of brick or concrete. The roof is light, it's an arch, it's made of wood, and it has a metal top. So what I would want, what I'm wanting to see is for you to push that further and to say, well, what does a heavy wall wanna be? Like these sorts of intersection um, are actually mashing together things rather than pulling them apart. And the example that jumps in my mind is that famous slit window at the Kimball Art Museum where you have a wall that's vertical and then it stops. And then you have a slit of glass and then you have the vault. And mm -hmm. Ron is very deliberate about saying, I'm not gonna ask the wall to do what the roof is doing. And they're not even gonna touch each other. That's how different they are. And I think there's one level of that that would make this structure uh, sing a little bit more. Even mm -hmm. just the light coming in between the wall and the structure and illuminating the structure at the top. Like I could see there being a slit all the way here, right? And then on the other side windows between the beams. And the last mm -hmm. thing is I see these electric lights in here. Um, and to me, it's taking this kind of glorious cathedral space. And then I just imagine like the of fluorescent <laughs> lights, you know? Like, yeah. This thing be lit by the sun. Uh, shouldn't light hitting structure, hitting work surface be your story? Um, to, to reinforce what Michael said, like this is a very simple boiled down like soup, um, like broth, you know, it's nutritious, it gets the job done, there's nothing extra. If that's the case, you have to, you have to know it so well that it becomes poetic and beautiful mm -hmm. and demands to exist. If it's just like, yeah, I saw an image and I made it and it's nice. Like it's not, you're not gonna wanna talk about it like that. So I think you could take what exists, dial it up a little bit more and then think really uh, poetically and philosophically about what these elements mean. And the last thing I wanted to throw out there is just to reinforce, and this will transition into the site conversation. Mm -hmm. So the Reinhardt building is precious. What about the others? We just like murdered all of its children. There are other buildings that have like similar qualities, but they're just different, but they don't have a round top. Um, on, our, on our site? On the site, yeah, but they all just got like decimated. The storage buildings? <laughs> yeah, or you uh, know. There's a little storage building and there's that the print building. building in the front with that strange Sullivan-esque front uh, door. Yeah, I'm afraid those got the ax on everyone's project. <laughs> I understand, I understand, but yeah. the, <laughs> the thing about school projects and even real world projects is like nothing is given. Like you right. got 
prove why the Reinhardt building deserves to exist and the others deserve to die. Because mm -hmm. deep down, a building's a building, right? And they all have qualities, they all have attributes. And you used your values to murder some and let others actually drive your entire project. So yeah. why is the Reinhardt building the dictator of the future and the others all got killed? <laughs> wow, that's pretty hard. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's, no. that's, that's quite a metaphor. Hard, hard word, man. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, actually, I think when I first saw it, because I did not know it, the first few I had seen before three that uh, they all are spatially very different. And why not to vote off the foundations of each, if not four different sensibilities? I'm hung up that metal is not glass, is not wood, it's not uh, pottery, let's say, over there. So I, I, I think an architect should find value in all that is on hand and not necessarily keep one and just replicate it, as opposed to building off yeah. the vitality of what to say. As, as the coach here, yeah. I feel like this is quite unlike the Reinhardt building, except in out of form. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and I find it very intriguing. But listen, guys, we've got like three minutes left to talk sure. about the site and whether go back to the site, Lisa, and let's talk about whether sh she's done a lot with a little or a little with a little. <laughs> Okay, yeah. move on. <laughs> I just, I just So I, I, I made a rookie mistake there. I was talking with the mute button. Um, the, uh, you think we'd be all pros at this by now? Yeah. Um, the uh, site planning. I, mean, I didn't get to sound off on the character of the building. Maybe I'll try and find a way to squeeze that in. But like, I think the uh, it's a Dinesh's uh, indictment of the project a moment ago being kind of felonious at some level i don't know i mean i think it's okay to just decide the fate of buildings in a kind of sense that like there's there's a degree of spiritual resonance present in this project for for you to take the position that that uh, charming uh, former hanger is to be the dominating kind of like voice on the site and then replicating it i think there's something quite um uh authentic and endearing about that that strategy um the uh uh for it to replicate itself on the site in a way that that um, refuses to acknowledge the odd shape of the site, I think, uh, is an interesting move. I think it's totally consistent with the notion that somehow that that uh, that hangar building is the proper precedent for the rest of the program. And I believe it is, just for the record. I mean, I, I don't mean to speak so kind of indifferently as if I don't subscribe to what's going on in this project. I think there's a lot to like about it. Um, I um, the thing I think is is a little distasteful is the uh, the the wall that attempts to make a kind of privacy court out of the uh out of the long green large green area there on i guess that's the east side side or sorry the west side of the site uh, mm -hmm. so north is up uh you know this part of town is kind of scrubby it's kind of don't have a lot of definition um and it's rambunctiousness i don't think is something that that um, is going to be ameliorated by a rather sculptural um probably a very beautiful wall but just a little bit out of place i think the kind of punk rock quality of the, uh, the 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 Reinhardt and then the it's it's slightly slightly um, um, more um, uh, polite cousins there on the site make a statement in and of itself it, the, for it to just kind of dissipate into a green area at the end and embrace the fact that the road around there is kind of obnoxious I think is appropriate uh, oddly enough uh, now that sounds like maybe I'm being a bit insensitive you know maybe we should try and make a nicer park out of it but my point is that like I just I I just see that coming off as rather kind of desperately insincere um, without some really serious radical change and the strength of what you've got already there suggests that parks should just kind of be left maybe unmolested and let the uh, buildings yeah, be the, they, the primary they, statement yeah they do seem to be a different hand or a different thought yeah mm -hmm. i mean my, my, i think you can't tell much about the site response here in this particular drawing i think the plan site plans and healthy i think you need a site axonometric or a site just a just a massing i mean because we're really talking about things that are idiosyncratic i mean and the relationship of one to the other. I mean, unless the idea here really is that that city is gone and we're replacing it with a different city. I think, I think what you, I think the thing, the other thing in this plan that, that you wonder a little bit about, just focusing on what works and what doesn't, is the spaces between the buildings seem like a, they're set primarily by the dimension that you're left over. And they could be, they're obviously they could be certainly part of the workshops. Those spaces are always used in. in the kind of manufacturing process. And, and you think in particular these yards you know 
they, they, they seem, they're, they're a tough dimension, right? They're roughly the same as that dimension. And it's not quite clear if they're big enough or wide enough or who, you know, who claims them, you know, mm -hmm. I, I would have probably argued that that, that parking could go there and that then this front, which is already dealing with enough parking as it is, could somehow utilize this space as an extension of that one. And then just, I mean, I hate to bring it up. You got to ADA this. You got to, you got to, you can't not do so. And just, it's not fair. It's actually a language issue, you know, to, to me that, that, that you're dealing with, that you deal with ramps and you deal with that ramp there. And so, I mean, I think there's, I, 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 what I like about the, I actually like the fact that the, the site, the, the model doesn't react or respond to these things, but whether it works or not, it's hard to know. You know, it's hard to know whether it works urbanistically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think your suggestion about not giving parking the end, the end condition there uh, uh, makes a lot of sense. Also, it's, somehow it seems to me like, uh, you know, Mariam, we both sort of thought of the in-between space as a working space. Um, but now I'm thinking, you know, who's going to drag their work past the storage, past the classroom? You know what I mean? I think like just putting that door right there. there. Yeah, we've made it a more social thing. That center court, more like a school, a school hallway or a shopping center or something. You mean the the promenade that goes through the site? Yeah, or the... yeah. We we'd always thought of it as a working space, but when I see the perspective now, I'm going, no one's going to put their work out there. No one's going to hammer and cut and saw out there. It's yeah, too I nice. Think... I mean, the the promenade space is definitely social, and that was intentional. Yeah, but the, right. the other space in between the studios yeah. was meant for for like excess workspace. Yeah, but I think David's point that like the the top right could have opened strongly to the side where the mm -hmm. cars are, not a not is a good idea. Listen, I've got to close this down, guys. We've got to go on. Lisa, thank you very, very much. It was a great presentation. Thanks, and uh, raised some really good issues. There is thank a, you, Lisa. There There's is also, there's a, gen, there's a generousness about the site plan. There, no, yeah. no, it is generous towards the pedestrians. There, nothing about it is cramped or, or, yeah. or too tight. Said, and so I, I, I definitely appreciate that there's enough space and room and there, there is a expansive generosity about yeah, I get the, feeling the overall process. feeling of it that I, that I appreciate. I also get the feeling this probably is the most likely to be built of anyone's in the studio. Because hmm. I think it's very straightforward. I think it would appeal to people who want to get this thing done. Okay, who's who's after Lisa? Oh, that would be me. All right, Duncan. All right. Um, let me pull this up. Okay. Um, can anybody? Can everybody see this? All right. We're good. Yes. Okay. I might go to full screen. So I think, uh, see, I'm, I'm blanking on names, but I heard, uh, oh, Michael, you said something about familiar to body, but strange to the eyes. Um, these were kind of the precedents I was looking at when I started this project. An excellent way to start a presentation is by uh... Very the, uh, reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry, Michael, that's going to be hung around your neck now. I, I think too. You said it was great. It is. It is. <laughs> Go done. Sorry for the interruptions there. That's okay. You know, um, uh, so I think that when uh, that, that, that there's something strange about these buildings to the modern eye, um, you know, they're all using the timbral vault in their structure and um, I think they're interesting also because when everything has to be touched, each moment really becomes an opportunity to bring diversity to the building. Mm, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, I fought with Michael and myself a lot on this kind of aesthetic. And, and also, it's my first time semester really working on a computer. So um, I had to kind of like abandon some of this uh, thinking. 
Um, and so I'm gonna kind of present, I guess, the counter argument to that. Um, so simple volumes of subdued color are imbued by the world with remarkable complexity. Um, subtle changes in the hue of various muds are, subject to, are the subject of great paintings, right? Add three-dimensional form to that mud, place it into context, and the play of light and shadow reveals the remarkable range of reflected colors that come from its surroundings. Um, now you have to prepare that mud to knock around in the world, right? Uh, the construction of a simple box can be extraordinarily difficult when one considers the wear and tear of the everyday and designs for resilience. Um, this resilience is ultimately, I think, the, the realm of craft, that which differentiates identical forms from one another. Um, perhaps it is enough then to let buildings be simply what they are and need to be and therefore allow room for craft to make its contribution, um, to place them carefully in relationship to one another, that they might do what is required of them and not hinder us, perhaps even let them bask in the light and revel in their skin and one another. So here's our site um, with the building placed on it. Um, you can see in the bottom left corner the uh, view uh, if you are headed north on Lamar and glancing off to your right, how the building would present. Um, this kind of moment, I think was a, an interesting one that um, how does the building relate to the rest, to its, to its moment of access. And I think here that there's kind of a duality to the building where it has, both has its back to Lamar, but it has this shed kind of gesturing over the top of it. Um, Towards the, towards the viewer. Um, so as you can see, it's kind of a flat drab site plan. This I would call the mud. Um, it's uh, simple sheds, right? Overlapping a kind of worm-like barrel vault. Um, it retains the old Reinhardt building and in some ways dissects the form, right? It takes, uh, it's kind of proportion and turns it into a shed. And then it's uh, kind of uh, arc, arcing uh, roof and brings that into the uh, surrounding masonry building that kind of forms the perimeter of the site. Um, overall, it's a 240 foot diameter um, and it leaves a 120 foot diameter courtyard in its center. So here you can see that um, here we're adding some tint to the mud and expressing a little bit these simple forms um, and showing some light and shadow playing on them. Um, so here's a section or rather a plan of the building that shows them the interiors. Um, mostly unlit, um, at, at least in the sheds. These are, this would be completely natural lighting at this time of day. Um, there is some fluorescent task lighting around the edges of the barrel. And um, you'll see later some of how the ceiling in there is lit. Um, I had a little trouble getting good line work out of Rhino, so I apologize. Um, but here you can see um, the loading dock uh, which is a shaded, also a large shaded work area um, that um, you know might serve as an outdoor workspace or final assembly area or storage for materials before they are um, sucked up by the sheds here and machined in their larger kind of volumes. Um, so here's the section through uh, that courtyard. Um, you can see the um, the loading dock on the right, and you can see how that form is repeated and raised a little bit to create um, the main shed building, which would house your larger machines, and how that shed sort of overlaps um, this barrel vault, um, where kind of the um, you know smaller craft activities might happen. Um, you can see here the divider. Uh, with sliding doors that would um, kind of 
allow spaces to be closed off from one another, but also open to each other. So here's that shed then a kind of perspective of that um, showing kind of how natural light is brought in by the overlapping of the, the barrel and how the barrel reflects light back up into the ceiling. And it shows a little bit the um, kind of views through space um, from uh, outside. So this is the opposite section of the one we saw before, showing the relationship of the kind of building complex or what have you to the Reinhardt building, which is preserved. Um, I didn't do a kind of planning diagram, but of course this was uh, intended to be kind of administrative functions, um, potentially clean classrooms, um, you know, secondary kind of functions um, to the primary. Uh, wasn't, wasn't your exhibition activities. in there too? Yes, and that yeah. exhibition would also be there. So here's a shot kind of of the morning um, where a truck has pulled up to the loading dock and a couple of guys are waiting to um, kind of step to, but some paperwork and inventory is being filled out. It's a moment of rest as activity kind of winds up um, to people out at the end of the dock firing up their bandsaw mill and another one in the foreground um, setting up his his uh, his mill to do some work. Um, here's an interior shot of the classroom, which is um, kind of an interstitial space between the various workshop spaces. Um, and here you can just kind of see the length of view across and uh, through and also the lighting of the vault. So using artificial light, bouncing it off of that to kind of light the space, tall windows to bring in natural light. And so here is kind of, uh, we've talked a bit about isovists, uh, Michael's concept of the isovists and these long perspectives. And so this is kind of a slice through the barrel that shows kind of the longest view that you would get as you are peering kind of around its curve. And um, so if you are standing here on the left, you could see all the way here to this furthest point on the right. Amazing drawing. Uh, yeah, sorry, there's like some weird plane <laughs> that dropped in here and here, but you know, you can kind of see some of these moments. Anyway, um, and here's kind of my, my last slide um, showing at the end of the day as work winds down um, uh, at this drive between the Reinhardt building and this addition. Um, and yeah, so just kind of drawing you back into the space with the light and just getting to see how people might interact out there. So. Thank you, Duncan. Can you talk about materials a little bit? Uh... For instance, this oh, yeah. curved curve roof is uh, yeah. What, so steel? I had I had conceived of that actually as a timber vault. Um, so going back to kind of the okay. earlier precedents, but taking a simpler view of it and kind of distilling it down to its basics and um, referencing, I think the the kind of craft of the past and maybe also you know showing it had its decline in the present. <laughs> um, I used to be a, a craftsman, so I think I'm a little bit, uh, I, I don't know, maybe pessimistic about the state of craft these days. But it was a brick, it was a brick vault, wasn't it? Didn't but yes, it's a, it's a timbral, timbral tile vault. So uh, I think they were last built by Guastavino in the United States in the 50s. Um, he built the Retunder, one of the versions of the Retunder loop at the University of Virginia. Besides all his Barcelona work. Uh, as the one that's come in halfway through and from afar, I have to say, Duncan, your description of it architecturally is absolutely stunning, ambitious in terms of mud upon mud upon mud. 
reminds me that uh, some people think Adam was made out of mud as well. But I think there can be <laughs> extraordinarily complex things that come from the simplest, as simplest conditions that we sometimes call dirt. So I'm, I'm taken with the scheme both on the site level because the what the other schemes were good in discrete pieces, you as an architect have actually established a larger whole than just metal and wood and pottery, et cetera. So then that's that larger place where the sun moves around, or I believe the sun moves around, or whatever, during the day to there. And it's a, it's a common place where you bear witness to all the things that are happening in the very discrete shed. So that's a big addition at the scale of the site and the scale of the social uh, unity beyond the discreteness of the parts which the other schemes have had through there. And just the <laughs> arrival shed, okay, articulated differently than uh, the other sheds in the Rhinehoff building staying where it is. At least you don't have to massacre the site, right? Or you erase right. it completely. You work off of one, it serves a function over there and you particularize, the only thing I'd probably say is slightly that the light, well, by the directions it would be different, but maybe the materials of a glass shop would be different than a pottery shop or pottery had to have lots of drains in the floor and hose down the place six times a day and glass that might be panelizations of things that slip, but I don't know. But the uh, it is highly articulate. And I know Michael is setting up and praising the system, systematic discrete parts of the others, but I appreciate the synthetic larger whole that comes beyond this, the immediate programmatic pieces. So I think it's, it's uh, extraordinarily rich, <laughs> which is a term spatially rich and materially uh, rich and probably by the variety of light that would come during the day. The one thing I'd probably say in all these is I'd love to see some people work here at night and what this place is for people who choose to do a charrette there and burning the midnight oil in a certain kind of way and what the quality of that natural space would be. But you can do that for your thesis. But it's a great way to begin caring about this place. Yeah, Duncan, and I think you should, do this build, you should do this building over and over every semester until you graduate. <laughs> okay. I, I do feel like this building is a continuation of my last semester when I was also working with a circular plan. And oh, they're yeah. driving me crazy. <laughs> I just am like, I'm so done with circles. But. Duncan, have you ever listened to uh, the Goldberg variations? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. yeah that, I think that there, there's a, a contemporary composer named, I'm, I probably don't pronounce it right, it's Mampu, M-O-N-P-O-U. He plays, basically he composes one piece and he plays it over and over and over again, 21 times. And each time he does it, it basically is transitioning into the next until finally the last piece, the last time he plays it sounds very different than the first, except for uh, sort of the, 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 the fundamental structure of it, which is pretty amazing. So Michael's uh, idea uh, is really a pretty good one. I would I'd like to say that um, uh, maybe there's a benefit to you not being good on Rhino yet. Uh, <laughs> this, this, the project, uh, the degree of finish of this for me is more like storyboards than a totally finished project. But it's storyboards yeah. with a very, uh, uh, I think uh, as it's been mentioned, a, a pretty uh, pr a profound narrative. And I think a very strong one that manifests itself spatially, I think in a very sophisticated way. You, you know, and, and architecturally, I think as well, the strategy of these simple sheds, uh, albeit I'd make them a little taller, uh, the, the simple sheds uh, with this connecting um, uh, 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 spine. The spine is too wide for a hallway and too narrow for a room. What makes that a really wonderful uh, space is that potentially it can institutionalize cooperation. In a space like that, that a space like that, it, all the work that's done in the studios can only be presented in a space like that, which means that it becomes an immense swipe file so that Everybody is basically feeding everybody else. The, the, the theory of economy is open source in a place like this, which I think is really, really wonderful instead of proprietary. I think that there is very little true invention in a world of lawyers that will sue you for everything they think <laughs> is basically uh, copying everybody else. And we, we, we've convinced ourselves that we've lived for the last 20 years in great innovation. I don't think so. I don't think so. Variations on a theme. Uh, you basically have to have open source and non-proprietary. Ben Franklin never patented anything. Why? Because he saw patenting as a way of dampening the evolution of an America. And I think that's pretty extraordinary. But anyways, that's space. That's a whole other thing. 
that space, I think, is uh, where people would begin to cooperate with each other. And then whatever the standard was that was on the wall or what was being talked about is what they would compete against. So they're competing against the standard rather than each other. And that's when um, a society begins to hum. That's when you get into fifth gear. So I think, it, uh, plus I think architecturally, uh, the uniformity of that piece. And then uh, as, as uh, was mentioned in, in, in previous project, um, uh, I think it was uh, Peter mentioned it, materiality shifting from, from place to place, depending upon what's being done. Almost as if the structural frame was always there and then the infill occurred over time. So maybe mm -hmm. that's where you start to get the messiness that you would have in an industrial project. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's my, yeah, I, I, my first Duncan, thought. let's would say very, very quickly, your struggles with Rhino, and I would agree with uh, Rota. Um, there's a peculiar sort of sketch quality that you've like pushed Rhino to giving you. Uh, it, doesn't, it does not approach photorealism. Part of me is thinking, oh man, this place would actually light up nicer than this. But there's a kind of a illustrator or a cartoon, or uh, what did you say, storyboard, Michael? Quality yeah, to this. Storyboard, yeah. That um, has its own kind of kick, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Sorry, guys. I, uh, other reviewers, please. One question I had um, I love the beginning where you talked about diversity. And I think, uh, actually, for me, this is something that comes up at work a lot, which is the difference between unity and uniformity and unity and diversity. Okay. And for building projects, every building project is, uh, is an exam is an opportunity to show people a way of life by the interaction of the parts. And that's something that Louis Kahn wrote about. That's something that Michael writes about. And to me, the, the big ambition is how do we show a way of life of unity and diversity, where people can be different, where parts can be different, uh, but still somehow be together. And I see this uh, donut as the, one of the unifiers of the project. Literally, it, it strings them together like keys on a chain. Um, something that I think is really special, and, and I, I noticed it immediately, was actually the section where you have this bun uh, of the round part and then the shed that actually goes over it. It's like a duck, mother duck with a baby duck under it. <laughs> like, yeah. The interaction is nice and I could imagine the light coming through there and actually seeing this, um, you know, this glow. And to me, one of the, okay, so I think these are, these are some things I see. So, some questions I have is you're a craftsman. I'm a craftsman too. I hate making the same thing twice. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, yep. If I had made a physical model of this thing, every one of those shed roofs yeah. would have been different. Every one of those rooms would have been different, but they would have had my hand in all of them and they would have been unified. And Rhino or not, what you are suffering from at the moment is called copy and paste disease. <laughs> Because you made a truss or two and then you copy and pasted them or you made a shed and then you copied and pasted it and that's legible even the donut thing if you tried to make that donut thing out of wood it would take on kind of a squirmy life that would surprise you and would bring depth and richness to the project um so that's one that's one set of ideas the other set is what Nash, can I ask you a question? Would you, would you, you would do a physical model. Absolutely. You would get basically the, the certain the scheme to a point, and then you'd basically build a physical model, and then perhaps even an iteration, but then maybe take it back into the computer and then back out again. Sure. I mean, the second I had the key ring idea, I would say, okay, what are these little nuggets? And I would like grab things like this that I don't know what they are, and I would put them on the key and, you know, have 15 different. Uh, articulations of that such that you're facilitating an evolutionary process versus here it is boom here's my fans like I see the fans every, like I see the mess of an industrial site but I question the overall it's like yeah you've articulated the fingers well but is it a good hand I don't know it has fingernails does it work I don't know um, but anyhow, that's one set of stuff 
another thing is I encounter this at work. Uh, when you're modeling in 3D, it's too much complexity such that it's hard to dial in really precise, beautiful moments. So again, that section of the barn and the roof, I don't yeah. know if you drew and studied a 2D section of that by hand or in Rhino or wherever you're comfortable, wherever you have uh, dexterity, to study that in 2D would let you get the vault exactly right and get the shed exactly right. But you worked, I'm guessing, in 3D the whole time, so you didn't have control. And well, Dinesh, actually, the uh, the top of the barrel is is based on a circumscribed circle around a square. So we looked into classical geometry um, early on in the semester, and so the proportions here are based on root two and square and circles. Um, diagram, man, like that should yeah. be a cover page. Like, okay, well, yeah. I know those same drawings. I want to see them. I know. I was like <laughs> thinking about that right before I came up here to do this. Like, oh, yeah, I, I think Dinesh that. is making the very important point that two-dimensional drawings, as old-fashioned as they are, give mm -hmm. you a, give you a certain a look and a certain degree of control over what will be. Yeah. But what he's also talking about is is what you uh, use the word relational. That you begin yeah. to see uh, relationships that you can't see when everything is superimposed. Uh, yeah, when everything's three D. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah any, any, regulating only one thing I want to say, so but I, I want I want other other voices there. Um, oh, I would just really quickly I would say that there is uh, conveyed in these drawings there is a sense that this is a workshop. In, in a convincing way that is, it, it's a, you know, it's a combination of uh, the, the, the steel and the sort of average materials, but also the amount of shade, because we live in Texas and we need that shade so bad. But there, uh, there's the, the looseness of spaces in between these various buildings from the, from the exterior point of view. I'm thinking of particularly the perspective uh, looking into the, the big courtyard uh, in the center. Um, the one that has a man on a bridge port mill in the, in the foreground. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is what a workspace in Texas looks like and feels like in my experience. And, you know, I definitely, I, I'm, I'm interested in the overall, uh, uh, the, the overall narrative. By the way, did you write that opening quote, Duncan? Which, which where you were talking about mud upon mud yeah yeah i wrote the yeah well that was that was that was lovely i feel to be captured i felt like you were reading a uh, you know an, a, an architectural theorist that i should know about um so um i as much as i appreciate the big point of view on this i have to say there's something extremely realistic about these as workshops and you know it's hard to put my finger on. I can't say. I mean, I can say it's the sizes of the spaces, it's the the, the particular materials, it's the transparency and the air going through it. But this is what the concrete is, around the columns. That yeah, there are there are definitely some uh, industrial style uh, uh, details to this. But that this this is what workshops in Texas actually feel like. I just want to throw that out there. I love the concrete around the columns. That's what I first read. But then I said they were bit trash barrels or something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, maybe they could be both. Uh, the rubbish mm -hmm. and changing things and the stability so you don't bang into your column with the machine or something. With a truck. Hey, was a um, truck. Of course, I've, oh. been, I've, been, I've been following this project for a while. And this is uh, probably scheme number 10. Um, <laughs> And I, I had to absolutely shut Duncan down from being trying to invent more, but I do think Duncan, you should you should understand that you had to st any one of those earlier schemes would have had I think qualities as good as this, but it takes it takes stopping and developing to bring these things to a point where uh, they can be themselves, you know. Um, the only observation I want to make that I would not have seen, that I did not see before, is how your shed relates to Westbrook Metals. 
if you could just go mm, back right. to the site plan. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, I meant to I have think a. There's record. something about the alignment so, that makes another West site Brooklyn, plan. I need to go all the way. Yeah. Here. Well, okay, here. that'll do. It's yeah. um, yeah, it almost that shed and it almost seems to address Westbrook Metals. Yes. And and make a campus. Out, it seems to draw Westbrook Metals in to your school. Like if if that if that changed function, I wouldn't be surprised, because it's functioning like a like a stage, uh, and like a gate. Um, it, it it physically addresses Westbrook Metals and makes it part of your campus. I think. Um, Maybe I think that's that, a very. I can yeah. line got extended, which seems to be out there. It begins to pull in all these frontalities. Hmm. I mean, that, yeah. that's one extension, the circle, but the other one is that line that could come uh, down there that would make that into a campus. And which, anyway, it's just that. Yeah. So, so Michael, can I say one last thing for to? to no, we, David hasn't spoken. David, you oh, sorry, quiet. David. Yeah, I'm, I guys. I mean, I just feel like I'm in a different universe, and there, than the rest of you guys. I, I, I like honestly, I hate Duncan. It. I, I, th I don't hate it, but I don't think it's a, I, I don't hate it, but I don't think it's a workshop. I don't think it's rational. I don't think any of the things that anyone has said. I don't think it's actually. I think I think it's the weirdest shit. And usually, like you really need to tap into your inner weird shittiness because, like it, like you sit there and you think about it, you go, all right. So first of all, it's a giant round hallway, which as Michael pointed out, is neither good as a hallway nor as a room. The hallway itself is in, it's on the outside. But that's what I liked about it, David. That's what I liked about it. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm not, I know that that's, that's what you like about it. That's what I like about it too, but it's not rational. It's not workshop. It's not, it, it, it's like the basis of the, the thinking is actually a slightly different one. Like, so the idea of making this, I actually really love the site plan. I love this kind of giant round, wait, stop changing the images. Go back to that site plan. Or that, like, I, I love this giant round thing. It's freaky as hell. It reminds me of like, to, like a Nazi airport, right? It's like, it's like, like, Everything about it is impractical, and everything about it is to make this kind of large round thing. Like this is like in in a movie. This would be like like a workshop for like Doctor Evil, you know? Like it's got that, you know? Like and then and then these workshops they do this really weird thing. They meet at a point, which like every one of you construction guys, the fact that you haven't talked about it, like like this is super freaky. Like it's 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 like a detail that shows up three or four times. Like John Hadick liked it. Khan liked it. They, they approached it. They get freaked out about it. They backed away from it. Then there's these triangular courtyards that, that didn't really get talked about. Then there's indecision that you make. Like I, I, I'm like, why? What's that space about? You know, what's this? What's this relationship about? I mean, like this, it's a really weird diagram. Just to be clear, the diagram that you would normally make here is there would be a round hallway, and then the workshops would go out from it, right? That way you would minimize the amount of hallway, and you would maximize the flexibility of the hallway. Right. This is this would be the ideal way to do it. You would you would make interest as you went along here, and then you would allow. But you've done it the other way. You've cluttered these things on the inside, and then made sure that they're exactly identical, the same. You know, I don't mind the same. The next was talking about them being different. I don't mind them being the same. It's a little bit. They don't get much. They don't get much advantage out of there. Like for me, all the stuff. Like then you look at the drawings and Mark's right. It looks like every shitty craft hall in in in, in Texas, which all of which are. Like have some lousy concrete pour around some like oversized steel column because the engine, you know, because they got it off of some oil field site. You know, I mean, I don't mind those things, but it, it just seems to me that like if you're a young architect and you're not bound yet by by like having to be pragmatic, and then oh yeah, you planted this row of trees like around this thing to, to emphasize. It's like it's like the tomb of Marcus of of of, of the Emperor Augustus. You know, I mean, in the city, it's it's. This part of it is fabulous, but but there's but but it's fabulous in a way that that's not really remotely related to craft, right? And then that one other kind of comment I'd make about it, which is just the, the one thing I really don't like about it is I really don't like that these buildings are are are, are prosaic and mundane. Like I actually don't like the overlap section. It's a, this one where you get into trouble with this this kind of little band-aid prophylactic piece right here that you have to put between this heroic structure and that one, you know what I'm saying? Like I would, I would have argued to just let, if you're going to make one art structure, make the other one do something too, you know, just let them, let them work off of each other, let them work off of a, a shared hallway, let them begin to balance. This is a kind of Toyo Ito 
diagram circa mid 1980s, you know, where, where, where there's a there's a two building and another two building and they, they play off of each other. And then then these gestures, which are actually far more important, you've thrown them away. These carving gestures, these, these kind of places, the places that are actually important, the places between work where people go, then they begin to become the decisive uh, field of, uh, of, of kind of adventure for you design wise. But I, I, I just, I just the whole, this whole conversation just, Michael, I'm sorry, just threw me sideways because you guys keep talking about how, how normal and rational this is. You know, this is not <laughs> oh, normal think... and rational in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, Sorry, but what this, yeah, but David, what this pulls off is precisely that that tension between this is rational and this is weird. I yeah. mean, what more no, do you it's want? It's weird. It's not. It's yeah. not. It's not. It's not <laughs> irrational. It's not. It's all weird. I no, mean, not. I don't think you know, so. David, I was speaking to a um, uh, um, uh, a Tibetan student of mine uh, uh, who happens to be a monk, and uh, uh, I was I was harsh on him like this. And he looks at me and I thought he was gonna like fight back. And he says, this doesn't do much for my self-confidence. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked at him and I go, well, you're right, you're right. You know? uh, I, think, I think a lot of your points are well, a lot of your points are well taken, but uh, those points, if delivered in another way, might be another iteration or another concept. This. Yeah, but, see, but, but again, my, my larger point here in, in, within the school is we keep toning our conversation down. The larger to, point is you don't like Austin. No, I love Austin and I like weird okay. architecture, but I hate talking about weird architecture, like somehow, like, like, like not talking about the thing that's the obvious elephant in the room. You know what I'm saying? Like, because it's far more yeah. interesting. Michael, I mean, it's, it's, all, this, all the things, all of these decisions, right? These are the things that is, are going to make Duncan an interesting architect. Not but, the, the, that's what David, I'm saying, you know. David, David, yeah. I have to interrupt you. Uh, Duncan, how many how many hours did we spend talking about those two roofs touching each other? <laughs> well, how many, how many hours did we spend talking about how weird those triangular courtyards are? And, yeah, we had uh, at least two meetings right. about that. Right, um, David, you, you you underestimate uh, how much talk has gone into. Uh, this thing. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. No, I, and I no think problem. we know. No and problem. I think we I just, know just, how weird this is. I think we, we, have great, we, have this, we have this. We have this great moment where, where professional practice is, is staggering, and we can finally have a, a much more interesting discussion about what a building might be, or what a building might, where it might go, and what it might do. We've got a whole board of people here who are just experts at. I mean, Peter Waldman, for crying out loud. I mean, and, and you and, and Michael Rotundi, between the two of you, uh, I, I mean, I, I've heard you know, like, like you guys take stuff in directions that are, are, are really, really intriguing. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to back away at this point. In time. I'm just going to back away very, very politely. Maybe it's the zoom that's getting to me here, but yeah. No, you, it's actually, it's kinda, okay. Okay, great okay. stuff. Great stuff. I, um, I just, I would say that this is a, this is a workshop and it's one of the few designs I've seen where I can hear the trucks driving up and dropping stuff off. I can smell the wood dust shavings. I can hear the metal cutting machines and the sparks of, of grinders. This is one of the few buildings of designs that accepts the grit and, uh, and the dirt and the banality of, of most of what happens <laughs> in a workshop. Yeah. Well, listen, we could go on. John's being quiet. John, do you like this? Yes or no? Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> well, first of all, yeah, this is, it's a little bit like I just turned into the Brian Lair show and some kind of like uh, <laughs> zealous caller. Is, uh, David, I don't know if you're talking into a tin can or what, but it sounds like. David, your voice is. Tin can, John. Yeah, is it really it, that bad? It, it, it adds to the experience, to be perfectly frank. I kind of, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Um, <laughs> And I'm glad that the, I am really glad that you brought up those points where the, uh, the buildings touched. I was going to bring that up if you mm. did, um, because mm. the, uh, oh, like it gets weirder than to see them rounded weirder like that. It just gets <laughs> yeah. weirder and weirder. Uh, okay, so listen, you have, Duncan, to your credit, you rounded the corners right there to respond to that. And I deeply oh. appreciate it. I, I still find the thing to be very awkwardly executed, but I think that, um, and it's funny because like the sensitivity with which you approach the project, it's, is there's a, there's, for me, there's a, there's a pretty big gap between the sensitivity in terms of like crafting this thing, space and form versus the delicate description that we heard earlier, which I thought was wonderful. 
wonderful too. Um, I, I'm disappointed David didn't get a chance to mention the little lumps that are in this on the on the kind of long axis of the triangle corridors. I mean, there's there are a lot of really weird things kind of weird. lingering in here. And so I mean, I I I'm actually I'm I, if I have to pick the binary kind of like affiliation here, it's going to be on Professor Heyman's side of the fence. Um, I mean, because I. I, but I don't think it's necessarily a question of it getting weirder so much as a question of it getting a little bit more ruthlessly organized to borrow a term that, that David was throwing around earlier. Um, yeah, I agree. For me, it's the ruthlessness uh, that, it, that contains the appeal of these uh, industrially oriented projects. And I think that there's something special about a building that, that, that appears a bit indifferent to um, it, it's what's going on around it. Um, uh, that kind of... Uh, relationship to me reflects something important about humanity in a very, very weird way that um, uh, suggests that what we do to the built environment is something that kind of organically influenced and controlled by powers a little bit bigger than ourselves. So whenever you come into contact with these kinds of buildings that, that have this kind of um, vestigial industrial vocabulary, there's just something undeniably beautiful about that. And, and in most cases, it, it, it's it's a kind of uh, inexplicable uh, idiosyncrasy that is not it is entirely divorced from the hand of its author um, in a beautiful way. Uh, it, you don't get that in this. You're not going to get that in this sense only because of the willful nature of the square running up against the circle. Those things should have been curved um, delicately to respond. Although I, again, I, I I think that the arrangement between the building and the corridors should have been inverted, as, as as Dave was pointing out earlier. But either way. Mm -hmm curving those and just reducing this to a single um, facile gesture in the site would have been something that really uh, and John, you know, the first scheme was one long noodle that just yeah of course you know, and, 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 <laughs> and I've worked with students like that before like it's I know exactly what you're talking about Michael you're just like you show up and you're like like damn it man can, can we have a continuous conversation please like you show up and it's like, <laughs> right. and they've changed the channel yeah. and, but I, uh, I the big question for me is yeah. whether, is is how 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 whether Duncan really understands how weird this building is, um, but Duncan, you still have a few years to go before we uh, brainwash you completely. So Michael, I I still want to say what I was going to say before. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, um, I think uh, Duncan, all of the the uh, the critique, uh, whatever, however it was delivered, I think uh, what you learn from that is is. Uh, how to look at your own work and see the things that uh, experienced uh, people see. Um, having said that, I think the depth of your thinking that came in your text, uh, if you could think and then focus that thinking by studying all of the different aspects and elements of your project in, in, in specific way, in specific terms, instead of looking at the overall, you're starting to look at the at the space in between. You're starting to look at the structural frame. You're starting to look at how the, 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 the materials are, are laid in, how those materials then become elements in terms of walls and then windows and then doors. And you study all of them as, as, as singular pieces, the same way as, as Dinesh was mentioning the, what unity and diversity is. That's not only an architectural, it's a social model, but how do you start to look at each of the parts and understand what is, what is it that gives each of those parts its integrity? And then as you start to put them all together, how do you keep the integrity of all of those parts when they begin to be assembled into a greater whole? And I think if you can write like you wrote, you can definitely train your eye and develop a kind of visual literacy that allows you to not only edit words, but to begin to edit a building. That's my thought. I have no doubt it's gonna happen and we're gonna to have to move on. Duncan, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay weird, Duncan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, <Ernie. laughs> Duncan, you're definitely doing your part to keep off the All right, here's <laughs> Renee. Here's <laughs> Renee of the large white headphones. Yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> So hi, I'm Renee. Uh, the key concepts that really drove my project 
was this almost lost art form of manual craft and how my project could inspire and provide a community for craft people and really nurture and motivate the individuals in the space in order to revitalize this lost art. And the aesthetic around the site is very um, urban rustic and very gritty and industrialized. But um, after talking to a lot of the neighbors around the site when we were doing research, many of them had either just sold their property or had many other locations, but a shop called Westbrook Metals that many other students have talked about was this unmovable kind of energy source of this site. And being a metal provider shop itself, it stuck out to me as a cousin to this manual art center that we were designing. And there, there's a sense of importance to me to interact and kind of dance with this um, energy that was already on the site. And so using kind of the classical geometry that we had previously explored, um, I developed kind of a scheme that is showing the reaction to Westbrook Metals like energy and in so multiplying the energy throughout um, kind of this manual art center. And so this is the site plan and the shops in the gallery align with Westbrook Metals here. And then this is the gallery spaces and the shop spaces. And the shop, shops are in L shapes that divide the program that we were giving of each space into a working floor that's kind of loud and creating space. And then a more private and classroom setting that was kind of more of individual creativity. And I had these initial sketches at the beginning, which is uh, that I made uh, and the shop had this A space and B space with a C courtyard that worked with the A space and this A space would be the workflow area. And so the courtyard is kind of this extension of that. And uh, throughout kind of the exteriors of each of the buildings, uh, there are these sliding doors that line the exterior walls and punch out uh, connective paths, both, both visually and physically. And as you can see in the second drawing here, uh, the spaces in each shop alternate or rotate. So you can see kind of A space here versus A space there. Um, so uh, through the walkways and the visual pathways, a person um, in, in space A uh, can visually see into space B of their own shop, but also see into kind of a private space of another shop and vice versa. When you're in a private space kind of, connect, kind of creating, you can look and see in your own shop people working and, other, and in other shops people working as well. And this is a digital diagram, kind of a more refined aspect of what I just showed. And uh, here are some digital diagrams showing the visual and physical connections created by the spaces. And so you can see these kind of Renee, spaces. maybe you can zoom, zoom in on them a little bit. Yeah. Can you, can you do a zoom? Yeah, I can zoom in. Is that good? Yeah, better. Is that better? Renee, okay. Renee, Renee, that's all possible because there are all those corner windows that you added into that back in the plant. It's a corner window that's crucial, right? Yeah. There's, yeah. There's, yeah. He's done by openings. Yeah. So yes. All those yes. oblique lines actually are corner windows as well. Are they upper level walkways? Uh, no, they're on the same plan. So there's not like an up, upper level. Okay. So it's all on one level. Yes. Yeah, so you can kind of see this rotation in space and then these connections um, here. And then um, let me just scoot over a little bit. You, this is more like a, a, visual, a site diagram that I kind of quickly did when I was exploring kind of the relationships that could be seen. So. And here's the, the plan. Uh, 
Um, so at, uh, something that I noticed being kind of in architecture school at UT was it's kind of hard to make people in different studios kind of mingle unless you have a friend that's in the studio. But the times that I do mingle throughout each of the studios, um, it's when I see something interesting that I really want to like kind of go explore more. And so I, I thought these creative, these uh, visual and physical paths between the shops would create a community at all scales. So you have a community within the shops but also within other shops. And the courtyards are expanded out to the ends of the site in order to utilize as much space as possible. In section, um, another big focus, as I mentioned before, was creating a space that would inspire the creatives and connecting the hands of the manual art and the craft with the mind. And I, I kept almost everything at the human strata as free as possible um, and did a lot of design work above people's heads so people can focus at the small scale and be kind of able to move around within that um, while being free above um, in order to inspire the manual, uh, this manual kind of craft. Um, I really tried to advocate for the beauty of the structure of this uh, building and what is holding up the building itself. <clears throat> so this column to trust structure allows for uh, the clear stories um, to that line the above head strata and produce as much natural light as possible for the people working. And light is another way that the hand and the mind can connect. So then here's a section, a perspective section cutting through um, two of the shops. And you can see kind of these structures holding up the building and allowing kind of the light to come in and then these um, windows that ventilate the space and and free up the ventilation there and then here's kind of a simpler section showing the elevations of, and the doors and so there are these corner doors here that create a connective space where all four of the shops meet and where everyone can kind of meet together and pass through and so here's kind of a perspective showing within one shop and you can see these kind of punched out holes and rhythm. And then here's a perspective showing the interior of one shop and into this courtyard while being able to see through and out of another shop here. And then here's kind of standing in the center of this, of all four of the shops. And you would and imagine- maybe, you Maybe zoom that too. Okay. It's going to be fuzzy right here. Yeah. yeah, it's a little fuzzy. But, um, and you're able to see directly through to the courtyard, and you can imagine you could see that on all mm. kind of levels. And then... A, a brief uh, interruption, Renee. Yeah. That corner right there, what, what, um, it, it's great to do that. I was starting to wonder, based on what you were saying about how do you break down territoriality, if that was inverted. Uh, you keep that, but then the glass goes in instead of stays on the, the wall. There used to be storefronts that you would basically be able to enter the store without entering the store, where the, mm -hmm. where the door is pushed in, you know, anywhere from uh, five to eight feet, so that you could have display uh, so The door high. opens at right angles to that, yeah, inward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so people can, we could enter the, the space without entering the space. Oh, okay. Yeah. They do that, that in is. India a lot, a re entered corner. Yeah. But also strengthen that square that laps into everything. Yeah, it would be a larger square. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, Go on, Renee. Okay. Back, back to you, Renee. Here we go. And this is the kind of final perspective of standing in a courtyard, and you're able to see into a court, the courtyard of another shop here as well as the other shop here. So in conclusion, the Manual Arts Center is a linking of spaces that produces relationships between the space and the people and will create a community of this kind of lost manual art. And the structure is exposed to everyone and artfully designed in order to advocate for a higher quality of the experience within this kind of 
production space. Should I go back to like the plan, Michael, or? Yeah. Why does it need columns? That's it. Um, because of the clear stories and the the doors, there's no kind of really rigid uh, structure. Sure there is. There's no rigid structure? There's a rigid structure. There's gotta be a rigid structure. Please tell me there's a rigid structure. <laughs> I think, uh, David, what you're, what you're guessing, I think correctly is, we don't need the columns or the inner stuff. We could, no, just do, we could just do a beam from one side to the other. Well, you need a bond beam here. Steel like, piece. You need uh, a big bond beam there, right? You need one here, and then you can start lifting off of these things. I mean, I, I, you don't need them. And, and so then you wonder about, I'm just trying to figure out where you, where you, where you put your, you know, like where you're putting your energy, architectural energy. And it, it seems to me that it, it's really about these corners, which is, you know, about this is where the idea is. They could be, as Michael suggested, they could be good. They could go inward. They could be bigger. You know, they're with regard to these kind of walls. They they're naturally problem causing because this corner constructionally is just a nightmare. But I think these are justified. I actually think they're justified programmatically as opposed to just by taste because architects like corner windows. And then it brings this whole question about the deployment of these other windows, especially like this one, like whether or not that one shouldn't be here, you know, and like like that that, that shouldn't just go ahead and make the division between the two spaces, yeah, you, know, and then, you know, and then you begin to wonder about like, but, but really then what we're talking about is there's, there's, a, there's a wall down below which has to transfer load somewhere to the, the wall up above through a bond beam. And that bond beam actually could tie across like that and then it would lower your, that whole metal thing that you got drawn down to that level to where it's, like if you go back to your perspective, it's really kind of awkwardly floats up a, kind of, a couple of feet and it could come down. I mean. It's just a, for me, the, the question had to do with where you went back to, like inspiring people. And I was thinking about the fact that if you, there's different ways you can inspire people towards craft. But one is that you, like, like the building itself is crafted to the, the nth degree. Like there's, you can't walk into a con building like the British Museum and not be just flattened by the level of craft. And, and you can't imagine, like you feel like literally everything you have with you is shameful somehow and every every cheap and like you're, you got to throw your clothes away your backpack away your clothes, everything because it, it's also tawdry by comparison to that level of crap so it seems to me that there, there's embedded in this a project a nice idea a very simple kind of planimetric idea but it's a constructional idea that that really requires you to i think uh just follow literally the the but this is like Nakashima looking at a piece of wood. You just have to kind of look at these kind of rectangular buildings and, and, and the desire that you have with regard to the making these corner windows. And let that then seems to be prompt the whole kind of cascade of decisions that you make. I'd like David, to, let me. I just want to ask David a question. David, I like tree, I, I like tree columns. Um, if um, I was the client and you're the architect and I said, you got to use a tree column in here somewhere. Where would you put it? And make it. Work. I would. I would actually put it. I would put it. So what I don't like about the project. So what you approach, right? I mean, by the way, I've done tree columns, right? Like you know, like I mean, mm -hmm. I would do it somewhere like here, right? Where you go, where you go, you just need one of them, right? Or you 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 cover one of these courtyards with them. You know, you just need one. Right. Okay, you and can put it in the center of the courtyard. Yeah, but but here they're just like killer. <clears throat> they're the, they're the kind of thing that like 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 and the fact that they're double, right? You, you know, and and it, they're just like. They, they, they really, they problematize the whole workability of this space as a kind of free space. These are short spans. They don't, what, they don't tree need column work, But okay, but, but um, it, it becomes a little bit uh, longer span uh, where, the, where the two rectangles overlap. Is it possible to have a tree column where the, if you have yeah. inverted glass, you put a tree column where the glass meets and then that basically is holding up the overlap zone. You do one here and one here. Uh, and I wanted instead of those uh, bond beams over there, I just wanted yeah. to, you want to make a case. For let let me just, I'd like to, just, let me just intersect that at an earlier version of the scheme, the, whoever, you know, these corners are very, very important. But originally those corners were aligned with those so that, that they were open, this part was open. Bigger, yeah. It, it was it bigger. bigger still. This part was open. <laughs> 
And so we got a corridor of space all the way along that column line, right? So I'm not yep. saying that that answers all the questions, but it does sort of bring those columns into the game, which yep. they are not, mm -hmm. not that deeply into the game yet. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the other place for the column, because I mean, it seems to me that what I, what, what's correct about this drawing is that right now these things are conceived as part of this. But the other way to do this is to say, why don't you start with the idea that this is the primary space? Like yeah. that's the thing that needs to be structured. Yeah. It, yeah. It's right. That's what I'm saying. That's why these columns to me are redundant. I mean, you're right. It could be, it could be, there could be one there, I suppose, or there could be one this part about it here. Well, that's where it started. Here. It started yeah. with the that central square uh, needing columns or wanting columns, then the corner windows, and then, then the rest yeah. follow. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that gets back to what David was saying that you start with, with something that's seminal and then it, it basically expands out from there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can see that. One one thing that I'm thinking about, and it's less about the structure, like the literal literal structure. Um, it's more about like the body of these spaces. And when I look at this plan, most of the other plans have actually been more inward. This is the first one that reminds me of like a group of elephants surrounding their babies facing outward, you know, like everyone's back is here and they're looking out like that. And there's something <clears throat> precious in the center. Um, that's that's my reading of it. I don't. You know that that's where the phrase "elephant in the tent" came from. When they're all butts. We're all is sticking it? in like that. Yeah, it is. Actually. Yeah. Just imagine a, a tent with four butts of an elephant sticking <laughs> in like that. That's For sure. It. Yeah. I see it less as a big block that's been cut. I don't see it as that. I see it as four elements, five with that thing that have abutted next to each other and that are looking both in and out at the same time. But what, what I would wonder is um, the location of these things is, yeah, is no kind way. of strange in terms of that, like what I just described. It's like, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's almost not in a central location. I could see it moving somewhere like here I don't know, something that reinforces the reading of the room. And the other thing is the, the face, like the face of this thing. I could see this wall on the inside and this wall on the outside having a completely different character. Um, either one being introverted and the other one being extroverted or, or vice versa, I'm not sure. Um, those were just a few things. I think you have the, the plan shape delineated and in the articulation you could reinforce these things as bodies and this this plan clearly reminds me of the unitarian church that louis Kahn did and the way those light monitors are in the top they have a face they have a back, back of the head and a front of the face and i would just like to see some of that back and front show up well this corner arrangement comes from uh, Decker. And uh, John, you remember the video you made of this? That's something we something similar could be done here, I think. John, I think this religious uh, aspect because of the bioxyl symmetry. Renee, your first image, if you showed it with the colors uh, up there, the site plan is far more dynamic. No, be, uh, before that, before that, earlier, earlier, that one. Exactly. When I read this, I thought this was interesting. It began to address that piece, that this corner was open to light, et cetera, through here. And I thought there could be the arrangement that would be like the dynamic, whether it be Frank Stella or whatever you had uh, before there. But uh, I think it works well in the discussion has been great around this four equal parts, but I actually think a much more fragmented kind of condition suggested by this, where there's a collective courtyard and people might come in here and proceed to or your multiple pieces, or I thought that was actually mm. this in section, it wasn't all happening on one level, but there'd be upper mezzanines and that's where your classrooms would be overlooking a double height A space, et cetera, through here. So I find this far more interesting spatially. I appreciate the many articulated parts that you have, uh, what you have now, but I think your beginning is something I would probably encourage you to make this work rather than making it into four equal parts through there. But it's Peter, that that quad, the outside quadrant then, yes. should probably be incorporated uh, into each of the squares, right? In order to, yeah. yes, yes, 
it shouldn't be just separated. It's a way of incorporating and layering it, layering and layering it over yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, I was interested in that as a diagram of being a dynamic. Yeah, that's 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 strong. Key. Yeah. Because I think Renee, you put par parking in those outside quadrants. I think. Uh, you trying to make it be realistic? <laughs> no, I'm just thinking that that should be that should be incorporated as part of this part of the space of of that that uh, that quadrant. Parking and and, and, and not put parking this, in there. What, one thing about this diagram that I keep finding really arbitrary, and it, it keep in my mind, I keep coming back to it, is the decision to set your building up based on this existing building. I just find that really troubling. I actually find this dimension really problematic. I wish this dimension were the same as that dimension. Like right now, right now the space very much feel like right now. I mean, like if you look at this diagram, I, I like this diagram a lot. I agree with Peter. And and, and and you look at it, you realize the thing about it that's most arbitrary is is this line, right? Like, like, like how this set of divisions gets made. I mean, I guess it, it gets made by, by superimposing this kind of Fibonacci series on it, but really it arises from the fact that, that there's somehow, there's something really crucial or meaningful about this that I think you'd have to kind of show somehow in a diagram. So I, I think it's the, the, the idea that the building might slip past that thing at, at, you know, it, 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 and, and, and have a window there and a window there and just that you look past it, it could be just as strong. I mean, I think there's, there's, a, there's a kind of, I actually, what, what I like about mm -hmm. your project a lot is like you're trying to find ways uh, to sneak these kind of geometric rigors in there, you know, and, 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 and which I think all of us secretly admire. And, and it, it's, this, it's this kind of thing where you, you don't want to admit it to clients, right? That, 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 that behind certain things, there are, there are, there are geometries that you're, that you're obsessing about, or that, that you're that you're that you're trying to carry through, you know, and where they come from, and what they what they might be about, uh, I think that they bear uh, a little further exploration. I I like them a lot, but but then I mean, for me, uh, that just how wide is that hallway? Um, I think it's uh, eighteen feet. That's pretty big, no? It's big. No, it's not very big at all. Proportionally, it's it's just narrow as hell. <laughs> Proportionally, it is, but realistically, it's it's not too bad. The overlap of the bones was quite interesting to me. Um, but um, uh, David, you bring up a very good factor about the rain rain Reinhardt building. I think, particularly how it's drawn here. If you didn't have a wall here or down here, but you made it all glass, or the entire space of the Reinhardt building extended like a patio and gantry cranes and all that other stuff extended here, then these wouldn't be pre precious lines anymore over here. That's why right. the coloration is intriguing because of the continuity, and it's not necessarily a dark line. And that's why the transparency through that and, and coming across, I think there's something in aesthetic of multi-level layering, everything you're doing on your plan now, Renee, and I think you're doing some terrific things, but your elevation seem to have layers of beams and stuff coming out there. And I, I trust your aesthetic, uh, simultaneities of what you have in this early drawing, uh, rather than just repeating it four times over, uh, maybe full workspace. Anyway. One. Oh, go ahead, Dinesh. I'll uh, give you the last word. Okay, two quick things. One is yeah. I appreciate the the boiled down diagrams that you showed and in general in school and in practice, it's helpful to take away the complexity and just show what's underneath um for people to to talk about the second thing is the the big question that i see for every project really is what do you allow to push your building around what are the forces that exert such force that it changes the orientation or the shape of the thing that you're making and for every project the answer should be something worthy i think and that brings up the question of this this old building here like, is it more important that that thing move your building around or that the sun move your building around or that the, the practice of craft move your building around? You know, and I, I think just in every project you do ask yourself that question, what is shaping, molding the clay of my project and does it deserve to affect my building? Yeah, well, uh, well said. She definitely aligned this I guess more closely to north, south, east, and west, and I do think the the windows would have a, a very responsive to time of day. I think it's a sundial in many ways, 
yeah. but she has she has twisted it to meet Westbrook metals. Um, and yet the building itself doesn't really gesture towards it. It just sort of aligns with it. I think we'd agree to that. Um, I, yeah, I think it's an amazing effort at making geometries um, produce sort of, uh, I think the, the through views that you get and the way you've managed all that is just uh, really admirable. I also know, um, uh, Rene, that you've, you've, you did renders of the interior of that that are actually better than any of those you showed today. Mm -hmm. And I do hope you're going to go back and uh, uh, color and light balance them. Um, there's a, the building you've, you've designed is actually quite a lot handsomer, in my view, than what you managed to show us today. Do you, those um, renders that you're talking about, I, yeah. I didn't render in V-Ray. Oh, well, Which maybe you didn't render them in v Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Those, those were handsome. Uh, I think the, the, the V-Ray ones looked a little somber somehow compared to what, what, what you've, I've seen before. Renee, if I could, um, um, some of the things that I just heard uh, said, and I think it was really important uh, that Peter said, let's look at this again. Uh, the diagram is a beautiful drawing. I love uh, uh, diagrams like this. I would, I would challenge you to keep the diagram. The diagram is symmetrical. How would you now produce a building in total that is asymmetrical? But still adhering to the to the diagram. Now you'd be selective, wouldn't you? You'd have to. Yeah. Because I think you're ready for that. You're ready for that. R Renee, you should you should challenge Michael Rotundi to make a symmetrical building. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when you say when you do one, look closer. <laughs> they're all symmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Speak of the yeah. like absence, right? That's great. <laughs> Renee, thank you very much. Last but not thank least. Thank you. Hello. Where are you, James? Here. Um, my name is James. Um, I have a four-year design degree from Texas a in environmental design. Uh, so this is my first year and now last vertical studio here at uh, UT. It's like you're sitting in one of your own renderings, James. I, I am sitting in my project <laughs> currently right now. So, um, John, I didn't, I didn't give you a chance to speak to Renee's. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, no, no problem. I think I can find a way to connect maybe two co projects because there's been a there's been a common thread between uh, the projects we've seen so far that I'm I'm hoping to circle okay. down on here. So we'll see. All right. All right. Um, so this project is oriented in a way that we will kind of walk through a whole day's event um, in the project, um, and so. On the approach to the campus, we would be greeted by this billboard that is the front of the project um, to kind of drag you in um, and bring you in. So the initial part of this project started with understanding um, some elements of the project, looking at construction, aesthetics, industrial utilitarian things, um, working through Michael's book, Architecture Beyond Experience, um, also just kind of this conception of images being on a digital platform, especially in the current times, it's easy to consume artifacts, materials, aesthetics from social media and stuff. And then working with uh, Barbara Solomon's graphics to kind of make the color palette and uh, graphics for this project. So these were the, the initial elements to kind of generate the pool of thought and idea. Um, and so then we arrive here after seeing our billboard at the, the site, um, kind of just the general shading and location of the thing. Uh, and so the main part of the planning of this building campus was working with the uh, understanding of ISVIS and room to room relationships. Um, so we start here with uh, ISVIS A. So let's call all of these rooms A, B, C, D, and E. Um, and so with an ISOVIST and A, we have this relationship between A and B, B and C, uh, and D. And so we're going to continue on. When we position ourselves in D, we can have the relationship to both E, C, B, and A. 
Um, and so this starts to build up the connections and the grouping of this project. Um, and then when we start to add overlapping isovis, we can start to see certain pockets generating. And so the overlap here um, is room C, which has its own program. And then this kind of courtyard space out in front of the, the grouping of the buildings. And then with two uh, isovis in A and E, we have the same similar grouping here in room C and then outside in the space. Um, and so you have the site plan to reference on the, the right, just to make sure you don't get confused. Um, so right now in the blue, you can see the, the access that these isovists have to the space. Um, and then once we add the transparency of the windows here, A and E are positioned to where they can actually see each other. Um, and both of them have the visibility or access to every other space on the site with the overlap still being in this kind of common courtyard uh, patio space. Um, and then here, figure one, two, and three. One, we have the entrance of the space, being able to see all of the grouping in the courtyard of the space, seeing the grouping inside the buildings uh, and the spot that you came from. And then inside three, room C, you have access and visibility to all of the rooms on the site, even the, the annex building. Um, so this was really the initial jumping off point for the organizing. There wasn't, there was many diagrams and trace paper and discussions through this, but this is kind of the, the overlaying numerics that developed this uh, grouping. Um, so we arrive at the overall floor plan of the thing with trees, furniture. And so what's really happening here is a, a module of five of these units that are 120 by 40. And so each one of these modules is one of the four workshops. And then we have the design gallery kind of position within the center of the space. And so there's large flexible um, space to allow each trade to become whatever it wants with kind of these saddlebags attached to the space, housing uh, the administration portion of the, the workshop. And so here room A is going to possibly designated as wood, B is ceramic, C is our gallery, D is stone, E is metal, and then our annex is here as the first aid and cafeteria. And so what we have really is a series of relationships between all of these rooms and all of these trades. You can see that there is stair stairwells connecting these things. So we have full transparency working at one workshop with the other, um, promoting collaboration or competition, whatever you would like to see, like this campus would be facilitating discussions, work, product and such. Um, and so one section inside this, this is uh, room E, we can begin to see how this space is working out. Um, and so a lot of my early studies were... James, could you zoom in on that maybe? Um, we're we're going to get there. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, was in the over the head or above the head architecture. Um, and so a lot of work was kind of redesigning or repurposing a traditional sawtooth roof. Um, and then we actually can see um, two overlapping uh, skylights here. And so this is you know, the generic numerics of the space. We have a t uh, t 12 foot gap in between our columns and beams and then the space itself. Um, and so we actually have two skylights, one facing, the larger usually faces uh, general north. Um, and so when, like Michael was at, asking, getting closer here, we can now see our, our pergola. This is the joint works outdoor space. We have the entrance into uh, room E. We can see our courtyard in the back. And so we kind of have these large openings into the space. We have the architecture really happening above the head and the room being left to the workshop itself. And so we can see here's our connection to the other workshop. And this is uh, one of the drop-off spots for materials to move in and out of space. Um, and so working with this above the head architecture, we have some pretty raw but abstract um, renders showing the way that the light is going to be really functioning in the space. So at 10 o'clock in May, 10.30 in May, we're gonna have these large casts in this room. Um, and then at 3 p.m., we actually only have stuff hitting the floor. Um, so it's really nice to bring in some daylight. This is all ventilated space, um, as you can see by the exhaust fans. So like this isn't gonna be air conditioning, it's going to be workshop 
sawdust light and we have some fluorescent lighting um, and so that really moves us into the character of the project here um, so this would be coming into the the entrance of the, the campus here we can see all of our rooms our pergola the activity that's really bustling here the courtyard that is generating this common space this is the the, the common workspace uh, to work with multi-materials multi-disciplines and then looking back from the courtyard from the place we just came back to the, the annex which is the first day in cafeteria so this is just a large community um, of craftsmen and so working our way into the interior this would be room a the wood um, we see the large amount of light that is coming into this space, um, really promoting this uh, profile on the roof, but allowing the workshop to be free to conform to whatever is needed. And then looking across the room, looking from room A to B, we can actually see into the gallery and through around the corner into the next space. And so there's just really this flow of sight um, and access to other spaces, which is the driving part of this project. And then the design gallery, this is where the visitors would come. People would be trying to sell their work or displaying it. Um, so a very large open community space. Um, and so then we get to the, just the overall experiences of the space. Um, we have looking out of the gallery into the courtyard. We have plenty of conditions of windows to windows and through more windows into different rooms. Um, so it's a very rich environment visually, uh, but also for the building itself, not just the humans that occupy it. Um, plenty of classroom gathering, drop off of materials, exchange of things, you know, the stonemasons getting their stone, the forklift drivers saying, yeah, it's not gonna fit, but we already have all the stuff in the room. So they're trying to figure that out. Um, <laughs> And then also, this is the, the common entrance to the space. So both the viewer, the visitor, and the user both get privileged uh, signage for this space. Um, and so just like we started with the day, we end with the night. Um, and so that's kind of this giant moon tower, which is really only seen initially in my uh, site plan, is actually lighting the scene, which kind of brings its iconic uh, nature back to Austin. And the billboard remains lit up and you know some people burning the midnight oil over here working on their projects um so that's the the whole encompassment thank you james all right that was a tour de force <laughs> it, was, it was a lot yeah no it was good it was good but i, I want to leave it up to you know more discussion and flipping around well i have a really loaded question okay all right and the view on the left there is what triggered it. Um, starting out with the Isovist and, and, and that whole sort of um, uh, spatial study uh, is really quite wonderful and, and how it leads to all the connections, which you could see from the interior rendering of all the spaces that are connected, I think is pretty, pretty great. Uh, but that particular view uh, was startling to me because now what I was I had set in my mind as a kind of industrial uh, sort of character and let's say scale mm -hmm. uh, now becomes domesticated with a mansard roof, <laughs> which 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 just happens b because of the the materiality, uh, and and then even the brick, uh, it pushes me back into vernacular being an idea, as opposed to just uh, uh, an aesthetic. Uh, because vernacular is not an idea, which is one of the things that uh, came, uh, I didn't think about before until I was going to Austin a lot, where vernacular and nostalgia, as David uh, is railing against, uh, I, I rail against in my own quiet way. Uh, but anyways, how do you speak to um, the industrial nature of this uh, and, and, and the industrial, industrial scale and character versus, uh, let's say, a, a domestic scale and character? So I think really the only attempt to be vernacular or to have vernacular character was the, the moon tower in the end. I think part of my- Well, start, start, with, start with the vernacular isn't so important. The, the industrial and domestic, I think, okay. is really what I'm, what I'm after. 
Uh, and it might be that that was not really on your mind and it might just be a, well, anyway, I'll shut up. You talk. Um, no, the industrial is definitely on my mind. Um, I'm really into utilitarian architecture. Um, and I think part of that comes out with like these metal, um, the metal overhangs in the door. And I, I don't think that, I think the best serving material for this project was, was weathered brick really. Um, and to have these kind of metal cladded uh, fans on here and really it remains rough and textured. Um, I think that's really, I think that's anti-domestic in a sense. Um, that's really going against, you know, just putting up some stone walls and it's actually just a gypsum board with the stone cladding on top of it. But just having something that would, would weather and contain really the, the grit of this space. You know, there was a time when brick, what determined the size of brick initially uh, was the, 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 um, uh, the admixture. They, they didn't have admixtures that could increase the size of a brick. Mm -hmm. And then concrete block comes along. Uh, bricks could be twice that size or three times that size if you're gonna use clay. So, uh, but, but that's, that's another, uh, because the, the plan and the section, uh, all of your drawings up to the point of the mansard, uh, I thought were really uh, fantastic. And I think it's still a, a, a really a, a wonderful project. But with this particular view, when I look back at that building, it looks like this could be an apartment complex. And that's what I find a bit troubling for me. Okay. And, uh, it, it just happens, the observer is the observed. So I'm saying that this is what I see, but it's not necessarily what you see or what's intended. My, my comments are related to Michael's in that I don't know the term isovist, uh, except that I saw these great blue vectors going all the way through there. And at the scale, which I want to stress, as opposed to the materiality at the scale of the industrial, it seemed like there was a huge set of vector-like roofs maybe maybe solar panels as well as making this independent and things like that, that would be hovering. David Heyman at five, at, at three o'clock when we began uh, this review told me that there were great migrations of birds going over, um, going over Austin at the point that was amazing right to now. see in the sky. And I imagine them as those migratory kinds of conditions of large scale passengers, yeah. I call them angel wings. But I just imagined instead of the mansard roofs and things like that, which are small and huge, and diminutive and could be an upscale shopping center in Texas that it actually was these great vector-like wings, the blue things up there above your body, instead of the trees, that actually these stanchions that would hold up an infrastructural kind of set of things beneath which these boxes would then sit. Now that's a misreading because I don't know what isopers means, but I have a feeling that it's about the connective spaces, et cetera, that you get in these views. But I thought that was amazing as a diagram of something that would hover above the building in many layers, serving pragmatic needs of infrastructure, but instead of the more romantic trees that happen to be around there, which are perfectly handsome and fine, but I think it's a big, what's it called? A, um, it's a, 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 a craft center, right? Or something like that. Yes. Um, it sounds like it's a, a shop, but it's really learning this thing. And maybe the nature of craft and making things as Duncan was talking about has been lost now, and maybe this, pause with this plague now allows us to actually appreciate a few small things immediately at hand. So oh, it's a misreading because I don't know what I suppose means, but I am taken by the power of these great angel wings or migratory birds or whatever they happen to be above it as another way of seeing it. I like those drawings too. Could you go back to them, those blue Isobis drawings? Which one do you want? Either one. Is there a large Pick series? One. Yeah. Okay. There, stop there. There, there. That's perfect. Actually, go back. Go back one. Yeah. The one where you see them. Yeah, like this one. I mean, I have to say, there's a lot of things about this project I like. I have to say, the thing I most like about it is your gearheadedness. I actually trust that. Like, I, I trust the fact that these drawings are, are complete and they're thorough, and, and you thought about all this stuff. And there's trusses and there's, there's skylights and there's and then there's, there's then there's a bunch of weird stuff that we gotta talk about and, and kind of unpack a little bit. But, but I actually yeah. just like the fact that like like what you really trust in in in, in students is gearheadedness, right? Like, I want to be an architect. I'm going to be an architect. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna draw everything. I'm not holding back. Being in graduate school is not a form of punishment. You know, like like I, I want to do the work, and, and I, so I really appreciate about this project so much. How, how much you kind of want to do the work. I, I, it, it, it sounds like a strange thing, but it, it's so crucial and central to. I think there's strange decisions here. I mean, 
the, the for me, the, the, I, I, the idea of the architecture being over your head, I think is super smart. It, it is, you know, I, I have to say this kind of Ignazio Gardella, small scale, kind of like concrete poured, like Northern Italian thing. It, it's just a heat beast here, right? Like you got to face it North, you got to shade it. It, it. There's a early Lake Flato studio that they did for his, uh, it's from Malou Flato, like as a painter. And you should take a look at it. it. I mean, the skylight is three stories up. It's a two foot window then it floods that room of light. You know, that, like, like, like these things that you mentioned, there's no heat. There's, there's just massive amounts of heat and light coming in because these things are, they're really, as they're drawn, they're, they're, they're drawn for this kind of Northern European Finland prototype. They, they do need to rotate, right? Like that, what I like about this drawing on the left is that you, you imagine that that drawing, if, if you started with the Isidus relationship that you wanted, right? Like this is just an Isidus drawing that, that points out that, that the when does it happen to fall where you have them work out. You know what I'm saying? But, and yes. I, and this is what, 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 as opposed to going, this is actually what I want to superimpose through a series of rationally placed halls, right? So, I mean, it, it's arguably the case that that drawing, it may be true, but it's a secondary or tertiary reality of what you perceive. I mean, it's nice. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's a kind of door prize to what you have, but, but really what you perceive is other things, the, the, these kind of rectangular buildings, the spaces between them, the odd, this, this very odd, kind of a configuration of, of where they, they kind of come together here. I mean, this is the kind of space where, where you might kind of do well to look at, you know, James Sterling. You know, this is a kind of Sterling Olivetti, you know, where things come together and then the, 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 each of these systems is actually set up to, to work out exactly correctly with certain things. And then you, 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 you let that space, you know, work itself out in, in ways that are, that, that are a little bit looser. But, but I have to say there, there's a lot about this project that I like. I, I mean, this is a kind of, like, I feel like these are, these are, it's like you're, I, I just, I trust you. And I, I think that there's, that, 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 that the thing that, I, I, but again, I, yeah, it's a little bit like Duncan. You know, I, I would say, you know, that, that, that I would let your freak flag you know, fly a little bit here and, and, and not worry too much that, that the thing that you're doing is, 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 is solving it practically because it's not. I mean, it, it, the, 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 it, it's, doing, it's doing other strange things. <laughs> I think it's high, this is a highly developed project, though. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. very, very yeah. thorough yeah. Um, in, in, in lots of ways. I mean, even, even the, uh, the way he has the same basic unit for each of the, the workshops, but then those uh, saddlebags basically allow them to be flexible, and then they could change over time. I think that's a, that's a rather simple yet sophisticated uh, uh, thing to do. Um, and then the way he's using uh, the Isovist uh, analysis uh, to, to connect the spaces uh, is is pretty great. I'm wondering, like based it. on on what uh, what uh, Peter uh, is is bringing up, I learned this on my the first first time I taught it uh, at uh, at uh, at Austin. Uh, I discovered that 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 Austin is 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 the greatest east west flyway for all migrating birds. Uh, going it, north it or south, yeah. and so we did a birding center, and so I can learn more about that. And I'm back in the birds now. I'm wondering if the isovis could be used uh, for the point of view of the birds, you know, so the birds can see in as well, you know. Uh, yeah. Does is, is this ever is isovis ever done in section, or is it always in plan, Michael? Um, you know, it can be done in section or in plan, but yeah, nine times out of ten, it's a plan. Uh, okay. Um, but I think this is pretty pretty amazing uh, project, and uh, notwithstanding, I'd like to uh, I'd like to hear people talk about the point you raised, uh, Michael. Um, like the the sudden thought that that it's a mansard roof, and how that sort of really sort of brings down the uh, connotations of it, and how it does in a strange way seem like uh, residential until you see the row of them until you see the multiplicity of them that sort of misreading as a mansard and 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 peter wanting the roof to sort of take flight more and leave the walls behind after all they do it does have its own columns right james it's not like it's, uh, it's not like the walls are, are holding up the roof no so 
I wait, think... why and, and why not? I, 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 this is just other mystery I don't get. Why are the roof the why are why are there extra vestigial columns out there to yeah. trouble the well, inhabitants? <laughs> Well, so the, the, <laughs> the inhabitants. Well, I think I like all the, that. So, so here the, the column. I, mentioned, I, I mentioned this because all the women in my family right now have concussions, right? Like both my daughter and my wife, they're both concussed, and it's like, wait, why are you putting columns in these spaces? Yeah, my name's like moving shit around. You know, like, the, the, the columns are removed from the windows here. So, I mean, the the overall generic yeah, the, industrial grid is applied, but. Um, the affordances of the space change when fenestration is added. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think, can I just let me address that? I, I, James, I can't remember why we had columns there, but it's certainly true that you, the plan with its roof is awfully compact. And that compactness is what's giving the mansard reading it's what's making it seem like, oh, these could be apartments. There's uh -huh. a kind of a cheapness with the compactness. And I think what Peter and maybe Michael would want is, look, if you're going to do this structure that holds up the roof and the walls are free, there needs to be some celebration of the trouble you went to to do that. And the fact that it all comes together as a tight box in the end makes one wonder about the, the column beams. That's mm -hmm. the expressive layers of blue. Yeah. yeah. Because what you, with, you know, okay, if, if you say, okay, the columns, the, 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 what do we, how do we use those columns? You got to make everything work. And uh, if you got walls, the, the walls could float off the ground. If you were to just think of this thing being a, like a mini exploded axo, you know, where the, the, the walls lift up off the ground, the roof never touches it, and then the columns are basically uh, allowing that to happen. And so the ground floats through, the sky floats through. Um, I don't know, there's, there's, uh, how did you, what Michael just said was great. The whole thing is maybe a little bit too compressed. You wouldn't uh, need the suburban trees in a certain way, which I think just, you know, give character to the edges of your space, as opposed to stanchions that hold up the sky. With your roof, baby. I yeah. just, it's the first scheme that suggests two scales one of the scale of the four crafts, and the other one maybe of the larger hole that's actually as big as the site. I mean, when you say there's a, a brick building, if there's a masonry building that's holding the roof up, then there's a masonry building. If that's, if that's really a masonry building, then it can hold the roof up completely. And I mean, on one side over here, you're completely willing to actually go arbitrary and say, no, the roof has a, the, the, sorry, the wall has a different purpose. Uh, the wall is signage over here. And yet for most of, of the rest of, the, of the, the design, the brick is telling us that it's load bearing. And then I think you could use, I mean, to resolve the mansardy quality of this courtyard right here. I mean, you could you could use a wall the same way you did here. You could just build a wall that 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 breaks away from the uh, sort of authenticness of the walls being, um, you know, load bearing. But um, there's. I mean, on the one hand, this is a, a brick wall, but on the other hand, it has columns. And I mean, there's you're you're already sort of sort of double loading uh, what what this building envelope and the structure is supposed to do. So I mean, I'm I'm fine with it being arbitrary if you want it to be arbitrary. But the way the roof rests on the uh, on the brick is telling me that it's load bearing brick. Um, the other weird thing, I think the James Sterling reference is totally appropriate, especially when the valleys of all of these sawtooths meet here in the center. Something, something is gonna, something's gonna happen mm. in there. Um, but just from a strictly, uh, a strictly studio performance thing, I really wonder if the 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 stone and the, the glass shop actually want to share the same interior space here with, uh, I mean, I love the, of course, the openness of that. And what you're doing is you're breaking out of that, that grid of those 
those load bearing load bearing walls. But um, um, stone dust is just notoriously harsh on everything and everybody around it. And um, even though I would appreciate as a designer having this this openness and connection right here, um, practically speaking, that's that's not what anybody wants the stone shop to do is to share their space with them. I just, I, James, you should. James did have some barrier. Wasn't there a barrier there? Yes. So plastic. Um, there, yeah, some kind of like industrial factory plastic. Um, that's this kind of translucent thing. So it would knock down something. So it's it's okay. visually mm -hmm. visually open, but not uh, physically. Mm -hmm. But from a work workshop point of view, I gotta say I wouldn't want those columns at all. I mean, they're they're gonna limit what you're what you can do in those spaces. Um, so there is still a bit of a you know what what how am I what representation of these buildings taking? Are they brick or are they? Are they a uh, structure with a brick veneer? It's it's eh, it's a little it's a little bit of both right now. You know, Mark, uh, to carry uh, the Sterling reference um, on, um, he took on uh, basically the whole canon of materiality in architecture, which which from right through into modernism was honesty of materials. He uses brick at the history faculty building. Yeah. Uh, and you first look at it and you say mm -hmm. that's a load bearing material, but it isn't load bearing because he pulls the columns back into the building. And then he basically has an armature that comes out to hold uh, uh, the, the, the brick wall, which happens to be brick plate, uh, which pissed off a lot of modernists. Uh, but it was, he, you know, he, he was basically the Monty Python of architecture. And I think his irreverence is really what began to bring into question all of the things that we were told we had to we had to inherit. And it basically put a, it dampened uh, basically uh, the, the, the kind of innovation that, that comes from inventing your own life, let's say. Um, so I think if he has the columns, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying that it, 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 the functional problem might be there, but that I think is, is solvable uh, in some way. Uh, you can't have think, the columns, Michael. You can't? No, I mean, like, I, I just following on what you were saying, I was really appreciating what you were saying about 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 Sterling, and I was thinking about the kind of discourse of bricks and how it's actually yeah. evolved pretty substantially uh -huh. beyond Sterling through Maneo and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and yeah. you go, you know, like the, like the very worst thing you could do is say, this is a place about craft, but the guys who are laying those bricks, fuck them. We don't actually care about them enough to pull the column and board. You know, like, like, like to me, that, that, that there's this whole issue too. I mean, this is like the whole kind of discourse in Spanish architecture about the, the, the status of the brick as a, as a, as a, as a symbol of, of like the, the fact that we could kind of talk about it like as not having a kind of the value that, that I, mean, I mean, I appreciate how Sterling used it and, and I've seen a lot of those buildings and I think they're really, really marvelous. But I have to say that at this moment in time, you have to look at the brick and say, some guy, some workman laid it and, and, and we either value that or we devalue it. And so this is a place that's theoretically about like the, the, the fact that blues, the two pieces of wood together, we value that. And actually we, we, we try to, I, I mean, for me, the, the, the problem with this project is that the, the, the geometry of the plan throws aside the fact that the discourse of the brick walls and the way the windows are cut through them and whether the isovis thing works through them or not, that's actually the central dilemma that the project could be about. And it gets complicated by a series of other layers. I, that, that's how I would take it. I mean, I, I just wanted to, to say I, I, I actually appreciate what you're saying about, about the brick and about Sterling. I brought, the, I brought Sterling into it because Sterling was so good at very casually handling these multiple, multiple wings and then the kind of social spaces in between. But that stuff that he did with brick, eesh. Oh Yeah, but brick, brick nowadays, uh, okay, then I would say that if, if he wants to basically use brick as brick, then it's going to be brick on both sides. It's not yeah. going to be brick veneer against a concrete oh, core. Geez. Totally, James had totally, brick on yeah. both sides, and I told him to kill it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not saying what, that. Yeah, but I'm just James, saying that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying Sorry, that, 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 you know, if you're going to really take a run at material, uh, 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 then you take a run at it. I, I, I think David's point is, is, is well taken. Uh, I think part of the problem is we're all wrestling with the way uh, renderers handle materials, which is basically as wallpaper. Hmm. But and what David is bringing up, though, a which kind is of really a tackiness about it all. David's point is a really good one. Is not only is the craft happening after the building is built, how does the building itself become exactly. an acquisition of craft? Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
something mm-hmm. I wanted to throw out there really quickly for you, James, is you spent maybe 30 seconds talking about brickness in your presentation, yet your reviewers have spoken about brick for about 10 minutes. Yes. <laughs> and this is not their fault. This is your fault, right? Like, I don't think you walked in here or wanting to talk about bricks. And this is a valuable conversation. I'm not saying it's not valuable. But what I want to encourage you to do is to take control of your presentation. Because what you did was you hit us he with a need to take control of his presentation. Uh, he has a building. I, mean, I, I, don't know. I don't mean to interrupt, but I mean, like, he, like, like, like that's, that's like asking a, a parent to keep talking at a parent-child, you know, conference. I mean, all they're going to say is my, my child is a genius. And the truth is that the whole point of the teachers is to go, well, all right, there's some actual issues. With I, I got to do Stop, stop mm-hmm. controlling the presentation, parent, you know, like. Well, I know I wanted to, let me, let me finish. This. Hold on. So what, what I'm observing, like what I'm hoping for you is that you come in with a set of questions in a set of intentions that you walk away with answered or a conversation that you intended to have. And a lot of that has to do with how you frame your presentation. Because what you did was you showed up with a ton of stuff and you said, tell me what you see, which is great. It means it's gonna be open-ended, it's gonna be a surprise. But if I, when I look at your set of concerns and your set of values, you spent a lot of effort and a lot of time uh, introducing people for the first time to the idea of an isovist, which might even be the first time that you've learned about this from Michael. Is that what you want to talk about? Is that what your project is about? If the answer is yes, then you need to frame that conversation and you need to welcome us into having that conversation. Um, And part of it is explaining what it is, first of all. And second of all, it's talking about why it matters. Um, both of those things were, were missing from the presentation, even though the graphics were beautiful. Um, and in Michael's writing, which I'm sure you've read, is a ton of information that could be translated into the presentation. Um, and this isn't a, a criticism or anything to get prickly about, but it, it's something to think about as you go through school, which is you actually have a lot of sway in the conversation that your project brings into the world, if you wish, because you clearly have the ability to make a ton of documents. We trust them because you put dimension strings on them. For all students, put dimension strings on stuff and everyone will look and see and think that they're architecture drawing. That's a wonderful thing to do. But I would ask yourself, what are the big questions I want to talk about? And then figure out a way to have that conversation. John, John's looking restless. It's just my regular state of, wait, let me, am I <laughs> muted? Let me see. No, I'm not muted. Okay, good. No, you're good. You're good. I say, you know, the, well, the, you know, the real reason I came today is, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm out of ammunition. And I tell you, I'm going to use that, that parent-teacher conference one in my next con- That was really good, David. I gotta, <laughs> you got some chance. big money for this stuff. I, I was like, <laughs> Uh, I'm serious. I honestly like the, the the facility, the conversation today across the board has been really intimidating. I, so forgive me if I'm if I'm a little quiet. It's only because I've been absorbing a lot of really great um, uh, points being made about this this work. Has has been so rich and kind of touches on a lot of kind of things that are that are that are dear to me, despite the fact that I haven't lived in Texas now for like 20 years. Um, I I think one of the interesting things I'm going to take this conversation in a little bit different direction, just because there are a couple of things I wanted to talk about, despite the fact that they may not be the points of proper points of emphasis from the, the author's point of view. Um, that sign is weird, man. And I think, you know, for me, there's a, there's a, there's a thread in, in this project and some of the other ones here that I think that, 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 that just, just gives me some food for thought. I'm just going to share it for better or worse. Um, clearly there's this, there's this EC conversation, the environmental controls conversation that took place at some point in the semester. And that's why we see the fans. Um, it's not like a Ridley Scott thing, I'm, I'm assuming. And it's not like a, uh, the, uh, uh, it's not a Ridley uh, Scott thing you say. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, you know, the light to the fan and it's like, there's something yeah, about no, it like early the work. That's, yeah. Um, <laughs> when I saw the first one in the first project, I thought, okay, this is like the Robert Venturi golden antenna or something, you know, but uh, clearly like there was a, there's a requirement, um, that, yeah, that because causes the pop up again and again. Air- this place isn't air conditioned. That's there right. you go, right? Okay. So, I did, and, and maybe that was discussed. At the, I might have missed that in the introduction of this. No, 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 it's good. I think details like that are so lovely that um, the, um, uh, uh, the the kind of atmosphere that that those things bring to a space like this are critical for um, 
establishing a special a special kind of vibe. I, I remember the uh, uh, the first trip to Marfa and as a student and being in one of the uh, the, the uh, uh, arenas when a cloud passed over the uh, the space and you could hear the 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 systematic kind of popping of the 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 fasteners on the roof as it expanded and contracted when it kind of went in and out of the sun. And I just remember that, that being so profound, like all the things that uh, are related to you know, protection from the sun, Mark's talking about shade, Dave was talking about being punished by open skylights. That really hit home for me once I, that, that I had that acoustic experience in that space. And then I, I think it was like three or four weeks later, we were in construction five and Elizabeth Danzi had taken us to a Lake Flato project somewhere, some residential project, I can't remember where it was. And you know, there was a lot of talk about it being kind of part of the Texas vernacular, and I think that the, their their repertoire is you know, some tightly tied to the the kind of things you see in the hill country and in and around San Antonio. And I'm thinking, man, you can't hear the roof in this project. Like, it started to rain, and it was so fucking disappointing. Like, I I could not understand how a conversation about you know the beauty of, and poetry of vernacular architecture could be connected to a project that was so far removed from the dynamics that affect the building. That I just like, like there's a mission that I, at that point I thought I might be on a mission. It turns out it didn't work out that way. But um, I, what I really appreciate about the presence of the fans and the sign that's in this project, although it's really what the sign represents in the front and not necessarily its execution. And the photograph that started the pre last presentation is that like there's a kind of expediency to the buildings and a kind of um, uh, uh, a. Uh, Something about the neon sign on the front of the uh, the uh, the uh, Westbrook Metals Park. building, and uh, I think that's really where the appeal lies. Is like the 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 accessibility and the frankness that's in these uh, in the buildings in and around the area, and it's showing up kind of here and there in these projects that I think is really fabulous. And the sign in the front of this project is another opportunity to do that, or at least to study it and try and get it right, because I do think it's something that architects screw up more often than not. Um, and it's really hard to you put a finger on how you balance the kind of question of like of, of, uh, of self-conscious kind of authorship versus something that, that, um, that might be adopted on a wider scale is like inherent to the character of a place. The moon towers are like that. They weren't necessarily a kind of finely crafted industrial object so much as just ingeniously engineered. And you know, the character that emerged from that exercise is something that resonates today in Austin as evidenced by this project. Um, and you know, that sign in front of this compound is another opportunity to do that in a really wonderful way that kind of cements the character of North Lamar permanently. And you know, in a way that is like, it, it, that, that embraces like all the things that are kind of bad about it from a planning point of view. Um, and I think that's an important kind of transformation that, that, that a project like this could evince. You know, it's like, you know, when you, when you take the highway into Can uh, Trenton and mm. on the bridge in Trenton, in enormous letters, this enormous bridge, and it says, Can uh, Trenton makes, the world takes. And it was like in 1910 when they put this thing up. And the message today, like the, the, the sign's still there. I don't think Trenton is actually a manufacturing center anymore. I don't know much about Trenton, but I can't imagine it's, it's maintained its, its status as a manufacturing hub. I don't think there any place in the United States really has. Um, the way in which that message kind of matured into something a bit, it was, ultimately it was posted there with a, a high degree of optimism and it kind of matured into something way more sophisticated. And it just wasn't removed because it's monumental kind of like uh, 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 obnoxiousness ultimately be, became appealing a little bit like the Eiffel Tower did. Like that's an opportunity to do something here and it would be totally in character with the site. The same way in which you look at that neon on the front of the West, the, 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 the West, uh, Westbrook. Thank you, Westbrook Metal Building, and say, you know, that's North Lamar, that's that's this part of Austin, that's what it's about. So I I, I find that there's a lot to like about this project. <clears throat> Whatever it, it showcases the fans in this way, like, and I, I, this might have been a bit of a diatribe, but I think it's something that's kind of latent within the projects that we hadn't really had a chance to talk about, only because the need to to author these projects at a higher level as an architect, I think, gets in the way more often than not. And I'd just like to encourage everybody to think a little bit carefully about these conversations. I'm sure it came up again and again as you studied under Michael that it, it, takes, it takes a lot of um, sensitivity uh, and humility to kind of get a project like this right as far as this one thing I'm talking about. And it supports the kind of Austin is weird ethos that I think has touched this conversation here again uh, mm -hmm. now and then, but connects to something even larger that's really important that's going on in Austin uh, uh, and is also kind of part of the, the spirit of a, of a program like this one. 
Thank you, John. Uh, I, I should tell you about that sign. The sign showed up pretty early in James's design, but it stayed blank <laughs> until absolute desperation a week ago. We just stole the design from somewhere. James, <laughs> could, could you go absolutely to Absolutely. Yes. Could not just draw, invent, just draw it out of here, yeah. Could not invent uh, the right thing to put there. And, uh, you know, this is not very good, but it's not as bad as it could have been. And um, I, I, I can't Pittsburgh imagine colors? how one well, those, are the, yeah. colors. those are the colors of Pittsburgh Steelers, orange and black. Yeah, right. That was Princeton. But I think what we also enjoyed yeah. was that the entrance to the space is that little door at the bottom. Yeah, that's nice. Hidden like by the scale, cars. Right? No, I totally missed that. Look at that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really nice. That's, that's the, the entrance to the entire place for the public. <laughs> I would say ditch the bricks and make your walls out of something like that. What, what? Oh, out of the signage? Yeah. Like you had that other little baby building in the back. Where yeah. One of its walls oh, out see. of this. You could have yeah. with aluminum and everybody, all the suppliers could suddenly. Mm. Uh, it's uh, interesting. The scale support. shift in this wall doesn't reappear in the complex itself. No, it's a one time deal. It's a one time. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that I think that would have helped. Buy it once and get it forever. <laughs> I think I think that's what would, would eliminate the domesticity uh, thing in my mind. Um, yeah, because everything else is kind of sweetly done, right? It's like yeah. not too big and not too small. The grid on the glass, you know. Yeah. You, not you, too big, not too James, small. you know how glass like that is done, windows like that are done these days? You don't put in a lot of little panes. You basically do a big pane of glass. And then you basically tape on those pieces. James wouldn't do that because yeah. he that's against he that's wouldn't still graduate against the, if he did that. That's against the law in my book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's against the law in my book. Um, you know what? Uh, this this John, that was is, very moving. Thank you. This was a one a really all of the projects. I think um, what came to mind when when uh, 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 who brought up uh, whether he knew about isovism or not before this project. Um, Dinesh, Dinesh, yeah. Dinesh, okay. In the best way. No, knowing knowing the, the masterful uh, uh, teaching based on a, a deep uh, body of ideas that come both from experience and, 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 and knowledge of, of uh, Peter and, and, and Michael and David, uh, I, I would, I would uh, venture to say that um, in this project, I think is representative of all of them, is that there's a lot of big ideas that students don't know about before they're told. And it's through the work itself that they're really wrestling to try to understand them. And the best way to understand them isn't by writing a paper on them, it's trying to visualize them, trying to spatialize them and give them, a, trying to find the architectural equivalent. And I think throughout, uh, from morning till afternoon, uh, all of the projects in their own way um, is are, are trying to, uh, they're, they're mining these big ideas that Michael put on uh, on the table, basically put in the brief. And uh, you see them uh, wrestling with them and, and, um, and unpacking them. Uh, this particular project uh, has quite a bit in there, a whole lot, actually. And uh, notwithstanding the, the things that we're saying could perhaps uh, uh, make it level up, um, I, I think overall, uh, wrestling with how do you do simplicity on the other side of complexity? How do you distill? How do you do distilled projects as opposed to zippity doo And this is coming from somebody who's learned uh, how to do zippity doo all the time. And I've spent the last 20 years trying to, to basically do simplicity on the other side of complexity. And that's that very difficult. Uh, it's very, very difficult. Uh, and then that you only, the complexity comes out once it hits the tongue, once it hits your palate. And, uh, and then all of a sudden it expands. That's very, very difficult. And uh, I don't think I started thinking about any of that uh, until uh, our friend uh, Benedict uh, has said a number of things over the years, uh, not remembering any of them probably, uh, but then it, <laughs> things would resonate in me like, well, He's actually one of the one of the only people I would say that, and Peter also I've learned, but Michael will say things that I imagined I was thinking the moment before he said them, but I've never heard them before. 
which is, uh, for me, pretty special, you know. Uh, so anyways, that's my, well, thank I, you, I wouldn't Martin. say closing comment. I'll just say that's, that's an overarching comment. Michael, because I've just come into this literally about 24 hours ago when Michael suggested I might listen in or something, but you said something about 40 minutes ago on this project that perhaps how we as architects craft the construction site, or I put that in, or what we're proposing, which means from first depicting not the completed zippity doo building, but the foundations, the site found, maybe it's demolition, maybe it's saving, but foundations to framing, to walls, whatever sequence it is, up to the roof. And I think that if the subject is craft, then I think that instead of seeing these total, totally finished, beautiful renderings and all these other things of the wholeness of it all, I would think that the craft, of, and David talked about the bricklayers, the concrete people, the steel people who would come in, step even when the glass goes in, okay, that if you broke it down, I try to do this with all my studios now is to say, we're constructing ideas, but we're using a construction site to do it with naming different materials, which is what this craft uh, uh, school is about, et cetera, et cetera. So I think in some ways you can't understand the complexities or try to get to that until you say construction and ideas come not all at once, but one thing at a time. And then they go into issues of weathering, I suppose, and room and stuff like that. So um, it, it's well, been a very interesting discussion for me, but I also think if I had to um, add anything, I think it's as we respect the distinct crafts, we ought to re respect the distinct specifications for construction and show that at the same time, rather than always putting them together, uh, perhaps. Well, uh, Peter. I can tell you if I if I do this kind of studio again or even this exact project again, I pray that it will be in a physical studio with a shop and that the, the major medium would be physical models, whose whose craft, by the way, would be that of models, not of imitation buildings. Yeah. In other words, I'd actually be interested in in an architecture that was specifically model-ish. Um, cause I think the issues would transfer, but yeah, I think you're, I think you're, uh, you're right there. Although it's a weird, it's a weird subject, you know, like, I mean, I interviewed a, a chair at Cranbrook four or five years ago and, and like, they wouldn't want, they didn't want to talk about a computer. They didn't want to talk about introducing the computer into the discourse about craft. And it seems to me that you can't, like, you can't talk about, you can only talk about them, that as artisanship. If you can't also at the same, that's what I actually like about this wall that we're looking at very much. I mean, I like the idea that it introduces against that brick. I mean, I like it because it's not a particularly resolved discourse right now. And it's one that we, I think, err invariably on the side of, 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 of matter and lay. I mean, we err invariably on the side of Marx, you know, how Marx defined value, labor plus materials equals value, as opposed to inspiration equals value, as opposed to you know, pixels equals value, you know, so, I mean, I, I think, I, I mean, and, and, and so Cranbrook is, it's like the kiss of death for that school, you know, it's like, it's like where, where, okay, some rich kids and some, you know, overseas kids who can pay full tuition ends up, end up going there and, 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 and being introduced into this kind of month. I don't know if you guys saw the Cooper Union, their summer offering, and how they've, they've suddenly swung fully into, like, we're going to teach everyone digitally, like, after having been the monastery of architecture for, yeah. 50 years right and uh, yeah. allowing no one in and allowing no one to talk about the working drawing and allowing no one to talk about anything but you know uh, so I, I think I, I mean i appreciate what you're saying michael and at the same time i actually think that the that you know this this definition of craft it actually has to be revolutionized i mean it, it, it is still an idea of craft that somehow it, it has not found yeah. a, a new has not found well, a new what, paradigm you know david what do you years. think David, did you ever, uh, Malcolm McCullough at Michigan wrote a book maybe five, 10 years ago at the beginning of CAD and claimed that uh, CAD was a craft, that actually yeah. there's a craftsmanship involved in moving that mouse around and organizing yourself. Um, and uh, honestly, James, James was uh, a master uh, of Rhino. He taught four or five other students continuously. He has a way of going about it and organ keeping himself organized. He knows how to build things. He also knows what he doesn't know. Um, 
and um, really is a craftsman, if you want, in Rhino. The question is whether Rhino or any package actually has enough depth in it to respond like a piece of wood or like a piece I think of wood. I think I, I, this is a long and complex discussion because it, it, it opens up all these kinds of questions about, for example, how Borromini drew stone in perspective in order for it to be carved, right? So, so the, it, it would seem like... It would seem like there, there there are interfaces, and they're just they're just not in the the way that we traditionally represent form. So if you ask if you ask students to draw bricks, or if you ask them to draw custom pieces, or if you but whatever, I I, I just think that, that 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 like 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 this is the kind of funny little realm that 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 we that that we keep we keep bifurcating it into yes. the, the 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 digital or the manual yeah. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Not necessarily happily. I just wanted to say a couple of things also in closing because we're, you know, Michael, I love being on your reviews. It's like my favorite thing all year long. I look forward to being on a Michael Benedict review. And what I like most about it is very really dis we disagree, but I, I realize part of it is because like you're continuously metastasizing. You're, you're like, like, like I would say 10 years ago, if you'd given this project, these would be the single most rigorous projects that we could possibly imagine. Like all the things that I'm finding trouble. But I, I'm realizing that as you, like right now, you're in this really lovely stage where you're kind of not, you're more like a grandpa with your students. You're, you're kind of like, yeah, you're willing to accept some really weird, strange things in your project and not beat them out and get them all, and just to sort of see where they go. So that when they, when they get to the final review, instead of like the, the, the Michael Benedict of, of 15 years ago, where the students were absolutely, you, you'd walk out of there feeling like you've been gold plated by the student work and going, how the hell does he do that? You know, now I, I actually like the kind of troubling bits that they're in the project. The, the, I mean, I keep talking about the strangenesses in the project. I'm, I think this is a moment in architectural education where we can re-talk about those things seriously. We can finally stop talking about the way it's done in practice, you know, and, and, and can re-open up these interesting questions. And I, so I, I have to say how much, uh, I, I wanna say one other thing for the students, like, like we've been all warned, you know, you guys, yes, you had a difficult semester. Yes, we all hate online teaching. Yes, we, therefore, we're supposed to be nice to you today. And I woke up this morning going, I am not going to be nice to you today. Like, I, I feel like somehow, like the pressure is even, the pressure is even higher on us to be, to be more demanding and more incisive and more critical than, than it is to be just because you've had a hard time to be nice. So I, I feel like, like I wanted to be mean, but but the things I was mean about, I, I, I feel like this goes to something Michael Rotendi was saying about the way I communicate. I should be communicating to you in a way that is also supportive. <laughs> Michael, I am, I am trying to say that uh, both Michael, so I am being supportive and I'm particularly being supportive of Michael Benedict of, 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 of where you're going, man. I love it. I love it more than ever. Uh, yeah, my mother taught me, you, David, you, 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 only, you only critique. Uh, she didn't ever use the word critique. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't say what I've said to you if I didn't like you so much. No, I don't think you're mean. I just think you're being a, you're being uh, hard. I, David, I've uh, never thought you're mean. I've always thought you're just no, you're wrong. Definitely like, you're, you're <laughs> just wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> okay, okay. That's definitely a much longer. You guys, can, you guys can have that conversation offline. Okay. Uh, uh, but one, one question I have, though, is if not, and it's not about physical modeling and all of that, is what's the upside and the downside of being immersed in a world without gravity? Oh, God. Yeah, gravity. Let's hear it. Well, what's lost and what's gained? Like, when we, 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 you know, we always throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think that you, 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 you um, the digital world and the physical world are basically one world. Uh, the Christian ethos is you got to take one and not the other. It's, you know, one is good, one is evil. That's not. That's nonsense. It's utter nonsense. Um, but I can see that without. How do you know how heavy something is if you haven't lifted something heavy? If you don't, you know, how do you know what weight is if you haven't lifted a rock? You know, how do you know how to really put materials together if you haven't put if you haven't actually done that? Or do we say this isn't about material anymore? It's it's a, it's it, we're dematerializing everything and it's just about shaping light. Which is which is also fine. But, but gravity, you're right. Gravity is what makes fools of us, uh, or makes us wise, whichever way you want to put it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's the one thing I say in architectural 101 is that there's only two things that you can count on. One is gravity, and the other one is that the sun moves in the sky. So I say it like that. Orientation. Yeah. 
but mm-hmm. I can't believe this world where, or sometimes students get projects that don't have specific sites. I don't understand that because they have to be connected to this world. So, I mean, it's a very good question about gravity, but uh, I uh, was on a thesis recently and uh, uh, I, I asked about the structural system, so, and that's irrelevant to architecture now. We can hang it any way we want, but uh, but when everything is liberated, it's something else. But I, 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 I Michael, I, uh, I'm on the East Coast, so the moon's coming out. But uh, I, I okay. would say that uh, uh, I love the surprise of, of being able to listen in on this and to engage in some of my most favorite people, and two Michaels and a David, all down in Texas, I guess. But uh, I knew another Michael once, but he's no longer with us. But uh, uh, I think this is fantastic work. It seems it's just not first-year graduate students. The last one, James, seems to be an advanced student, I assume. Uh, or is he in the first year? No, James? he's a... Uh, he's probably the last, he's, he's second a, he last a, one in the sequence. Yeah, exactly. He, so he's on his way out. He has a pre-architecture degree. So. Well, there's a wonderful range of projects there. And I love the idea of addressing uh, both the difficulty of siting in Austin, for me at least, and and uh, and uh, the issue of these multiple crafts and how distinct it... It's a good studio to learn how to articulate. So I'm going to say goodbye now, but I uh, was... Peter, it was a great uh, pleasure. So a great you pleasure to see you. Really and a great pleasure to have you. Horses. Many more. Okay, well, we'll keep it up. Thank you. Bye-bye. I'm going to leave you. It says leave on the bottom. Bye-bye. <laughs> leave meeting. All right, guys, we do need to bring it to an end. Uh, Donesh might like to say something. It was, it was, and John... Do you want me to stop sharing Is that so we can see each other? Yeah, please. Yeah, why don't you? Um, there was, uh, there was one thing I wanted to share with the students, and this may not be an evident thing to you yet, but a, a studio like this is very difficult and very tricky because it exposes your ignorance. You can't hide behind anything when you have to make a building in school. And all of these weirdnesses come out, and a lot of that is what we've been commenting on. And there's many studios and many schools that don't force you to do that. And you're going to have this project in your portfolio. It might be a very quiet project in your portfolio. It might not be the flashiest one. It might not be the one that someone flipping through dwells on for the longest time. But the exercise that you've gone through is actually very rich. Um, and just from my perspective, that's why I went to University of Texas um, is because I wanted to learn how to make buildings. And the meaning that my projects have in my portfolio have to do with being buildings and being made out of stuff that buildings are made out of. So in conclusion of this studio, some of your work may be to actually backtrack and learn how and represent the project in a form that you're able to talk about it because it's not going to be the flashiest thing that everyone says, oh, wow, that's amazing, and then keeps going. It might be very simple, uh, but figure out how to bring to the surface all of the intense thinking that you put into that simple, um, simple act. Thank you, Donesh. Mr. John, that nice. gives you the last word, I believe. No, uh, yeah. David. No, David's head is uh, I, I already did my thing. Yeah. You did already did your thing. Okay. John, I, you just I want to like, say goodbye? Uh, yeah, because I feel like I also got a chance to grind my my, uh, my simple <laughs> buildings axe earlier. And, uh, you know, it's made possible by the, the, the wonderful uh, uh, setup that you provide the students. So thank, thank you very much for the invite today, Michael. I really enjoyed the conversation. John, thank it's great you. to be on jury with you guys. I, I really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. You were, you were actually a part of their education unwittingly because we watched the video and we talked about the, I mean, the Khan video. And um, we, that came up in all kinds of times and places. Well, John, another one. thank you. Dinesh, thank you. Thank you, John. Roto, thank you. You're welcome. Um, you. Everyone. Bud, Bud has not had his final word. Little Bud, Mark, <laughs> you okay? I, I am little Bud. And uh, that makes that the reason that makes you big, bud. <laughs> no one understands. <laughs> so Mark, I actually Mark worked for me. A lo- Mark worked for me long ago, 
and uh, he just got cold little bad and I got cold big bad and that's was it. No, uh, we, there was there were three of us there and uh, Nestor showed me my desk and showed me where the cutting board is and he's like, uh, is there anything else you need or is that is that everything? And I'm like, no, that takes care of it. Thanks, bud. And he said, that's Mr. Bud to you. And from <laughs> then on, from then on, all three of us were uh, were, were the buds and uh, little medium and big, right? Okay. Yeah, and I'm still and I'm still junior bud. Um, and you know, uh, I totally agree with Michael Rotundi that we can feel how these uh, how each of the students is basically wrestling with and grappling with. Uh, all these various forces and points of view that are at work in, in, in this program and not, not a single one of them uh, complained about, oh my God, it's so hard dealing with all these contradictions. Uh, they just uh, went ahead and emphasized the points they felt were important. I think each of you was crafting, crafting the buildings that you're designing and crafting the spaces that you're making and crafting your ideas as well. And uh, it's uh, really great work. So thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, guys, I'm going to just speak to the class myself. If I Bye, could uh, bid you farewell. And Thank great you. thanks for a long afternoon. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, you Rota. Uh, you're welcome. Double session. To my old and new friends and to all of you students, uh, congratulations. And uh, keep it up. You got to fix the world that me and uh, Michael and David screwed up. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. <laughs> but the bigger the, pro the bigger the project and the bigger the problem, the bigger the smile. That's, that's the life of a, of, of a creative person. So uh, you're fortunate as well. All right. So long, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good night.